on our guests, ladies and gentlemen, may we ask everyone to now to please occupy your assigned seats. We are about to start the program. Once more, ladies and gentlemen, please occupy your assigned seats now. We are about to start the program. Thank you. Honored guests, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, kindly please occupy your assigned seats now. We are about to start the program. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Eight, you are now in the second day and we welcome you back to the first National Sharia Summit, forging the role of Sharia in the national legal framework. Assalamu alaikum. I think I can speak for everyone when I say that the lectures, discussions we had yesterday were truly enriching. And of course, hearing all those messages of support from representatives of all three branches of government are truly enlivening. This is truly a good opportunity and now the, the stage has been set. And we're excited to move forward and tread along. And here we are, second day of the first National Sharia Summit. But before that, we would like to acknowledge the presence of everyone. I would like to make mention of you once again. Okay. Starting off with the Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court, we have today the Senior Associate Justice Marvik MVF Leonen. We have Justice Japar Bibi Dimampao. 
We would like to acknowledge the justices of the Court of Appeals. The, the Philippine Judges Association. The Honorable just Judges of the Sharia Courts. The members of the Technical Working Group on Sharia. The Sharia Counselors at Law. The representatives from the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region and Muslim Mindanao, Legal Education Board, the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, the Philippine Association of Law Schools, and the Mindanao State University and University of the Philippines. We also acknowledge our development partners, starting off with the Embassy of Spain to the Philippines, Cooperación Español, the European Union, Support to the Bangsamoro. The EU Governance in Justice II program. The Asia Foundation. We would like to recognize Chancellor Rosemary Carandang and the Philippine Judicial Academy. The National Commission for Muslim Filipinos. And the Philippine Center for Islam and Democracy. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, also, we would like to acknowledge our court administrators and the deputy court administrator for Mindanao. Welcome, sirs. Now, uh, to recapitulate the matters we have taken up, please help me welcome the program director of the Philippine Center for, for Islam and Democracy, our head rapporteur, attorney Salma Pierre Rasul. Allow me to read the short bio of Attorney Salma Rasul. Uh, attorney, attorney Rasul is a lawyer by profession admitted to the practice of law in the Philippines, as well as the states of New York and Maryland. She is currently, as mentioned, Program Director of the Philippine Center for Islam and Democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, our head rapporteur, Attorney Rasul. Uh, Senior Associate Justice Marvic, Mario Victor Yonen, uh, Co-Chair of the National Summit on Sharia, Associate Justice Japardi Maampao, uh, Justice of the Court of Appeals and members of the judi Judiciary and the Sharia Courts, esteemed guests and discussants from local and foreign jurisdictions who have joined us today to share their perspectives on Sharia, fellow scholars and advocates of the rule of law. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wal barakatuhu. Greetings of peace. I have been tasked to present the highlights and key takeaways from the first day of this national summit on Sharia. In his opening remarks, Senior Associate Justice Leonen had laid the underlying rationale for organizing this summit which is the first ever summit convened by the Supreme Court. He pointed out that the struggle of the Moro, as well as our people who embrace Islam, is no less complicated. Unfortunately, it is no less hidden still from the national narrative. Saj Leonen shared with us the unwavering commitment of the Supreme Court to promote the rule of law, and this particular Supreme Court-led initiative to strengthen the Sharia as part of the mandate of the Committee on Enhancing Access to Justice of Underserved and Marginalized Communities. This summit is one of many programs envisioned by the Supreme Court and which it will be organizing in the future to attain this objective. The Supreme Court initiative drew the full support of the executive and legislative branches of government. We listened to the messages of continuing commitment and full support for the efforts to strengthen the Sharia justice by the president, the current president, Ferdinand Marcos Jr by the Barn Chief Minister, Ahud Al-Hajj Murad Ibrahim, and by the Senate President, Juan Miguel Zubiri. 
In his keynote address, Chief Justice Alexander Gismundo recalled the motivation behind the codification of the persons and family laws of Muslims in the Philippines. He said, government protects their religion and their rights, that they are treated equally with the rest of the population, and that they are an integral part of the Filipino nation. Thus, to usher in the much-needed reforms in the judi judicial system, the Supreme Court developed its five-year strategic plan for judicial innovations, which is anchored on the aspiration of attaining responsive and real-time justice and guided by four core principles, timely and fair justice, transparent and accountable justice, equal and inclusive justice, and technology adaptive management. Of these four core principles, equal and inclusive justice resonates strongly with the Bangsamoro. The Chief Justice outlined these ensuing objectives for the reform of the current Sharia implementation in the country. Now, to better understand the call for equal and inclusive justice and the redress of historic injustices suffered by the Bangsamora people, Dr. Hamid Bara shared with us a brief history of the Muslim Filipinos tracing the advent of Islam in the country, recounting the root causes of the conflict in Mindanao, and the various approaches undertaken by government in addressing the moral struggle and the Mindanao problem. Minister Muhagir Iqbal shared updates on the peace process post the passage of the Bangsamoro Organic Law and the establishment of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region. He, as stated in the slides, he cited various issues which remain and that have to be resolved if we are to, to achieve sustainable justice in the Bangsamoro and the rest of Mindanao. Court of Appeals Justice Anisa Amanuddin Umpa focused on the implementation of, implementation of the Sharia within the Philippine legal framework. She provided, she provided us with the definition of Sharia, the primary and secondary sources of Sharia, and the legal basis for the Sharia justice system in the country, including the current structure of the Sharia court system and the gaps and weaknesses therein. Dr. Barra again contributed to, uh, to yesterday's uh, program and presented the two main branches of Islam, the Sunni and the Shiite, and the history of the split and the differences between the two. Such differences will certainly impact the interpretation and implementation of Sharia, particularly in the interpre interpretation and observance of persons and family law in the Bangsamoro. Essentially for Muslims, all laws emanate from the divine. Dr. Jamil Kayamuddin discussed the concept of halal and presented its general principles. This was followed by Attorney Arifa Alawiya Ala, who introduced the concept of Islamic banking and finance and presented us with an overview of both the global Islamic finance industry and the development of Islamic banking in the Philippines. She underscored the necessity of creating awareness of Islamic banking and finance, not only among Muslim communities, but among non-Muslim populations as well to have a robust and sustainable Islamic banking and finance industry in the country 
would entail the support and active participation of all. Finally, the last presentation focused on the status and rights of women under Sharia. Dr. Macrina Morados debunked the misconception that women are subordinated or considered a second class under Islam. Our foreign guest, Huma Chugtai Esquire, related the experiences of Pakistani women as they struggle to promote their rights and status as equal partners of men. Unfortunately, if you look at the lists enumerated by Huma, despite the various laws promoting women's rights in Pakistan, just like in the Philippines, reality is far below the expected imp improvement in the status of women. A lively open forum followed. Among the issues raised were the capital requirements of Islamic banks and the participation of foreign players and investors. A longer and involved uh, debate was on the Child and Forced Marriage Act. And the last question that was uh, discussed in yesterday's session was on the training and qualification of Sharia counselors. As we celebrate Women's Month, it is with this hope that our Sharia justice would be an instrument for promoting the rights of women and the girl child. In closing, let me share the findings from the survey conducted by the UP Institute for the Administration of Justice in 27 and 2018 and our recent consultations of the Muslim religious leaders in Metro Manila. Just like um, the findings made and presented by Justice Umpa, there are several gaps and flaws in the current Sharia court system in the Philippines. We will be sharing the slides with the rest of the participants. So for today's discussion, we hope that you look at the Sharia court system as a vehicle to promote women's and children's rights and in that manner enhance access to justice of the Bangsamoro community. Thank you and happy Women's Month. Thank you very much, Attorney Salma, for that thorough review of yesterday's activities. Now equipped with the foundations that we all learned from and gained from yesterday, are we now ready to explore the ways forward? And for the first topic of the day, let us welcome Bangsamoro Autonomous Region for Muslim Mindanao, Attorney General, Member of the Parliament, Attorney Shia Elijah Dumama Alba for a lecture on the Muslim Code and the Bangsamoro Organic Law. Allow me to read the brief profile of Attorney Alba. Attorney Sha Elaiha B. Dumama Alba is, as mentioned, Member of Parliament of the Bangsamoro Transition Authority and concurrently floor leader. She is also the Bangsamoro Attorney General of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. She took her BA in Public Administration at UP Diliman and finished her law degree at San Beda College of Law, Mendiola, in 2007. She was admitted to the Philippine Bar in 2008, and she placed third in the special, special Sharia Bar examinations in 2018. Ladies and gentlemen, Attorney Alba. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My courtesies to the honorable members of the Supreme Court, uh, justices of the Supreme Court, and um, all dignitaries today, to all participants, magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. I am Sha'ilai Jadumama Alba. Um, as mentioned, I uh, 
I am floor leader and member of the parliament of the Bangsamono Transition Authority and also serve as the Attorney General of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. I am tasked to talk about uh, the Muslim Code and the Bangsamoro Organic Law. Republic Act Number no. 11054 or the Bangsamoro Organic Law, which is the law creating the new autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao, paved the way for the long overdue enhancement of the Sharia justice system. As you can see in this slide, the Bangsamoro justice system is composed of the regular courts, the Sharia courts, and traditional and tribal justice systems. Sharia courts and Sharia justice system has supremacy and application over Muslims only, while traditional or tribal justice system apply to indigenous peoples in the Bangsamoro. All citizens are guaranteed the basic right to the redress of grievances and due process of law. In addition to this basic right already enjoyed under our constitution, the organic law further provides for justice institutions in the barn. The formal institutionalization and operationalization of the Sharia justice system, the expansion of the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts, and competence over the Sharia justice system are already established in the Bangsamoro. Aggrieved parties residing in the Bangsamoro may have recourse to the local courts or regular courts, or among Muslims to the Sharia district or circuit courts. The organic law also expresses respect for the right of the indigenous peoples to the settlement of conflicts through their own tribal laws and traditional systems. The organic law shall also recognize other indigenous processes as alternative modes of dispute resolution. Next slide, please. Article 10, Section 1 of the Bangsamoro Organic Law states in part that the Bangsamoro justice system shall be administered in accordance with the unique cultural and historical heritage of the Bangsamoro. Again, Sharia shall apply exclusively to cases involving Muslims, and where a case involves a non-Muslim, Sharia may apply only if that non-Muslim voluntarily submits to the jurisdiction of the Sharia court. The dispensation of justice in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region shall be in consonance with the Constitution, Sharia, traditional or tribal laws, and other relevant laws. Sharia or Islamic law forms part of the Islamic tradition derived from religious precepts of Islam, particularly the Quran and Sunnah. Next slide, please. What are the basis for the creation of the justice and court system in the Bangsamoro? We have Article 10, Section 18 of the Philippine Constitution, which provides that the Organic Act of the Autonomous Region shall provide for special courts with personal, family, and property law jurisdiction consistent with the provisions of the Constitution and national laws. Further, the Organic Act of um, the ARMM, or RA 9054, provided for legislative powers over matters as may be authorized by law for the promotion of the general welfare of the people of the region within its territorial jurisdiction and subject to the provisions of the Constitution and national laws. Moreover, Congress has the power to define, prescribe, and apportion the jurisdiction of the various courts in the country, which is stated under Section 2, Article 8 of the Constitution. Next slide, please. So the principal sources of Sharia are the Quran and the Sunnah, or the traditions of Prophet Muhammad, and the secondary sources are consensus Ijma or anal and analogy or kias. Next slide. Again, we emphasize that under Article 10, Section 1 of the Bangsamoro Organic Law, Sharia shall apply exclusively to cases involving Muslims. It is only when a non Muslim submits to the jurisdiction of the Shari Sharia court that Sharia may apply to him or her. Next slide, please. Sharia courts within the Bangsamoro territorial jurisdiction shall form part of the Philippine judicial system, subject to the supervision of the Supreme Court. The regular courts within the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region shall continue to function under the supervision of the Supreme Court, 
based on Article 10, Section 2 of RA 11054. Next slide, please. In the Bangsamoro Organic Law, the Parliament has the power to enact laws on personal, family, and property law jurisdiction. It also has the power to enact laws governing commercial and other civil actions not provided for under the Muslim Code or Presidential Decree Number 1083, which must be equivalent um, the criminal jurisdiction on minor offenses punishable by arrest to minor or ta'zir, which must be equivalent to arrest to minor or fines commensurate to the offense. So based on this provision of the law, the only uh, crimes that the Bangsamoro Parliament can legislate on are those that apply, that apply arrest to minor as its penalty. Arrest to minor um, has the duration of uh, imprisonment from one to 30 days. And based on Republic Act Number no. 10951 enacted in 2017, light felonies are those infractions of law for the commission of which the penalty of arrest to minor or a fine not exceeding 40,000 pesos or both is provided. Next slide, please. So what are ta'zir ta offenses? In Islamic law, ta'zir refers to punishment as usually corporal that can be administered at the discretion of the judge as opposed to the hudud, the punishments for certain offenses that are fixed by the Quran or Hadith. The burden of proof is less strict in a ta'zir case and testimony of two witnesses or confession is enough. Traditionally, ta'zir punishments could be applied to offenses for which no punishment is specified in the Quran. They could also be applied to had offenses in situations where the standards of proof required for hudud punishments could not be met. Next slide, please. What are examples of ta'zir or minor offenses? In some jurisdictions that apply sharia, eating of prohibited food, insulting and abusing a wife in public, bribery and gambling are some of the minor offenses. In Brunei, one example is of a ta'zir offense is non-performance of the Friday prayers for persons 15 years and over. In Iran, one example is non-wearing of the hijab. Next slide, please. Currently, given the PD 1083 setup, there are only Sharia district courts and Sharia circuit courts and the office of the Juris Consult. Now, under the Bangsamoro Organic Law, there are three levels of Sharia courts, which are the Sharia Circuit Courts, the Sharia District Courts, and the Sharia High Court. Next slide, please. So these are the amendatory provisions in the Bangsamoro Organic Law related to PD 1083, particularly Articles 140, 143, 152, 153, and 154 of PD 1083 or the Muslim Code about Sharia Circuit Courts and Sharia District Courts. We also have Articles 164, 165, 166, 167, and 168 of PD 1083 on the Office of Juris Consult, which are now amended by the BOL. Next slide, please. Let's see the um, differences between Article 152 and Section 8, Article 10 of the Bangsamoro Organic Law on the qualifications of a circuit, a Sharia circuit judge. So the qualifications of a Sharia district uh, circuit judge under the Bangsamoro Organic Law are starkly different from those of the Muslim Code. It is now required that for one to be qualified as a judge in the circuit courts, he or she must be a Muslim, a regular member of the Philippine Bar, at least 30 years of age, must have been engaged in the practice of law for five years or more, and has completed at least two years of Sharia or Islamic jurisprudence. You cannot find this in the uh, Muslim Code. Next slide, please. We also look at the differences um, about jurisdiction provided in the Bangsamoro Organic Law. 
The following cases now fall under the exclusive and original jurisdiction of the Sharia Circuit Courts in addition to those enumerated under PD 1083. So these are now exclusive and original to the Sharia Circuit Courts. All cases involving ta'zir offenses defined and punished again, uh, under Sharia law enacted by the Parliament punishable by arrest to minor or corresponding fine or both. All civil actions under Sharia law enacted by the Parliament involving real property in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region where the assessed value of the property does not exceed 400,000 pesos. And all civil actions, if they have not been specified in an agreement, which law shall govern the relations where the demand or claim does not exceed 200,000 pesos? There are regular courts in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao that already apply the, and recognize that this, these cases fall under the exclusive and original jurisdiction of the Sharia Circuit Courts. Some judges already dismiss cases based on, uh, on the ground of lack of jurisdiction because of this provision. Next slide, please. Similar to the Sharia Circuit Courts, the qualifications of a Sharia District Court under the BOL are also starkly different from those in the Muslim Code. You can see that based on the Bangsamoro Organic Law, for one to qualify as a Sharia District Judge, he or she must be a Muslim, a regular member of the Philippine Bar, at least 35 years of age, must have been engaged in the practice of law for 10 years or more, and has completed at least two years of Sharia or Islamic jurisprudence. Based on our um, conversations with Sharia counselors and pra Sharia practitioners, the qualifications of the Sharia circuit courts and the Sharia district courts in the Bangsamoro Organic Law make it difficult for the courts to be failed. Next slide, please. On the Sharia district court's jurisdiction, here are the cases falling under its exclusive and original jurisdiction, which also appear in the Muslim Code. So the Muslim Code enumerates these cases as falling under the exclusive and original jurisdiction of the Sharia District Courts. All cases involving custody, guardianship, legitimacy and paternity and filiation arising under PD 1083. All cases involving disposition, distribution and settlement of the estate of deceased Muslims, probate of wills, issuance of letters of administrators or executors, regardless of the nature or the aggregate value of the property, petitions for the declaration of absence and death, and for the cancellation or correction of entries in the Muslim registries mentioned in Title VI of Book Two of PD 1083, all actions arising from the customary and Sharia-compliant contracts in which the parties are Muslims if they fail to specify the law governing their relations. Please note that I highlighted Sharia-compliant contracts here because this is something that is um, new in the Bangsamoro Organic Law. Next slide, please. Now, these cases fall under the exclusive and original jurisdiction of the Sharia District Courts, which previously were concurrent with civil courts. Please note, um, I, I hope that our uh, judges would take note that now these are exclusive and original jurisdictions of the Sharia District Courts, which were previously concurrent with the regular courts. All petitions for mandamus, prohibition, injunction, certiorari, habeas corpus, and all other auxiliary writs and processes in aid of its appellate jurisdiction. Petition for the constitution of a family home, change of name, and commitment of an insane person to an asylum. All other personal and real actions not falling under the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts, wherein the parties involved are Muslims, except those for forcible entry and unlawful detainer, which shall fall under the exclusive original jurisdiction of the Municipal Trial Court. All special civil actions for interpleader or declaratory relief, wherein the parties are Muslims residing in the Bonsamoro Autonomous Region or the property involved, belongs exclusively to Muslims and is located in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region. Next slide, please. All civil actions under Sharia law enacted by the Parliament involving real property in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region where the assessed value of the property exceeds 400,000 pesos. All civil actions, if they have not been specified in the agreement, 
which law shall govern the relations where the demand or claim exceeds 200,000 pesos. So we are happy that some of the regular courts in Cotabato City actually are taking cognizance of the exclusive and original jurisdiction of the Sharia courts based on these provisions of the Bangsamoro Organic Law. Next slide, please. We also have the Sharia High Court in the Bangsamoro Organic Law. The qualifications for one to be a uh, justice of the Sharia High Court are that um, he, must, he or she must be a natural-born citizen of the Philippines, a Muslim, a regular member of the Philippine Bar, at least 40 years of age, and must have been engaged in the practice of law for 15 years or more, and has completed at least two years of Sharia or Islamic jurisprudence. He or she must be a person of, of competence, integrity, probity, and independence. Please um, also take note of the last um, sentence or paragraph in this presentation, in this slide, where it says that the Supreme Court may grant the incumbent Sharia district and circuit court judges who are not member, regular members of the Philippine Bar a reasonable period within which to qualify, pending which they shall be allowed to continue discharging their duties. So this has not been operationalized as we speak. Next slide, please. These are the exclusive and original jurisdiction of the Sharia High Court, where either or both parties are Muslims, provided that the non-Muslim party voluntarily submits its, uh, to its jurisdiction. First, all petitions for mandamus, prohibition, injunction, certiorari, habeas corpus, and all other auxiliary writs and processes in aid of its appellate jurisdiction. And next, all, all actions for annulment of judges of Sharia district courts within or outside the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region. Next slide, please. Now the question is, can the Supreme Court review the decisions of the Bangsamoro Sharia High Court? The answer is yes. Under the explicit language of the organic law, the Sharia shall only have application over Muslims only, and nothing shall operate to the prejudice of non-Muslims and non-indigenous peoples. So the decisions of the Sharia High Court are final and executory, but the Supreme Court is empowered by the Constitution to determine whether or not there has been a grave abuse of discretion amounting to lack or excess of jurisdiction on the part of the Sharia High Court. Pending the complete organization of the Sharia High Court, the decisions of the Sharia Courts shall be appealable to the Court of Appeals. Next slide, please. On compensation, benefits, tenure, and privileges, justices of the Sharia High Court shall have the same rank, prerogatives, salaries, allowances, benefits, tenure, and privileges as the justices of the Court of Appeals. Judges of the Sharia District Courts shall have the same rank, prerogatives, salaries, allowances, benefits, tenure, and privileges as judges of the regional trial court. While just judges of the circuit courts shall have the same rank, prerogatives, salaries, allowances, benefits, tenure, and privileges as judges of the municipal trial court. Next slide, please. We talk about the integration of the Sharia bar as a uh, provision of the Bangsamoro Organic Law, particularly under Section 15, Article 10. The Supreme Court may adopt the rules for the integration of the Sharia Bar under such conditions as it shall see fit in order to raise the standards of the profession and improve the administration of justice in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region. In 2019, the Asia Foundation supported the Office of the Bangsamoro Attorney General to conduct assemblies of Sharia practitioners all over the country. We visited Marawi City, Zamboanga City, Cotabato City, and were able to complete a draft integration of um, rules on the integration of the Sharia Bar. Last week, the Bangsamoro Transition Authority Parliament Committee on Bangsamoro Justice Systems um, approved the resolution forwarding the draft rules of, on integration to the Supreme Court. And we hope that the Supreme Court, when it uh, receives the draft rules, will consider the adoption thereof, since under the Bangsamoro Organic Law, it is only the Supreme Court that can adopt the rules and uh, unify all of the Sharia associations and organizations and uh, give a voice to all of the Sharia practitioners in the country. Next slide, please. 
on the creation of new offices, Section 16 of the Bangsamoro Organic Law provides that the Parliament may create a Sharia Public Assistance Office, a Sharia Special Prosecution Service, a Sharia Academy, and the Office of the Juris Consult of Islamic Law. Pending the creation of the Sharia Special Prosecution Service, the existing National Prosecution Service of the Department of Justice shall prosecute criminal cases before the Sharia courts. Under Bangsamoro Autonomy Act No. 13 or the Bangsamoro Administrative Code, the Bangsamoro Parliament already created a Sharia Public Assistance Office and a Sharia Special Prosecution Service. We are awaiting appointment of the heads of offices of these offices so as to enable us to jumpstart activities on Sharia and strengthening the practice in the BARM. The Sharia Academy is also still under study and the Office of the Juris Consult of Islamic Law has not been filled. With this, I wish to thank everybody for your kind attention. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you, Attorney Shah, for that comprehensive discussion. Have you ever wondered what nature of cases has been elevated to the Supreme Court? Well, we are very fortunate today because we have a speaker to discuss with us the different discussions or the, to discuss with us the notable cases that has reached the Supreme Court decisions involving Sharia. Let me have the honor to read his brief bio note. Attorney Jamel Tabao Mamutok is the uh, RTC judge of uh, Branch 192 of Marikina City. He took his oath as a judge only last March 10 of 2022. Prior to his promotion to RTC, he served as a city judge of MTCC Branch 4, Iligan City for nine years. Before he joined the judiciary, Judge Mamuto was with the Commission on Audit for 13 years. He started from State Auditor 1 in 1998 to Attorney 6 or Supervising Auditor in 2012. Aside from being a member of the Philippine Bar, Judge Mamuto is also a Sharia Counselor at Law. He placed third in the Special Bar Examination for Sharia Courts in 2008. He currently serves as a member of the Sharia and Islamic Laws and Jurisprudence Department of the Philippine Judicial Academy. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Judge Jamil Tabao Mamutok. Shukran Jazilan, Commissioner Aisa, for that uh, very kind introduction. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Ashadu la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. Lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hamd. Wa huwa ala kulli shayin kadir. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man tabi'ahum bi ahsanin illa yawm al-deen. Allahumma aj'alna minhum. ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين. We begin by praising and giving thanks to the Almighty, bearing witness that none has the right to be worshipped or unconditionally obeyed except for Him. He is alone and without any partner. We ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to send His peace and blessings upon the final messenger. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and all the prophets and messengers who came before him, his family and companions that served alongside him and those that follow their blessed path until the day of judgment. And we ask Allah to make us amongst them. Allahumma amin. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa hlul uqdata min lisani yafkahu qawli. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Mapia kapipita, marayao may naat, 
maayong buntag, magandang umaga, good morning. Your Honors, brothers and sisters, apologies if I will dispense with the usual acknowledgement and just adopt the courtesies made by Attorney Salma and my good friend, the Attorney General of BARM, Attorney Lai, due to lack of material time. So the topic assigned to me is Supreme Court decisions on Sharia. We will look at selected cases decided by the Supreme Court zeroing in on the doctrines and the rulings of the court on notable and important issues in Sharia. Earlier, the good Barm Attorney General and member of the Parliament, Lai Dumama Alba, a good friend explained to us the salient provisions of PD 1083 and vis-a-vis uh, -vis 11054 or the Bangsamoro Organic Law. And I must say, that is a very perfect starting point for my talk. Why? Because with the changes that we know now, introduced by RA 11054, and after we talk about the decisions of the Supreme Court, it is but apt and beneficial for all of us to answer the question, what if these cases were decided today with RA 11054? Would the ruling of the Supreme Court still be the same or would it be different? Since I only have 30 minutes, I'm compelled to limit the scope of my talk to what I believe are the most important and relevant issues to Sharia. And I have categorized these issues into three as follows. First, jurisdiction on Sharia courts. The second, on the applicability of the provisions of the Muslim Code and to an extent, RA 11054 to non-Muslims. Juxtapose this to the applicability of the provisions of the Revised Penal Code in relation naman to the crime of bigamy and of the Family Code to Muslims, including those who convert to Islam. And the last category, I'll be talking about multiple marriages, polygyny, and combined Muslim civil marriages. Now, before we jump into the first case, let me ask you to just tickle your minds, so to speak, these questions. The first question, in BARM and in the areas covered under PD 1083, these are the provinces of uh, Zamboanga del Norte, Zamboanga del Sur, Lanao del Norte, North Cotabato, and Sultan Kudarat and the cities of Dipolog, Pagadian, Zamboanga, and Iligan. In these areas, which court has jurisdiction over real actions if both parties are Muslims? What about if one of the parties is a Muslim? Which court has jurisdiction? Is it the regular court or Sharia courts? Incidental to this issue is the question, what is the nature of the jurisdiction? Is it exclusive or concurrent? Nabigyan na tayo ng glimpse ni Empilay. Sabi na, nawala na daw yun concurrent. We'll talk more about that. Kasi hindi na, na inalis na, uh, expressly amended yung PD-1083, yung 143. Nawala na yung concurrent. Now, it's exclusive original jurisdiction sa RTC. Second question. Is conversion to Islam, which allows multiple marriages, polygyny, a valid defense to a bigamy charge? What do you think? And the last third question. In a case where a Muslim convert woman married a fellow Muslim under Muslim rights and thereafter she reverted to Catholicism upon her separation from her husband, which law governs the nature, consequences, and incidents of the marriage and divorce? Is it the Muslim code or is it the family code? These are the questions we will answer based on Philippine jurisprudence. So let's begin with the jurisdiction of Sharia courts over real actions. If both parties are Muslims, as we asked, which court has jurisdiction? And what about if one of the parties is not a Muslim? We have 
two cases. The case of Tomawis versus Judge Balindong. This is a real action and both parties are Muslims. And the case of Villa Gracia versus Mala, dito naman, one of the parties, si Villa Gracia, is not a Muslim. The decision of the Supreme Court in these cases can be summarized as follows. Next slide, please. Now, as I said, these cases involve real actions. The court, in determining which, of, which court has jurisdiction, the court drew a line between real actions. Sa PD, is this working? Can you see the point? So, sa PD 1083, there are two possible causes of action. Yung, if the real action arises from customary contracts or not arising from customary contracts. We will learn later on. In RA 11054, naging tatlo na. But uh, sa PD 1083, dalawa pa lang. Now, if both parties are Muslims, sino ang may jurisdiction? Sharia district courts. Exclusive yung, and original yung kanilang jurisdiction. And the legal basis for this is Article 143, 1D of PD 1083. And sa pag-decide ng kaso ng Sharia District Court, anong gagamitin niya na bata, substantive law, to support the decision? It's the Muslim law. We go to the next. If one of the parties is not a Muslim, jurisdiction belongs to regular courts. RTCs or MTCs, as the case may be, depends sa threshold. But with the latest uh, juris law on jurisdiction, wala na. Threshold is now pegged at 400,000 pesos. But previously, 20,000, 50,000. Uh, iniba pa yung jurisdiction ng ano, Metro Manila from outside Metro Manila. All right. But in the case of Tumawis, as well as Villagrasa, yan pa yung ano, applicable law. And the basis for this one is RBP 129, Section 19, Paragraph 2, in relation to Section 33, 3BP 129. Anong gagamitin na batas ng RTC or ng MTC? It's the Civil Code of the Philippines. Now, let's move to the other side. Now, yun pa rin. Yung sa kabila na side niya. Okay. If the real action not arising from customary contracts, and both parties are Muslims. This is the case of Tumawis versus Judge Balindong. Ang sabi ng Supreme Court dito, SDC has concurrent original jurisdiction with RTCs or MTCs. Ang kaso kasi final sa SDC. Tapos, kinwestiyon ni Tumawis, sabi niya walang jurisdiction ang SDC. Sabi niya kasi, ang BP-129, the argument of Tumawis is that BP-129 repealed PD-1083. Because sabi niya, BP-129 is a later law. How did the Supreme Court rule? Sabi ng Supreme Court, under Article 143.2b, PD-1083, merong concurrent jurisdiction si Sharia District Court. So the case can be filed either sa SDC or sa RTC or MTC as the case may be. All right. So, anong gagamitin na batas ni judge, ni SDC? Dito final sa SDC eh. So anong gagamitin mo in resolving the real action? It's the civil code. All right. And uh, I think this is also one of the reasons now if I may give my theory, bakit ginawa na lawyer yung requirement? Because you will be applying now in deciding your case using civil code, kahit SDC ka. So, mahihirapan yung judge kung hindi nag-aral ng, or hindi member ng regular bar, and then you will be applying provisions of the civil code. Alright? So, sabi ko kanina, next slide please, si Tumawis kasi kinwestiyon na yung jurist yung ano sabi niya yung BP 129 nirepeal na niya si 1083 okay and then sabi pa niya ang BP 129 it has application to Sharia courts how did the Supreme Court rule on this the Supreme Court ruled that BP 129 did not repeal PD 1083 and the court further said that BP 129 has no application to Sharia courts and the rationally given by the Supreme Court is that PD 1083 is a special law 
And BP-129 is a law of general application. As such, BP-129 has no application to and does not repeal the provisions found in PD-1083, which is a special law. And PD-1083 applies only to Sharia courts. Next slide. And this is still the slide kanina. Now we will go to the last column. If one of the parties is... Okay. If one of the parties is not a Muslim and the real action, the cause of action does not arise from customary contracts, which has the which court has core uh, jurisdiction, RTCs or MTCs as the case may be. Okay. And SDCs have no jurisdiction. And an legal basis natin dito, 143 of PD-1003, sinabi doon, very categorical ang court, sabi ng court, SDCs will only have concurrent original jurisdiction, this is the case of Villa Gracia, with existing civil courts over real actions not arising from customary contracts wherein the parties involved are Muslims. The Supreme Court interpreted the provision of Article 143 as follows. Next slide, please. Ato. So, Sharia district courts have concurrent original jurisdiction over real actions only when the parties involved are Muslims. Next slide, please. Okay, so, anong gagamitin na law? Of course, the answer is civil code ang gagamitin, ITC. Eh. So, please notice that whether or not both parties are Muslims or one of them is not a Muslim, the civil code, and it is not the civil code that will apply. So that's the summary of Tomawis and Villa Gracia. We now ask ourselves, what if Tomawis and Villa Gracia were decided today na merong RA, i-apply natin ang RA 11054? Which court has jurisdiction? Now, to properly answer the question, begin, we have to remember three points. The first point is that, remember, RA 11054 expressly repealed Article 143 of PD-1083, which is, as mentioned by MPLI, the provision granting both exclusive and concurrent jurisdiction to Sharia district courts. RA 11054 effectively removed the concurrent jurisdiction. The jurisdiction of SDC, to emphasize, is now exclusive only. Second point, RA 11054 expanded the jurisdiction of Sharia circuit courts, granting them additional jurisdiction over some personal and real actions. And last point, we have to remember, RA 11576 is also amended uh, also amended BP-129. So, amended na rin si BP-129. Ang magkalaban na ngayon, RA-11054 and RA-11576. Next slide. Okay. So, under sa 11054, naging tatlo yung pwedeng cost of actions for real actions. Hindi lang arising from customary contracts or not arising from customary contracts. Hinighlight ito kanina ni Impilay. Sabi na meron na sa gitna. Uh, ah, dinagdag sa first yung customary and Sharia compliant contracts. That's the first cause of action. Second, yung Sharia law enacted by the Bar Parliament. I understand wala pang Bar law enacted, but for discussion purposes, we need to know. And the last one, all other personal and real actions not under the jurisdiction of the Sharia Circuit Courts. Now, if the cause of action is a customary and Sharia compliant contract, and both parties are Muslims, no problem. Exclusive yan sa Sharia District Courts. The legal basis natin is Section 6D, Article 10 of 11054. And anong gagamitin ni Judge? Ang gagamitin niya is the Sharia uh, Muslim law. Now, if one of the parties is not a Muslim, 
Definitely, jurisdiction belongs to regular courts. MTC or MT, uh, RTC or MTC, as the case may be, and our legal basis is also Section 6D, Article 10 of RA 1154, because categorical, binasa kanina ni MPLI, applicable lang siya if the parties are Muslims. So if one of the parties is not a Muslim, then regular court. And the regular court will apply, of course, civil code in deciding the case. If the cause of action naman is Sharia law enacted by BARM, and both parties are Muslims, again, SDCs have exclusive original jurisdiction, but up, if it exceeds 400,000, mag-a-apply dito yung threshold. Okay? Exceeding 400,000, SDCs, mas mababa sa 400,000, sa inyo na po yun, sa Sharia Circuit Courts. Okay? Pero wala pa namang batas, nothing to worry. At ang basis natin is Section 5E and 6I, Article 10 of 11.054. Anong gagamitin? The BARM law. The pertinent BARM law. Now, what if one of the parties is that a Muslim? Okay? And the cause of action is a Sharia law enacted by the BARM. Sino my jurisdiction? The general rule is Sharia District Court has jurisdiction. Provided there is a, there is a caveat that the non-Muslim voluntarily submits to the jurisdiction of SDC. Because if hindi siya, then pupunta sa regular courts, RTCs or MTCs. And the legal basis there is Section 5E in relation to Section 6I of Article 10 of RA 11054. Why? Because in both items, there is no mention that they apply only if the parties are Muslims. Okay. Doon sa batas, pagkaka-explain, makikita mo doon sa 6D, 6D, nakalagay, if the parties are Muslims. But for Sharia law enacted by BARM parla Parliament, wala, inalis yun. So that applicable, kahit if one of the parties is not a Muslim. But, provided the non-Muslim voluntarily submits. Pag kinwestiyon niya yung jurisdiction, hindi nag-submit sa jurisdiction ng SDC, regular court tayo. At ang gagamitin, kahit Sharia District Court po tayo, what we will use is Civil Code of the Philippines. Again, perhaps this is the reason why required na regular member of the bar po. Because the law that you will be using and deciding the case is Civil Code. Okay. Patingin yung next slide. Nakalagay doon para mabasa. Okay. Eto. Kasi para makita na in 6D, nakalagay talaga, in which the parties are Muslims if the cause of action is customary and Sharia compliant contract. Pero pagdating sa Sharia law enacted by the parliament, wala. Walang ganong provision. So, the assumption is that it is applicable to non-Muslims. Next slide, please. Okay, so our legal basis is 5E and 6I of Article 10, 11.054. Now, let's go to the third one, all other personal and real actions not under SECs. So, lahat ng hindi under sa jurisdiction ng SECs, mapupunta sa SDCs. Okay? So, except, of course, ejectment cases because in ejectment cases, that's exclusive to MTC. Even RTCs, kahit mataas yung assessed value. And the reason there is that, of course, we know ownership is not an issue. The only issue to be resolved in ejectment is the issue of possession. Now, if both parties are Muslims, then SDCs have exclusive original jurisdiction. I will have to highlight this one because previously, ito yung concurrent na pwedeng i-file sa RTC Sultan Kudarat or pwedeng i-file sa RTC Iligan City. But, under 11054, if both parties are Muslims, SDC na po. Okay? Hindi na siya ano. So, those provinces and cities mentioned, if both parties are Muslims, SDCs have exclusive original jurisdiction. And our legal basis is Section 6G, Article 10 of 11054. And the law to be applied, again, Civil Code. And if one of the parties is not a Muslim, definitely 
um, pupunta sa regular courts. Gagamitin natin yung threshold na 400K up to 400 um, MTC in excess. RTC has jurisdiction. Okay. Next. So I try to attempt, kasi baka pwedeng gamitin na argument, katulad sa case ng Tomawis, in-argue niya, na sabi niya, si BP-129, it's a later law, dapat sabi niya, na repeal niya si PD-1083. Now, it can also be argued here. Next slide, please. Yan. Na yung 11.576, Okay? Kasi inamend yung BP-129 eh, tinaas na yung threshold to 400,000. It's a later law. Uh, 11.576 is effective in 2021. Pero yung RA-11054, yung BOL, it's 2018. So mas bago itong nag-amend sa BP-129, pwedeng i-argue na na-repeal niya yung BOL. Applying to Maui's, the answer is no. A general law and a special law on the same subject are statutes in pari materia and should be read together and harmonized. Since RA 11.576 is a law of general application to the judiciary and RA 11.054 is a special law that only applies to Sharia courts, we apply the principle generalia specialibus non derogant. A general law does not nullify a special law. The general law will yield to the special law in the specific and particular subject embraced in the special law. So following to Maui's, next slide please. We must read and construe 11.576 and RA 11.054 together then by taking RA 11.054 as an exception to the general law to reconcile the two laws. Again, ginamit ko dito yung case ng Tomawis, BP-129, ang kalaban niya, PD-1083. The next slide is on the applicability of the provisions of the penal code in relation to the crime of bigamy to Muslims. The particular provision of the revised penal code is Article 349. And we know Article 349 defines and penalizes bigamy. Okay. Juxtapose this to Article 180 of PD 1083, which provides that, and 180, if you remember, the crime of bigamy shall not apply to a person married in accordance with the Muslim Code. So, walang problema, if you're a Muslim, kinasal ka under Muslim Code, and then you enter into a subsequent marriage under Muslim law. No problem. Nagkakaroon ng issue when a party to a civil marriage, the first wedding is a civil marriage, marriage solemnized under family code, converts to Islam and subsequently marries in accordance with the Muslim code. Question, can they invoke Article 180 of PD 1083 as a valid defense to a bigamy case? The Supreme Court had ruled on this issue time and again. The recent one is in 2021, the case of Malaki versus People. The issue in this case, quoting Senior Associate Justice Leonen. Next slide. Is whether or not a party to a civil marriage who converts to Islam and subsequently marries under the Muslim code is exempted from the criminal liability pursuant to Article 180 of PD 1083. The ruling of the Supreme Court in this case is quite straightforward. The answer is no. Next slide. A party to a civil marriage, again, civil marriage here means married under family code, who converts to Islam and subsequently marries under the Muslim code is not exempted from criminal liability. Silang dalawa. Contracting a second marriage without the previous declaration of nullity of the first consummates the crime of bigamy. Conversion to Islam does not operate to exculpate them from criminal liability under an Article 180 of PD 1083 
does not apply. In other words, to answer our earlier question, is conversion to Islam, which allows multiple marriages, a valid defense to a bigamy charge? We have been asked many times about this by friends. The answer is no. The fact of conversion alone is not a valid defense. Now, one of the facts in the case of Malaki, he failed to secure first the consent of the wife or the court's permission before he married Jacqueline May. The court clarified when the exculpatory provision of Article 180 applies. Sabi ng court, next slide, may timer na five minutes. Okay. Absent the, absent the wife's consent or the court's permission, the exculpatory provision of Article 180 shall not apply since it only exempts from the Church of Bigamy a Muslim who subsequently marries in accordance with the provision of the Muslim Code. As I've said, the case of Malaki is not the first. Before this case, the Supreme Court had decided other cases affirming conviction for bigamy on defenses invoking Article 180 of the Muslim Code. I'm referring to next slide, Noliora versus people, people versus Ong, and Saison versus people. In all these cases, they involve similar facts with Malaki. Now let's move on to the applicability of the provisions of the family code to Muslims. Let's take the case of Artabi Bundaji versus Bundaji. Next. Jump na tayo dun. Okay, may time na. Okay, this one. Bundaji. In this case, is a wife, a Christian, who converted to Islam before her marriage to a Muslim and converted back to Catholicism upon their separation, still bound by the moral laws of Islam in the determination of her fitness to be the custodian of her children? In other words, does the Muslim code stop to apply to a marriage solemnized under Muslim lights after one of the parties converts back to being a non-Muslim? What law should be applied? The Muslim Code or the Family Code? Next slide, please. In Bundaji versus Bundaji, the court applied civil law in the best interest of the children. The court said, in ascertaining the welfare and best interest of the children, courts are mandated by the Family Code to take into account all relevant considerations. Thus, the court applied the provisions of the family code instead of the Muslim code. Interestingly, alhamdulillah, the Supreme Court declared this ruling to be anomalous in the case of Malaki versus people. And the court said, Artad Bundaji versus Bundaji must be revisited when a proper case calls for it. There, petitioner converted to Islam and married a fellow Muslim under Muslim lights. She reverted to Catholicism upon her separation from her husband. In granting her custody of their children, which is merely incidental to the couple's separation, this court applied the family code, ruling that the Muslim code no longer governs since petitioner converted back to Catholicism. This appears to be anomalous, the very words of the Supreme Court. The court said it is inconsistent with how the Muslim code governs the nature, consequences, and incidents of Muslim marriages and divorce. In contracts of marriage, the Supreme Court said the applicable law is that which governs at the time of marriage and is not dependent on petitioner's religion at the time of filing the suit. I think that's all the time I have. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge Jamel. And thank you also to the Supreme Court for all those very interesting decisions. It's uh, very enlivening to be able to see all of these cases that have come alive no, in our, our jurisprudence and uh, case law. Thank you. Speaking of cases, I heard that in the months leading to this momentous event, the Philippine Judicial Academy had been working on a proposal for the revised special rules of procedure in Sharia courts, and it's still a work in progress. That's right, Aisha. I believe some of the participants no, in the process of crafting the revised rules are here. There are FGD participants who are present. And now 
we this is the time that we present to you and talk about these uh, the the provisions of the of the proposed revised special rules of procedure in Sharia courts, and we are privileged to have two discussants lecturers who will lead us in this subject. Our first discussant is none other than Judge Makaundas Haji Rasul. Allow me to read briefly his profile. Judge Haji Rasul is a lawyer and a Sharia counselor at law. He holds a Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Laws, and Master's of Laws degrees. He is the presiding judge of the Regional Trial Court, Trial Court Branch 8, Cebu City, acting presiding judge of the 3rd Sharia District Court, Zamboanga City, and the vice chairperson of the Department of Sharia and Islamic Jurisprudence of the Philippine Judicial Academy. Ladies and gentlemen, Judge Makaundas Haji Rasul. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in na amma ba'd Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Like Judge Jam My time is even shorter 20 minutes so, like what the previous speakers since yesterday, I would like to adopt the acknowledgments and salutations that they already made. I will go straight to my presentation. This is not a lecture. This is a presentation. Because uh, what I'm going to present to you is not yet rules. It has not yet been approved by the Supreme Court. In fact, it has not yet been submitted to the court. And it is not yet even a final draft. That is why we are presenting it here again after the three focus group discussions conducted by the Office of the Attorney General of the Barm, supported by uh, Subatra. Thank you very much, uh, by the way, Attorney Lai and the Subatra. Um, this uh, draft, this is a draft prepared by the Department of Sharia and Islamic Jurisprudence of the Philippine Judicial Academy, uh, led by uh, Chairperson CA Associate Justice uh, Anissa Amanuddin Umpa. As the Honorable Justice uh, Dima Ampao had been emphasizing in the three FGDs, as any Sharia Council at law knows, the present Ijrat al Mahakim al Sharia, or special rules of procedure of the, uh, in the Sharia courts, is consisting only of 18 sections. Two of which is even devoted to saying that the applicable provisions of the rules of court is sup uh, supplementarily applicable to the uh, Ijrat. <coughs> so, Mayroon tayong napaka-iksi na rules na ang supplementary rules ay napakahaba. <laughs> and we have a situation up to now where gumraduate ng Sharia Training Seminar, yung isang trainee, Pumasa pa ng Sharia Bar Examinations, but armed only with rules consisting of 18 sections, or let us say 16 sections. And the problem is, anyone who has appeared in our Sharia District Courts at least, might have observed na ang ina-apply ng judge in conducting the trial or conducting the litigation is the rules of court. And in my experience as acting presiding judge of apat na yata, kutabato pa lang ang hindi ko, hindi ako nakakapag-duty. Naging acting ako sa Marawi, Sambuanga, Tawi-Tawi, at saka uh, Hulo, Sulo. 
As far as I can remember, there were three cases from the Sharia Circuit Court appeal to the Sharia District Court. In all of them, it resulted to a remand of the case for further proceedings. Kaya nga, hindi nasunod yung, at least in my opinion, procedure. Kaya hindi nakapagtataka na noong yung kauna-unahang informal consultation that the department made with the Sharia judges, uh, most of them circuit judges, nasabihan kami, sinabi ng isa, dalawa, hindi ko na maalala kung sino sa kanila. Sabi nila, kami, hindi kami mga lawyers, we are not well versed in the rules of court. Eh, problema namin yung supplementary application ng rules of court, hindi namin alam kung ano pa ang huhugutin namin may apply from the rules of court in our, uh, uh, in the cases that we are trying. Sabi nila, dali nyo na lang. Tingnan nyo kung ano ang mga applicable na provisions ng rules of court sa Sharia Court, dali nyo na sa revisions na dinadraft din nyo. So ito, inadopt namin ang lahat ng applicable provisions of the rules of court to cases over which P1583 and the Bangsamoro Organic Law give jurisdiction to the Sharia courts. Na-discuss na ni Impilay at ni, at, uh, ni Judge Jam ang jurisdictions ng Sharia courts under the two laws. Maraming civil actions, both ordinary and special, special proceedings, may appeals pa, may criminal cases pa. So, tinina namin ang mga applicable na provisions sa rules of court na magagamit dito, ginawa namin. But plus, plus the basic Sharia rules taken from Islamic law na i-apply natin sa Sharia courts. At ito, yan ang kinoconsider kong salient provisions na i-discuss ko this morning, ipipresent this morning. There are also decisions of the Supreme Court that I will call functioning like swords of Democles hanging over our heads in regard to access to Sharia justice, like the case of Tampar versus Usman, where the Ponente suggested the possibility of deleting the provision of Yamin from, or, uh, yeah, in the Ijrat al-Mahakim. Sabi niya, that is a violation of due process. Siguro hindi niya naintindihan ang mechanics ng Yamin. Kaya sabi niya, mayroon bang kasong pwedeng mag ng dahil lamang sa oath? Paano na ang due process? So, he even suggested the creation of a committee to study the possible deletion of that provision. Mayroon pang isa, naalala niya yung Roluna al-Awadhi versus Aste. Nasabi ng Supreme Court, ang Muslim personal laws was promulgated to fulfill. Anak ko, nakarami na akong... <laughs> Nakalimutan ko yung operator. Uh, sorry, sorry. Next slide pa, next slide. Malayo-layo na ako, next slide. Yan, yan, yan. Kala ko may binabasa kayo eh. Pero eh, eh, no problem because familiar naman sa atin lahat, especially the Sarah Counselor at Law, Judge Maniano, hindi pa. Familiar sa atin yung mga kasong yan. In Ruluna al-Awadhi v. Asti, sinabi ng Supreme Court that the Code of Muslim Personal Laws was promulgated to fulfill the aspirations of the Filipino Muslims. Take note, ah, Filipino Muslims. Kaya lang, sabi niya, to have their system of laws enforced in their communities. And those communities are found, niyan ang problema, are found in the ten Mindanao provinces and six cities comprising or comprised within the five Sharia judicial districts 
which were created under Article 138 of the Muslim Code. As neither of the parties, petitioner or the private respondent, and their children live in or are members of those communities, they do not come within the ambit of the Sharia Court's jurisdiction. Alam natin, marami na, napakarami na ang Muslim na hindi. Ito, it, they are referring to the Bangsamoro, actually. But there are so many Muslims now who do not belong to the Bangsamoro. Yung mga balik Islam. And, okay. But take note that the Muslim code did not mention Bangsamoro. It says Filipino Muslims. So that is a, another sword of the Mokwal hanging over our heads as Muslims who want access to Sharia justice. Kaya sa opening provisions pa lang. Next slide please. Yeah. This work that we prepared, and we are still in the process of preparing, by the way, kaya nga hindi pa final version ito. Although we have already considered the results of the three focus group discussions. It's informed by the idea of access to Sharia justice, not just for the Bangsamoro, but for the Muslims in the Philippines as a whole you will see the devices that we inimbinto namin na sumusugal na sana ma-approve ito ng Supreme Court. I would like also to quote uh, Dean Barudi in his uh, right up on Yamin. Kasi applicable din, even on access to physical access, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, access to Sharia justice. Sabi ni Dean, Oz, ang kinikritisize ni Dean yung Satampar versus Osman. Oz places Muslim litigants in the Philippines, Sharia courts, in a better position to enjoy due process contrary to what the obiter dictum suggests. I think Dean Barudi was referring to due process under Sharia in relation to access to Sharia justice. Next slide, please. So, again, our work is informed by the idea of access to Sharia justice by Muslims, not just the Muslims composing the Bangsamoro, but the Muslim Filipinos, Muslims in the Philippines. We also already incorporated the doctrine laid down by the Supreme Court in the Mindis case uh, to the effect that uh, dispute on custody and guardianship between spouses may be included as ancillary remedies in a case of divorce before the Sharia Circuit Court. We adopt as alternative basis of venue, again to promote access to Sharia justice, not just by the Bangsamoro people, but by the Filipino Muslims. Domicile, in case of non-residents like me, I am, not, I am no longer a resident of the Bangsamoro territory, but I have domicile therein. And in case of, non, not, uh, of people who are not even domiciles, geographical, Proximity. Ito ang gambol na sinasabi ko. The clarification of where notices of talak or tafid and subsequent marriages should be filed. The no default rule, which is a basic Sharia concept or doctrine. Again, the provision of Yamin, na medyo dinitalye na namin ang mechanics. The specification of agencies and offices over which the Sharia District Court and the Sharia High Court can exercise the power of certiorari, prohibition, and mandamus. The inclusion of specific uh, bar ministers as persons authorized to file certain special proceedings. 
quorum and voting in the Sharia High Court and Sharia, I mean, rules of evidence which will, which will be discussed by the next presenter. Next slide, please. Ayun, hindi ko na naman na sabihan yung... Next slide. Next slide. Nasabi ko na lahat yan. Okay. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> All right. Binyo. Ito na yung sinasabi kong devices na uh, inadopt namin, sinulat namin sa draft. Example. Is the provision of Section 2, Rule 4 of the draft uh, revision. If none of the parties are residents of any of the territories, within the Sharia districts, but have the missile therein, the action may be commenced and tried in the Sharia court of the place where the plaintiff or any of the principal plaintiffs have the missile, or where the defendant or any of the principal defendants have the missile. Next slide, please. Okay, okay please, please basahin ng maigi. Di, dahil baka ito ang last chance natin na mag-suggest ng comments or uh, uh, additions or deletions sa draft. If the parties are neither residents nor have domicile in any of the territories within the Sharia districts, the action may be commenced and tried in the Sharia court of the place which is geographically closest to the residence of the plaintiff or any of the principal plaintiffs or of the defendant or any of the principal defendants at the election of the plaintiff. <clears throat> Similar, uh, 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 by the way, during the focus group discussions, lumabas yung suggestion na instead of geographical proximity, bakit daw hindi gamitin yung accessibility? But, Ang problema lang kung ang ilagay natin is accessibility. Maraming factors affecting accessibility. So magiging source na naman yan ng English debates. Alam nyo na tayong mga Filipino litigants. <laughs> ang galing natin sa debate. <laughs> Samantalang yung geographical proximity, ang dali lang yan, nag-google lang yan. Uh, I-google mo lang yan, malalaman mo ang saan ang pinakamalapit na sa record. And we adopt similar, next slide please. Ganon ding procedural devices ang inadopt namin every time, in every case where venue is uh, relevant. Ito, on the notice of talak. If you remember, under the Muslim code, ang sabi niya, the husband who pronounced talak must file a notice of talak in the court of, in the Sharia circuit court of the place where his family resides. Ang problema doon, in case ang tinalak na wife hindi na nakatira with the husband, saan ang family residence na consider natin? And there is no period within which the notice must be filed. So nilagyan na namin yan ng period within 10 days. At saka kinlarify na namin that yes, still the, where the family resides, but if the wife is no longer living with the husband, at the time of the pronouncement of the talak, the notice shall be filed in the Sharia circuit court of the place where the wife resides. Binigyan natin ang pabuling wife kasi siya naman yung tinalak. Bibigyan naman natin ng konting pabot. Doon sa lugar niya, ipapile yung notice. Uh, remember that there is a jurisprudence that failure to comply with the requirement of notice regarding talak makes the talak ineffective. It is deemed a withdrawal of the pronouncement. Now, Next slide, please. If the residence of the husband and the divorced wife 
or the residence of the divorced wife if she is not living with the husband is outside the Sharia districts. The notice shall be filed with the clerk of court of the Sharia circuit court of the place where they have domicile or where the divorced wife has domicile if they have different domiciles. Domicile mm. naman. If the husband and the divorced wife have neither residence nor domicile in any of the Sharia districts, the notice shall be filed with the clerk of court of the Sharia circuit court of the place geographically closest to the residence or the divorced wife's residence if she is not living with the husband. Next slide, please. Paano naman yung gustong magduay? Subsequent marriages. If the husband... Ah, uh, wait, wait. Ah, uh, talak pa rin. Talak. Ah, uh, ako na naman ang nahuli. Subsequent. <laughs> The same procedure shall be observed in the case of subsequent marriage. Yung sinabi ko ng procedure, applicable sa subsequent marriage. But, if the husband has more than one wife, okay, yung gustong magdagdag mayroon ng dalawa o tatlo. Because remember, ang limit natin ay apat. Kaya, masarap mag-retire as mag-optional retirement. <laughs> So, if the husband has more than one wife and corresponding residences, and said residences of some of them are situated in different venues, the notice may be filed with the clerk of court of the Sharia Circuit Court in any of such venues at the election of the husband. Ang husband naman ngayon ang pipili kasi maraming residences eh. Well, all of them falls in the same venue. If only one of the residence, residences is situated in a Sharia district, the notice shall be filed with the clerk of court of the Sharia circuit court of the place where such residence is situated. But if none, next slide. Nakakalimutan ko. Sorry. If none of the husband and his wives has residence in any of the Sharia districts, the notice may be filed with the clerk of court of the Sharia circuit court of the place where any of his wives have domicile, has domicile. In case of several places of domicile situated in different venues, the notice may be filed with the clerk of court of the Sharia circuit court in any of such venues at the election of the husband. If none of the wives has such domicile, the venue shall be the husband's domicile. Next slide. If none of the husband and his wives has residence or domicile in any Sharia district, the notice may be filed with the clerk of court of the Sharia circuit court of the place geographically closest to the residence of any of the wives at the election of the husband. Those Provisions, ladies and gentlemen, sana <laughs> ma-approve ng Supreme Court para naman maging available ang access to Sharia justice not only to the Bangsamoro people but also to other Muslims in this country. Next slide, please. And based on our consultation, we were informed that in Islam, there is no place for default. So, nilagay namin dyan, if the defending party fails to file an answer. Within the time allowed, therefore, the court shall, upon motion of the claiming party with notice to the defending party and proof of such failure, proceed to receive the plaintiff's evidence and render judgment based thereon. There is no declaration of default. Pero, hindi naman pwede na hintayin natin hawang buhay yung defendant na mag-file ng answer. The plaintiff can ask the court to receive his evidence upon the expiration of the period within which to file the answer. And we place further regulation to the right of the plaintiff to present evidence even if he had not filed an answer, which is leave of court. Kailangan naman explain niya sa court bakit hindi siya nakapag-file ng answer. Otherwise, baka i-abuse yan. Next. 
Slide, please. If you read the Ijra'at, uh, medyo nakakalito yung formulation ng uh, provision on Yamin. Kaya, ang proposal namin, ikaklarify natin yan. At any time, after the service of an answer or a responsive pleading, but before the termination of the pre-trial, the plaintiff may challenge the defendant to take the amin. If the defendant takes the amin, judgment shall be rendered in his favor. Should the defendant refuse to take the amin, in which case judgment shall be rendered, no, no, no. If the defendant refuses to take the amin, the plaintiff shall affirm his claim under the amin, in which case judgment shall be rendered in his favor. Should the plaintiff refuse to affirm his claim under the amin, the case shall be dismissed. So, sabi ng plaintiff, o oh, magyamin ka. Sabi ng defendant, ayaw ko. Sabi, sabi ng plaintiff, but even in that case, the plaintiff has to affirm his claim under the amin para siya ay manalo. Hindi automatic na kapag hindi yan nag-yamin yung defendant, panalo na si plaintiff. I-affirm pa rin niya yan. Kailangan pa rin. Now, why is it na kailangan after the service of an answer or responsive pleading? Kasi, kapag nag-file ng answer or responsive pleading yung defendant, oh, by the way, it is only after proper service of summons that the court will acquire jurisdiction over the person of the defendant. Yung proper service of summons, your honors, uh, sorry, judges, yun ang nagbibigay ng power sa korte na ibang ang defendant sa kanyang mga orders. Kapag walang service of summons, or even if there is, but it is improper, walang obligasyon ang defendant na sumunod sa mga utos ng hukuman. Then, bakit up to pre-trial? Because when the pre-trial comes, isasama na natin yan sa matters to be discussed during the pre-trial proceedings. I-discuss yan ang possibility of the defendant taking the yamin. In other words, under this formulation, the right to challenge to take the yamin belongs to the plaintiff. It belongs to the plaintiff. The court has no power to compel the defendant to take the amin. Dahil baka doon pumasok yung violation of the due process. Kung ang korte na ang nag-decide, mag kayo para matapos na to. It should be the plaintiff. Because it is a gamble on the part of the plaintiff also na kapag in-accept ng defendant ang challenge, panalo ang defendant. No. The result to Yamin shall be applicable to counterclaims, cross-claims, third-party complaints, fourth-party complaints, and so on. Next slide, please. In the case of counterclaims, alimbawa, ang mayroong karapatan to challenge to take the Yamin ay yung defendant na naging counterclaimant na. Okay? Sa counterclaim na Defendant ang nag interpose siya na ang claimant in a counterclaim. So siya ang may karapatan mag-challenge ng yamin. And the challenge, next slide please. And the challenge to take the yamin shall be in writing and shall be served and heard as in the case of a litigious motion. The resort to yamin is among the matters as I have said already to be discussed during the pre-trial. And it shall be in accordance with the solemnities and rights prescribed by the Sharia. Next slide, please. Next slide. And the court, we reiterated the Ijra'at, the court shall render judgment based on Yamin within 30 days from the administration thereof. Next slide, please. We also incorporated there specific provisional remedies like preliminary attachment, preliminary injunction, 
receivership, reply bin, and support bin din telete. Next slide, please. We also adopted in the draft non cooperative how do you pronounce this? Non or non cooperative will, which is recognized by PD 1083. Non cooperative will is an oral will. Oral will. Next slide, please. But in the case of non cooperative will, it shall be necessary for its proof and allowance that all the witnesses who attested to its declaration as provided in Presidential Decree Number 1083 be presented and testify under solemn oath or affirmation. The rest, in the manner importante, it tongue sa madhav at saka presumption of being a Muslim by a, uh, of a minor or incompetent. So, tapos na yung oras ko. Maraming salamat ko. Waalay ko masalang wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Judge Haji Rasul, and it's becoming more exciting. Nabitin kayo? Wait, there's more. Let help me welcome our second presenter on the work for the revised special rules of procedure in Sharia courts. But first, let me share with you some bits from his lengthy bio notes. Attorney Nor Habib bin Saud S. Barudi is an associate professor of law and presently the dean of MSU College of Law. He is a professorial lecturer of the Philippine Judicial Academy and member of the Department of Sharia and Islamic Laws and Jurisprudence. Dean Barodi is a member of both the Philippine Bar and the Philippine Sharia Bar, placing second in the 2006 Special Sharia Bar examinations. In 2020, he was appointed by the Supreme Court as examiner in procedure in Sharia Court of the Philippines as examiner in procedure uh, in the Sharia Bar examinations. Dean Barodi is a graduate of Master of Laws at San Beda University Graduate School of Law with approved publishable paper entitled The Rights to Return of Maranao IDPs balancing the Maranao IDP's fundamental rights with compelling state interest. Dean Barodi authored the following books, Sharia for the Muslim Region in the Philippines, The Essence of Moral Self-Determination, Marawi 2050, and A Handbook on How to Answer Bar Questions, An Alternative Strategic Approach. He also authored numerous articles nine of which are international publications in the International Islamic University Malaysia Law Journal and University of Malaya Journal of Malaysian and Comparative Law. At the 15th Asia Legal Information Network General Meeting and International Conference at Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok, Thailand in 2019, Dean Barodi presented his paper Reparative Legislation as a Social Justice Compliant Strategy for Sustainability After an Armed Conflict, Legislating the Reparation of Marawi City, Philippines. Dean Barodi is actively engaged in legal and policy research, writing, and analysis. He has drafted several bills and resolutions, and among all of this is the Marawi Compensation Bill version of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, Lanao del Sur chapter, and the proposed implementing rules and regulations of Republic Act 11696, otherwise known as the Marawi Sage Victims' Compensation Act of 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, Dean Attorney Nor Habib Bin Saud S. Barodi. The floor is yours, sir. Shukran Jazilan, ma'am. Audhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Bini amatihi tatimu salihat. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. Subhanaka la ilmalana illa ma'alamtana innaka anta lalimul hakim. 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Good morning. My courtesies and salutations to one and all. In the next 25 to 30 minutes or so, please pay uh, uh, attention to this presentation because for the non-Muslims, this might be the first. This might be your first encounter with some of the basic principles of uh, evidence under uh, Islam. And for the Muslims, especially the Sharia lawyers, this might help us enrich our knowledge of Islamic procedural uh, law. Uh, my assigned task is to talk about the proposed rules on evidence in the Sharia courts. And uh, because we have limited time, I will uh, reduce, I will limit my presentation to the key features, your key takeaways in this uh, uh, presentation. The proposed rules on evidence, I will refer to it as proposal, is quite long. It is consisting of six rules. And uh, furthermore, it consists of 162 uh, sections. So therefore, uh, we will limit it to, that, uh, to the key features and or salient provisions of uh, the proposal. Next slide, please. Similar with the Ijrat al-Mahkim al-Sharia, the proposal retains and further emphasizes that the rules shall apply primarily to all judicial proceedings in or before any Sharia court in the Philippines. It further says that the Sharia court shall adhere to the sources of Sharia relating to all matters of evidence. It would be anomalous for a Sharia court to rely more on suppletory rules instead of relying heavily on rules that have supposedly primary application. Now, this revision emphasizes that the Sharia court shall adhere to all matters of evidence. Again, this is an enhancement of the special rules of procedure in the Sharia courts. Next slide, please. The revision or the proposal, I should say, um, provides for safety net safety nets any provision or interpretation that would eventually let us say be inconsistent with sharia shall be void in so far as the inconsistency is concerned so for the sharia lawyers do not worry if at all there is a provision in the proposal that contradicts the sharia then this is our safety net from such an such a possibility Second, we are human beings. We, the drafters, are human beings. We cannot contemplate every and all circumstances to be governed by rules. Uh, so therefore, if there is any matter which is not provided for or is not clearly stated in the revision, proposed revision, the court shall refer to Sharia. Next slide, please. The revision of proposal likewise uh, reiterates the supplementary application of the rules on evidence under the rules of court. But this time, with an enhancement, an additional rule that would avoid, in the first instance, a one-on-one -on -one confrontation between the rules on evidence under the rules of court and the proposed rules on evidence in the Sharia courts. In case of conflict between the, this proposal and the revised rules on evidence as amended by administrative matter number 19-08-15-SC, the latter, meaning the revised rules on evidence under the rules of court, shall be liberally construed in order to carry out the, uh, the proposed rules on evidence in the Sharia courts. Next slide, please. The revision, or as proposed, 
likewise contemplates the two kinds of judicial notice. We are all familiar with this. We have the judicial notice, mandatory judi judicial notice, and discretionary judicial notice. But this time there is an improvement, an enhancement. Uh, the proposal sees to it that the official acts of the Bangsamoro Parliament as an officially functioning parliament are made a matter of judicial notice mandatorily. Likewise, the history of the Bangsamoro and the Muslims in the Philippines is made a matter of mandatory judicial notice. Yesterday, Dr. Hamid Bara and the other speakers talked about the 13 ethnic linguistic tribes of the Bangsamoro. But what about the history of the Muslims in the Philippines in general? The history of the Muslims in the Philippines is not limited to what is now the territory constitutive of the Bangsamoro. In the past, Manila and Tondo were Muslim kingdoms under the rulership, rajaship, of Raja Sulaiman and Raja Lakandula. So, this proposal sees to it that that is made a matter of mandatory judicial notice. And finally, the Hedri calendar is also made a matter of mandatory judicial notice. Next slide, please. This slide presents to us the methods of proof recognized and mentioned in the proposal. First, you have April or admission or confession. Admission applies to civil cases. Confession applies to criminal cases. Second, you have shahada or testimonial evidence. Third, yamin, as explained by uh, Judge Makhadirasul, which refers to oath, which under this proposal is, you know, uh, recognized as uh, either decisive oath, supplemental oath, or procedural of. The fourth one, the fourth method of proof recognized and mentioned in the proposal is Bayina. Defined in the book of Prosecutor Mangontawar Gubat as other evidence, which includes Karina, equivalent to circumstantial evidence, and documentary evidence and expert evidence. Next slide, please. Ekrar is defined in the proposal as an admission made by a person in writing, orally, or even by gesture. Admission on what? Stating that he or she is under an obligation or liability to another person in respect of some right. Next slide, please. The proposal likewise contemplates the two kinds of admission, judicial admission and extrajudicial admission. An ekran shall be made in court before a judge. The only difference is that admission in the proposal should be in, a judicial admission should be before a judge. And then admission or ekran shall be made outside court the only difference is that it shall be made before two male witnesses who are Akil, Balig, and Adil. These are Arabic terms. Let me translate them very briefly. Akil means a person who, has, who is of sound mind. Balig is a person who is considered in Islam as adult or one who has attained the age of puberty plus Russian or age of discretion, and Adil, which Professor Dr. Anwarullah sums up into one term, credible. Next slide, please. The proposal provides for the rules on admissibility by exclusion. It enumerates what are the admissions which are not admissible. First, the admission of a person who is not akilbaling. The admission of a person who is not of sound mind and who has not attained the age of puberty or, uh, and uh, rushed or discretion. The ikrar or admission of a minor. The admission of a lunatic or a mentally retarded person. 
the admission of a wali or guardian made on behalf of a person under his custody and responsibility, the ikrar or admission that is not made voluntarily, the ikrar of a person who is restrained under any written law to administer his property. Like, for example, those suffering from civil interdiction. Next slide, please. There are two specific instances of admissible ikrar mentioned in the proposal. The ikrar made in a state of maradul mouth, meaning admission made in a, in a state of death illness. The ikrar or admission made by a mumayiz minor. Mumayiz, courtesy of uh, Sheikh Ibrahim Bagamban, means a person who is capable of making a distinction between good and bad, right and wrong. So, the admission of a Mumayiz minor who has been author authorized by his wali or guardian to carry on any business or dealing shall be admissible in so far as it relates to such business or dealing. Next slide, please. Second part, testimonial evidence or what is known as shahada. This means evidence adduced to give true information before the court of what one has seen or known for the purpose of proving or disproving a right, an interest, or a crime. It is adduced in court by uttering the expression ashhadu, which means to bear witness. I bear witness that I saw A kills B. Or any other synonymous expression. Next slide, please. Now, uh, let's proceed to a basic principle of evidence under Islam. The competence of a person to give shahada or bayina. As to who may testify as witnesses, this is articulated in the proposal as follows. All Muslims shall be competent to give shahada, testimonial evidence, or bayina, other evidence, like circumstantial evidence, documentary evidence, expert evidence, as witnesses, provided that they are, to reiterate, akil, a person of sound mind, Balig, a person of discretion, one who has attained the age of puberty. Adil, a person of credibility and a person who is not prejudiced. The last qualification that you see in the competence of the witness, not prejudiced, supplies the basis of the second line that you can see in this slide. That under Islamic law on evidence, Witness does not include a plaintiff, defendant, and an accused. This complies as well to the prophetic tradition that the burden of proof lies on the mudai, which is loosely translated as plaintiff, and the uh, off or yamin is incumbent upon the mudalay or defendant. Next slide, please. How about if the competence of the witness is defective in the sense that it does not comply with the first, with the first the general provision that I explained? A non-Muslim, while he is not competent to give shahada, is nonetheless competent to give bayina or other evidence, circumstantial evidence, documentary evidence, expert evidence, etc., etc. A person who is not adil, while not qualified to give shahada, but nonetheless qualified and competent to give bayina. A person who is not valid, while not competent to give shahada, is competent to give bayina. Next slide, please. A person who has weak memory, while not competent to give shahada, but is competent to give bayina. A person whose credibility is suspected in, in the first place cannot give shahada, but he is qualified to give bayina. Next slide, please. Now, 
these are the two basic requisites for testimonial evidence to be admissible. And this is also similar with the rules on evidence under the rules of court. That testimony should be confined to personal knowledge. Hearsay, therefore, is not allowed in Islamic uh, uh, law. A witness can testify only to those facts which he or she knows of his or her personal knowledge, that is, which are derived from his or her own perception. Second, the testimonial evidence must be direct. What does it mean? If the one to be testified to is a fact that can be seen, then the, then the evidence must be offered wherein the witness says that he has seen the fact or that event or that activity whatsoever. If the fact to be testified to is one that can be heard, then the evidence must be such that the witness will say that I heard so and so, etc., etc. If it is perceived through other senses, then it must be an evidence by which the witness says that I had perceived with the relevant uh, sense that he or she uh, used. Next slide, please. The witness who is unable to speak is capable of, or may give, I should say, his bayina in any manner in which he can make it intelligible, such as by writing or by signs. And the testimony of a person who is incapable of speaking must be given in open court. Next slide, please. Okay, this is again another basic principle of evidence in Islam. It provides, the proposal provides for a general rule on the number of witnesses. Except as otherwise provided or recognized under Islamic law, evidence shall be given by two male witnesses or by one male and two female witnesses. This is the general rule. During the open forum, I would appreciate if there is someone from this group who will ask a gender-based question about this. We will welcome that. Next slide, please. This provides for the exceptions. The evidence of one male person shall constitute sufficient proof in the following circumstances. Now, let me contextualize. The enumeration that you see on the screen are experiences of the Malaysian Sharia court system. Because the working draft actually of the proposed rules on revision came from Sharia court evidence Act number 561 of Malaysia. We have chosen to look towards the direction of Malaysia because likewise they have a dual system and a mature dual system at that. So in their experience, one male person is sufficient to uh, constitute proof on the, in the following circumstances. Evidence of a teacher in a case involving school children. Evidence of an expert in the valuation of damaged goods. Evidence as to the acceptance and rejection of witnesses. Notification of dismissal of a representative. And finally, evidence as to the defects in any goods for sale. Next slide, please. Can a female person testify or is it su uh, sufficient? Yes. Evidence of a female person is sufficient to prove any fact which is usually seen or within the knowledge of a female person. Like for example, the issue of virginity, the issue of childbirth, the issue of menstruation, and other circumstances where only a woman is in the best perception to perceive. Her evidence is admissible as to these circumstances. A claim by a person who is known to be a rich person, and now he is claiming that he has become poor or a pauper, must produce the evidence of at least three male witnesses and this one, I know that there's an objection for this, for the inclusion of this item. In this case, in the case of sighting of new moon, the evidence of one male person who is Adil shall be sufficient to prove such fact. Next slide, please. 
Supposing that the plaintiff can only produce a single evidence, can the evidence of that single witness be admissible? Yes, under the proposal. But there's a condition that that evidence of a single witness should be accompanied by the oath of the plaintiff, which in Saudi Arabia is referred to as supplemental oath, and which has also been explained by uh, Professor Dr. Anwarullah in his book on principles of evidence in Islam. Next slide, please. The disqualifications to testimonial evidence that you can find in the rules of court are likewise applicable under the proposal. Disqualification by reason of marriage, parental and filial privilege, disqualification by reason of privilege communications. Next slide, please. Let's proceed to bayina, which means other evidence which proves a right or interest and includes karina, documentary and expert evidence. Next slide, please. What are the examples under the proposal? Object or real evidence, documentary evidence, or what is referred to in Saudi Arabia as writing evidence and circumstantial evidence or karina. Next slide, please. The proposal likewise incorporates and reiterates the rules pertaining to documents. But this time, the proposal makes some enhancements as follows. Interpretation in accordance with Sharia. In no case shall an interpretation of documents that violates the Sharia be given effect. And that interpretation may be according to orf or custom. An instrument may be construed according to earth that does not violate the Sharia in order to determine its true character. Next slide, please. Let's proceed to the Yamin, which has been discussed as well by Judge Mack. Okay? The proposal reiterates Yamin. And if this is finally approved by the Supreme Court, it will officially put or make Tampar Bisos Osman a thing of the past. Yamin as a method of proof is retained as one that establishes a fact, one that affirms any evidence presented, and one that constitutes as proof in the absence of any other evidence. Next slide, please. What are the qualifications to take Yamin? It, the proposal retains the provision of the Idra'at al-Mahakim al-Sharia that no person shall be allowed to take an oath unless he or she is qualified under Sharia and is fully aware of the solemnity of the oath or the import of the solemn affirmation. Next slide, please. All right, next slide. The form of Yamin. Tampar bin Susman provides a format on how did the uh, oath taker there made Yamin. During the three FGDs that we have in Zamboanga, Marawi, and Cotabato, I asked the group, can you please come up with a statement that will constitute the form of Yamin? So, walang nag-suggest. So, we endeavored to look at a specimen, and we found one in the book of Professor Talib Benito. This is the form, suggested form of Yamin. I swear by Allah, than whom there is no other God who is acquainted with that is hidden and with that is apparent that. And then completed or followed by statements to establish a fact or to affirm any evidence presented. Next slide, please. Let's proceed to Karina or circumstantial evidence. Now, to give context to the non-Muslim lawyers, the concepts of relevant facts and collateral matter under the rules of court crisscross in the concept of Karina under the proposal. Next slide, please. When do facts become corina or circumstantial evidence? Facts become corina if they are inconsistent with any fact in issue or relevant fact. Second, facts become corina if by themselves or in connection with other facts, they make the existence or non-existence of any fact in issue or relevant fact highly probable or improbable. Those are the requisites. 
Next slide, please. Some examples are given and recognized in the proposal. Facts forming part of same transaction. Facts which are the occasion, cause, or effect of facts and issue or relevant facts. Motive, preparation, and previous or subsequent conduct, etc., etc. As you can read in the screen are examples of Karina in general. Next slide, please. There are some Karina arising from statements made under special circumstances. What are these circumstances so recognized in the proposal? Entries in books of account, entry in public record made in performance of duty, statements in maps, charts, and plans. And to give you context, when we filed the uh, Republic versus China, our uh, very own uh, former sub, um, senior associate justice Carpio uh, had collected uh, ancient maps as our evidence of our claim against China. Okay? Next slide, please. Other prominent examples are likewise recognized in the proposal. Judgments of courts in recognition of the principle of res judicata. Opinion of third persons who are experts in recognition of their expertise. And then the character of a person could likewise be considered as a karina under certain circumstances that are laid down in the uh, proposal. Next slide, please. Burden of evidence. The burden to produce evidence in a civil case lies on the person who alleges or asserts a fact. Mudai. And the person who takes the oath to deny or dispute a fact. Al-Mudali. Right? We say that this Definitions are more in consonant with the true meaning of mudai and mudalai. Next slide, please. The burden of proof in a suit or proceeding lies on the, on the person who would fail if no evidence at all were given on either side. This is basic. I know that you know this. Next slide, please. Next slide. All right, there are special provisions uh, relating to shahada that are laid down in the proposal in order for the court to inquire into the credibility of witness. The credibility of a witness is so important to a case that if a witness who is incredible is allowed to testify, it may result in a miscarriage of justice. Hence, as a principle of evidence in Islamic law, Sharia courts, as practiced in other jurisdictions, may make use of the concept of muzaki, secret examination. Where a witness has given his evidence by way of shahada, and the judge has reason to believe that he is not adil, he is not credible, the judge shall order such witness to be inquired into, either through a secret examination or open inquiry. Next slide, please. Okay. How is secret in inquiry made? Next slide, please. It is made or conducted through a secret, secret letter delivered by the court to a secret examiner, Muzaki. And what is the purpose of that secret letter to ask, she, ask him, is this witness credible or not credible? If he says credible, the testimony of that witness is admitted by the court. If the secret examiner says, Gairo Adil, not credible, the judge, next slide please, may not accept the evidence of such witness. Next slide please. It can likewise be done, or the number of secret examiners could either be, uh, could be two or more examiners, and these examiners must be Muslims, Adil, sane, adult, and having full knowledge about the background of the witness. Next slide, please. It can also be done through an open inquiry in open court. Next slide, please. Nonetheless, the party may question the credibility 
of a witness who is already declared adil or not adil, etc. But he has to prove that to the court. Next slide, please. The party may also deny that witness. Next slide. And the proposal. Next slide. Uh, also adopts the rule on preponderance of evidence. The Sharia court may also consider the number of witnesses, though the preponderance is not necessarily with a greater number. Next slide. Proof beyond reasonable doubt in the case of criminal cases, as may be legislated by the parliament. Next slide. Wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Thank you very much. Dean, you may opt to stay on stage because at this point, uh, we would like to call back uh, all our speakers on stage uh, for this morning. Thank you once again, um, Dean Barodi and uh, Judge Haji Rasul. I am sure the participants found the past few qu lectures quite stimulating, so we're now opening the floor for questions to our speakers. But before that, uh, may I have uh, this chance to give you a few reminders, no? In the spirit of um, uh, making our Q&A portion more orderly and um, facilitate it properly, we would like to remind uh, our participants that uh, you will be given the chance to speak and ask your questions. So please limit your question to one specific question about a particular topic and address it no, to a particular speaker so that we know uh, to whom the question is directed. And then you're allowed just one follow-up question after that one specific question. Um, another reminder also, no, because yesterday we had, a, we had also a round of Q&A, and uh, I think there were some who missed the chance to address their questions to the speakers. So uh, for those who were not able to ask the questions yesterday, you are invited to write down your questions, no? just identify to whom you are addressing your question from yesterday's discussion, and then uh, just drop your uh, written questions uh, at the table outside, at the Filja table registration outside, so that we can uh, send your questions to, to the appropriate resource person and then uh, you can have your feedback via uh, email uh, sent to you after that. Uh, again, we would like to remind our participants, uh, we are going to be limiting our questions to the specific topics that were covered this morning, and you're allowed one particular subject question and one follow-up. So if everything is clear, Again, our system would be similar to yesterday's uh, setup. No, we have three microphones here. I already see people lining up. Please just wait for you to be recognized before you give your question. So, if everything is clear, uh, attorney, uh, ma'am Aisha, if you have anything else to add? Yeah, questions uh, to be directed to MP Shah Elijah, Elijah Dumama shall be answered by Judge Mamutok. Okay. So, thank you very much. So if that is now clear, we will go uh, this way. No? So we have three microphones. We will start with you, sir. Uh, go ahead. You have the floor. Oh, by the way, I am Judge Usuk Mangutara Ali, presiding judge of Saria Circuit Court of Iligan City, acting presiding judge of the Third Saria Circuit Court of Baloi, Lano del Norte, acting presiding judge of uh, the Eighth uh, Saria Circuit Court of Malabang, Lano del Sur. Uh, I, I will raise this question because as we experienced during my uh, stint in the Sharia Court for 30 years, from uh, 32 years, from court stenographer to clerk of court to judge in illegal city. Uh, ito palagi ang na-encounter namin sa court namin na palagi kong tinatanong sa mga during convention seminar before 2000 conducted by the PIDIA regarding specific offices under PD-1983. Ito kasi yung mga kaso na pinahil sa akin sa Iligan City 
na yung illegal solemnization of marriage, uh, nangyari dito sa Cagayan, nangyari sa Cebu, nangyari sa Manila, then nag-file yung opposing counsel na i-dismiss for lack of jurisdiction. Uh, sinulat ko itong provision na ito kasi sabi ng mga justices na nagkukundak ng seminar noon, nagagamitin namin sa Sarial Court yung rules on summary procedure when it comes to specific offenses which is a criminal cases. According to Section 18, uh, supplementary rule in special open, offenses. Subject to the next preceding section, all cases, special cases, or offenses cognizable by the court may be filed in such form and in such manner as prescribed by the applicable rules and the rules of court shall apply in a supplementary manner. So, itong kaso na ito, palagi na ito nabubrut at sa court namin. As I read the draft of the Special Rules of Procedure, 189 pages yata yun. Walang nakalagay na rules on criminal procedure on regarding specific offenses. So sana may habol ito ng uh, Saria Department ng Pilja about our concern to weather with this uh, problem. Some of our Pilja judges parang na-encounter na yata itong mga kaso na ito. Na Marami salamat sa Pilja eh, Supreme Court na mabibigyan ng atensyon itong problema ito kasi ito ang lapsis. Walang rules na nag-govern ng kaso na ito. Then this is a violation of the substantial rights of the parties. O, tingnan mo, yung babaeng kasal na hindi pa divorce, mag-aasawa na naman sa ibang lugar, Din ang husband mag-file ng uh, kaso sa illegal city, madi-dismiss for lack of uh, the rules and uh, procedure of this uh, specific offenses. Sana mabigyan ito ng uh, atensyon ng Pilja Department na ito ang pinaka-substantial rights ng mga parties or clientele namin sa Saria Court. Thank you very much, Judge. Uh, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Judge, and thank you for uh, bringing that matter up. Nakarecord po tayo, so lahat ng mga pinag-uusapan natin dito uh, will be given to the proper uh, uh, parties. Itong mga questions na lalabas ngayon tungkol sa revision, may bibigay sa amin yan. So makukonsider natin yan. But before that, I would just like to point out Yung fundamental rule na in criminal cases, uh, the situs of the crime is a matter of jurisdiction. Uh, hindi tulad ng civil cases na yung venue uh, can be waived uh, because it is based on, I mean, uh, on convenience. Pero yung criminal cases, kung saan talaga nangyari yung crime, doon sa korte ng lugar ipapail ang may jurisdiction. But we also understand na the Muslim Code makes a, a places it under the exclusive jurisdiction. The specific offenses defined under the Muslim Code are placed under the exclusive jurisdiction of the Sharia Circuit Courts. In other words, walang ibang korte ang pwedeng maghandle doon. So, paano naman yung mga crimes, specific offenses committed outside the territorial jurisdictions of the uh, Sharia Circuit Courts? Mawawala na lang kasi exclusive nga ang jurisdiction ninyo. So, but pag-isipan natin yan kasi hindi naman pwede ang ganyang sitwasyon. Uh, it is a miscarriage of justice. It will give rise to miscarriage of justice. So, thank you very much, Jess. Wala kaming definite, wala akong definite answer sa'yo except to say that we will consider that. I just give you the fundamental rule para warning na baka hindi ma-adapt. <laughs> ma so, 
this is the right time na makorek yung injustices ng yeah. issue na ito. Uh, regarding sa rules on criminal procedure naman, mayroon ang revised rules. Inalap namin yung rules on criminal procedure, the regular because mayroon tayong yung nakalimutan ko lang anong specific offense na ang penalty, uh, ang maximum uh, penalty prescribed is two years, so prison correctional yun. Uh, but most of the criminal cases falling under the jurisdiction of the Saria courts uh, would fall under the summary procedure. Inadapt natin yung summary procedure. Inadapt din natin yung expedited uh, proceedings. Uh, pati judicial affidavit rule, ginawa namin separate rule or, or, or in-incorporate na sa revised rules para yung mga Saria judges natin at mga Saria counselor wala nang hahanapin. Nandiyan na yan sa isang Rules of special, I mean, special rules of procedure in the Sarai Courts ang lahat ng kakailanganin nila. Sana, sir, mabigyan ng reconsideration yung binit uh, ni kung ano na question. Kasi pag hindi niya nabigyan ng uh, rules, parang wala nang saisay yung specific offenses. You could imagine yung kasal, nagpapakasal sa ibang lugar, na madidismiss yung kaso niya. So maraming gagawa ng ganyan kung malalaman ng publiko na pwede pala magpakasal ng ibang lugar kaya madidismiss sa korte ng Saria Court. Pangalawang issue ko, sir, this is a problem also in my court. Uh, pag nag-receive kami ng specific offenses, pinupuruhan namin sa City Prosecutor's Office of Iligan City Maraming kaso na napinupurwan ko, hindi nila, hindi sila nagkukundak ng preliminary investigation. So dapat talaga mayroong saria criminal procedure na nakalagay dyan para yung mga piskas naman sa amin mabigyan ng atensyon na dapat sila, yun ang trabaho nila, to conduct preliminary investigation. Yan lang po ang question ko. Salamat sa inyo. Thank you very much. Thank so you. before again recognizing the next speaker, we would like again to remind our uh, those who are lined up already, please be specific no, and be direct about your question and that you're only allowed one follow-up. No? So Attorney thank you. Attorney Muhammad. So can, okay, we would like to Muhammad, acknowledge... Very, very quick. Ano lang doon sa, ano, doon sa PI. Under sa PD 1083, idagdag ko doon sa, ano, ang maximum penalty po kasi is two years if you remember, yung sa five offenses, specific offenses, under PD 1083. Lalabas po kasi ito, hindi kailangan ng preliminary investigation. Mababa siya sa four years, two years, and one day. We're in mandatory yung pag-conduct ng preliminary investigation. Sayang, wala si, ano, wala si MP Lai, but we will inform her. Kasi under si rules and under sa BOL, nakalagay na kailangan na nilang i-organize yung regional prosecution's office. Para tama ka, para for the offenses. And then, ini-expect natin na dadami yung criminal cases. Na-mention na kanina yung Tazir cases. So, dadami yung kaso ninyo, criminal cases. Na-mention ni Judge, kasama sa proposed revision, meron tayong expedited procedures. We adopted the expedited procedures applicable for regular courts for Sharia courts. Ang um, may exclusive jurisdiction nito, Sharia Circuit Court, the reason is, nakalagay sa BOL, ang maximum penalty na pwedeng ipataw na ang gagawin na batas ni Bar Barn Parliament is only arresto menor. And uh, that falls under the jurisdiction of SCC. Ngayon, wala, wala dito yung mga justices, but I want to put it on records. Alhamdulillah, thank you for your questions para sa Supreme Court kasi that's the question expanded yung jurisdictions. For SECs, nadagdagan yung jurisdiction nyo ng dalawa. Madadagdagan yung criminal nyo. Mayroon na kayong criminal cases, yung Tazir. Uh, alhamdulillah, transition pa tayo. Wala pang mga criminal cases na nagawa ang Barn Parliament. Paano kung magkaroon na? Anong gagamitin nyo ngayon ng rules? Meron na po tayong proposed. Hindi lang na-touch kanina because, because of the limited time. We have. We have. And we're adopting the expedited procedures summary procedure sa criminal procedure po. And we are asking, just to put on record, na sana ang uh, Supreme Court and Bank, kasi wala sa atin eh, nasa Supreme Court and Bank, sa, sa kanila yung decision, paano mapabilis? And galing sa ground, galing sa inyo, kayo nagsabi na kailangan nyo ng rules para magamit ninyo. And on the other side, yung creation of 
Oo nga, papaano yung mga sa Manila, wala tayong magagawa, kailangan natin ng substantive law. And I heard uh, Senator Zubiri, alhamdulillah, kaya nagpapasalamat ako at nagkaroon tayo ng ganitong summit because they have pledged their commitment. Uh, I know Congressman Zia, meron na siyang bill pending and then madadag pa yung version na gagawin para magkaroon, yes, para yung, for example, in Luzon and in Visayas where there are significant numbers of Muslims, magagamit natin kasi nandiyan na yung specific offenses. Maraming salamat. Thank you very much, Judge. Thank you very much, Your Honors. And we are seeing light, no? <laughs> in a few years to come. Now, we would like to acknowledge the second um, part of question through Dean Macrina, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Um, this is a question that I'd like to address to the uh, court administrator in Mindanao. Um, we're doing a lot of work, you know, uh, easy access to justice, but there's something we need to look at, and that is the facilities of our Sharia court. I went to one of the Sharia courts in the province, to be specific, actually in Tawi-Tawi. The, the judge there has to go to the office early in the morning to get the cases and has to go home in the afternoon to do his assigned task because there's no electricity in that building. There, in fact, the payment for the, the building, the judge himself will share and also the staff, okay? And can you imagine that kind of Shari Accord that we have? And I think facilities in terms of like computers, they don't have that kind of facility. And I'm sorry to ask this question because I think this is the best forum because we have here the, you know, uh, the, some of the justices of the Supreme Court and the court administrator in Mindanao. So, sir, can, can I throw this question to you and um, in, in the interest of helping the Sharia court, uh, we want to hear your opinion about this. Uh, yes, sir, the court administrator. Yes, good morning. Uh, I am uh, Raul Villanueva, the uh, court administrator of the Supreme Court. So let me just be clear about our courts, the Sharia Circuit Courts uh, in uh, Regions 9 and 12. First is that uh, we have two kinds of courts, no, usually. First is a court that is owned by the Supreme Court. And the other one is, uh, of course, uh, courts where uh, the uh, hosts no, are the LGUs. So if the court of the Sharia Circuit Court or the court premises, no courtrooms, being used by the uh, Sharia circuit courts are owned by the LGUs, and we do not have a memorandum of agreement with them for the use of these courts, then the maintenance will have to be uh, shouldered by the LGUs. Why? Because the Supreme Court cannot provide funding for the maintenance of these courts if we do not have any interest at all over them. Otherwise, we may be charged with malversation no, of public funds. So that's very important no, to, to be clarified no, about the status or the condition of the courts that we have. Now, if uh, the courts, or the, if the LGUs cannot provide the courts for our Sharia circuit courts in any of these regions, then I have discussed this already with, the, uh, with our Sharia circuit courts yesterday. We have the funding mm -hmm. to lease courts for them. They just inform us. Uh, we have a process, no? Unfortunately, uh, there is uh, RA 9184, which requires, no? Or provides some conditions or terms for uh, purposes of leasing properties. And they just need to inform us about at least three possible sites to be leased and uh, the moment that they provide us this uh, no, information, and of course the cost no, of leasing these properties, then uh, we will no, initiate the uh, procedure no, in order to provide that lease property as our court no, for the Sharia circuit courts. 
So I guess, uh, you know, of course, uh, these things will have to be brought to our attention mm -hmm. so that we, cannot, we can act on them. If these are not brought to our attention, definitely we cannot do anything. But I assure you, uh, of course, we have uh, the deputy court administrator in charge of uh, Mindanao is uh, DCA Leo Madraso. He is actually making uh, the rounds in so far as our Sharia courts are concerned, not only our regular courts no, in Mindanao. And uh, uh, once uh, data no, on uh, these matters are brought uh, to him, uh, definitely you can expect the Office of the Court Administrator with the support of the entire Supreme Court will do something about our court premises, housing our Sharia circuit courts and even our Sharia district courts, even if no, we only have five uh, and only one is, an, uh, is a permanent judge and we, uh, we ask Judge uh, Haji Rasul here no, to handle at least one Sharia district court in Sambuanga City. So maraming maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Court Administrator. Uh, Ang and interest po na ibig sabihin ni Court Aday, nung sabihin niyang walang interest, ibig sabihin kailangan ng Supreme Court ang owner oh, or oh. lisi ng premises bago makagamit ng pera gasto sa repair. Hindi ibig sabihin niyang wala silang interest. <laughs> oh, oh. Maraming maraming salamat po and that is a very enlightening response no, that we received from the Office of the Court Administrator. Okay, so can we have the next gentleman, sir? You are recognized. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala huwa barakatuh. I am attorney Mangai Guru Jr. from NCMF. My question is addressed to Judge uh, Haji Rasul and uh, perhaps uh, Dean Barudi. This is pertaining to the uh, proposed rule on Yamin, uh, specifically Rule 34, Section 1. Perhaps this might be a uh, clarification. And uh, allow me to read the first two paragraphs at any time after the service of an answer or responsive pleading, but before the termination of pre-trial, the plaintiff may challenge the defendant, defendant to take yamin. Second paragraph, if the defendant takes the yamin, the judgment shall be rendered in his favor. Now my question is, the, the, there is two possible scenarios here. One, the defendant has no counterclaim. Would this mean that the case of the, uh, filed by the plaintiff will be dismissed? Or the other scenario, the defendant has counterclaim. Ito ba yung minimin niya that the defendant uh, will automatically be rendered, a uh, judgment will be rendered in his favor? Uh, okay. Um, mahirap magdetalye, uh, but this is, uh, let me point this out. Ang may karapatan mag-challenge ng Yamin is a claimant. In the main case, it is the plaintiff. Kung mayroon counterclaim, it is the defendant who is making the counterclaim. Uh, we also have to understand na mayroon tinatawag na permissive counterclaim, mayroon din tinatawag na compulsory uh, uh, counterclaim. Uh, yung defendant halimbawa, nag-counterclaim ng uh, sabi niya, o nga, may utang, may utang ako sa kanya na simple loan, Pero hindi naman siya nagbabayad ng upa sa aking lupa na ginagamit niya. Uh, mayroon din siyang utang sa akin. Yun ang tinatawag na permissive claim. Uh, yung compulsory counterclaim naman, yung connected sa main case, like normal na din lagi ng mga abogado ng dependent na sabi niya, dahil nga kinaladkad mo ako sa korte, ah, babayaran mo ang ginastos ko sa abogado ko at sa kasong ito. Yun ang uh, compulsory counterclaim. So probably... Thank you for bringing that up. Ba, gagawa natin niya ng clarification regarding, i-distinguish natin ang permissive at saka compulsory counterclaims. Uh, but as a general principle, yun nga. In a counterclaim, of course, si dependent ang claimant, siya ang may karapatang mag-challenge. Uh, yes, uh, just a follow-up follow uh, for clarity. Okay. Yes, because uh, wala kasi sa explanation. Ang nakalagay lang kasi dito is uh, the defendant uh, if the defendant takes the yamin, the judgment shall be rendered in his favor. And of course, as a lawyer, alam natin the difference between the, just the dismissal of the case or a favorable judgment is given to him. So, thank you, Judge, for uh, taking that note that there needs uh, clarification to this uh, 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 provision. Maraming salamat po. Thank you for uh, raising that issue also. Okay, we will entertain the next question. Ms. 
Zen, please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Peace be with you all. Assalamu alaikum and peace be upon you all. I am Zenilinda Saipudinando, a parliament staff at the Bangsamoro Transition Authority and engaged in a limited practice, Sharia practice. Also a member of Bangsamoro Sharia Lawyers League Incorporated and the Philippine Sharia Lawyers Incorporated. One of the challenging issues affecting us Sharia practitioners is the proliferation of filing of petitions for divorce before Sharia courts by non-Muslims or who present themselves as Muslim converts, which, with all due respect, with non-Sharia non or non-Muslim lawyers as counsel, since regular lawyers being full-fledged are allowed to practice before Sharia court. What is more frustrating, again with all due respect, allegedly some Sharia judges are granting such kind of petition for divorce which we as, as Sharia practitioners know that it is not allowed by the PD 1083 as amended by the Civil Code as amended by Family Code and the recent jurisprudence, the, Ma the Malaki case. I was personally offered several times by non-Muslim lawyers who were my batchmates in Ateneo de Davao, but I outrightly turned down no matter how much the offer and gave them a little lecture on Sharia. I take it as a dis disrespect on Sharia and a mockery of our own faith. My question is, how can the judiciary address this issue so as totally eradicate this and give Sharia the treatment it deserves? Thank you very much and wassalam. Uh, thank you, no, but since that question is uh, technically an it's an open question, we take do not, unless of course any of our panelists wants to comment on that, but we take note and thank you for raising that question. Um, but since none of the panelists can, is really competent not to address that at this point, uh, we'll just move to our next gentleman. Yes, sir, you have the floor. Go ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm uh, Attorney Abdul Aziz Ismail, lawyer, Sharia counselor, private practitioner, Sharia bar lecturer with the NCMF Region 9A. Uh, just for the information of my brothers and sisters in the Sharia Bar, I'm the, the one who sent the letter request to the Supreme Court uh, requesting that the Sharia counselors um, be allowed to have an abbreviated title. And I, uh, just like uh, ATTY for attorney at law, CPA for certified public accountant, LPT for licensed professional teachers, um, so I suggested SCL, which stands for Sharia Council at Law, or any other uh, title abbreviation, the court may deem proper. So uh, my question is for uh, Attorney Alba, since he's not here, uh, it would be to Judge uh, Mamuto. My, my, my question is, um, by the way, I'm the president of the Philippine Sharia Bar Association. The question is um, regarding Article 10, Section 5, Section 6, and Section 7 of the Barn Law, uh, which states that before the Sharia courts, um, Sharia courts shall have original, exclusive jurisdiction uh, on these cases. Um, if a party is non-Muslim, she or he must submit to the jurisdiction of the court. And let's say the couple, the Muslim man and a Christian woman married uh, under Muslim code, which is now governed by Article 13 of the Muslim code. So what if in case of divorce or in case of custody or in case of appeal, with the district court or high court, the non-Muslim party does not submit her person to the jurisdiction of the Sharia court. Well, this is an exclusive jurisdiction. In other words, we cannot file it in any other court. So what shall the court do? Can it take cognizance of such case if the non-Muslim party does not submit jurisdiction to the court? 
right? Sige. Uh, I'll attempt to ano, very specific yung case na ano mo, no? Sa personal uh, relations. Uh, okay. Um, first off muna, if it's personal or real actions yan, there are three. Depende sa cause of action mo. So magpo-fall on. There, in the, the other two, ng 6G and 6I, uh, there is a requirement. Uh, premise nung section, sa jurisdiction, nakalagay na it applies to both or either parties na Muslims. And then, dapat na voluntarily submits to the jurisdiction of the court si non-Muslims. But if you will look at the items, nakalagay din ulit whether or not applicable siya to uh, if one of the parties is not a Muslim. There is a qualification dun sa each item. We have to take it item by item. Uh, each item nakalagay if both parties. And following the ruling in uh, Villa Gracia, yun yung gag magagamit natin dun na guidance, sa Villa Gracia, ganun ininterpret ng Supreme Court. Since there is a particular very specific na sinabi yung batas if, bo if both parties are Muslims. So, magiging exclusive jurisdiction yun ng ating uh, Sharia courts. Otherwise, mag apply yung sa taas na if iko-question niya yung jurisdiction, will not submit to the voluntary jurisdiction of the court, then wala tayong magkaka-issue tayo dyan. Matitest case natin sa Supreme Court. Uh, next, uh, just one follow-up, sir. Uh, Adone Ismail, are you referring to divorce, divorce between a Muslim yes. and a non-Muslim? And, and maybe perhaps custody or even appeal because uh, uh, this court... Okay, okay. Uh, let, let us talk about divorce muna. Between a Muslim and a non-Muslim who are spouses whose marriage was solemnized in accordance with Muslim law. Uh, palagay ko, uh, personal interpretation ko lang to, pero para magkaroon ka ng sagot. Palagay ko, when a non-Muslim marries a Muslim under the Muslim law, that is already a submission to the jurisdiction of the court. Uh, Your Honor, uh, Kasi yung marriage na ganyan is specifically governed by the Muslim court. Eh, sino naman ang may jurisdiction sa mga cases arising from the Muslim court except the Sharia courts? Uh, forgive me, Your Honor. Um, my question is really a bit um, confusing, kumbaga, uh, because uh, we still have to uh, if uh, I may read the provision, uh, no? Eh, ano ko, malaki ang gagamitin natin. Malaki, yes. sinabi niya doon, what governs yes. at that time of the marriage. Yes. I think I emphasize that. Okay. Uh, ngayon, naintindihan ko yung tanong mo. Yes, so, at that time of the marriage, ano ang applicable law? Okay. Yes, Judge. So, Muslim code, and then we apply yes, Muslim yes. code. Uh, lastly, Judge, um, pertaining to Section 13 of the Article 10, if I may read, the practice of law before Sharia courts the following are eligible before the practice, before the Sharia court. One, Sharia counselor at law. Two, a regular member of the Philippine bar provided that a Muslim or non-Muslim who submits to the jurisdiction of the Sharia court who acts on one's behalf as counsel shall be allowed to practice before the Sharia court. So, does that mean, how would you interpret this, uh, Your Honor? Um, does it mean that a lawyer, before he can practice in Sharia court, he must submit to the jurisdiction of the court and he must be a party to the case? With Section 13, letter B, Your Honor, because um, there is a condition before a regular lawyer can practice before a Sharia court. Section 13 of Article 10 of the uh, Barn Law. And uh, lastly, Your Honor, can we avail the decision of the Supreme Court in Pulido versus People, wherein the Supreme Court held uh, avoid at initial marriage is a valid defense in prosecution of bigamy, even without a judicial declaration of nullity. Consequently, a judicial declaration of absolute nullity of either the first or the second marriage obtained by the accused is a valid defense. Is it, can we avail it in the Malaki case wherein the Supreme Court declared that a marriage, a second marriage, that was which 
was solemnized under the Muslim code. However, uh, did not comply with provisions of the Muslim code, Article 27 and Article 62, Paragraph 2, um, because uh, these marriage are, uh, the political case is in civil, while in the Malaki, it was declared that a marriage not complying with the provisions of the Muslim code is null and void, adopting the opinion of Justice Daniel Rasul and uh, Ben Sao Judge Ben Saudi Arabani. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> Ang haba ng tanong, ah. <laughs> uh, Actually, can I read your notes? <laughs> okay. So in the in the meantime, again, we'd just like to remind our uh, participants who will ask questions. No, kindly be uh, uh, concise and direct with your questions. Uh, and please identify to whom you would uh, you address your questions no? so that we can uh, be more uh, prompt and more organized in our Q&A. But in the meantime, if uh, Judge Haji Rasul would like to respond, but otherwise, sir, you can also just confer with him uh, 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 later. Uh, uh. Uh, we will just talk about that so that uh, we can consider it. Pero uh, yung... Citation uh, failure to comply with the requirements of notice. Did you ask about that before uh, before contracting subsequent marriage? It's in being the, it's being in the Malaki a, case, Your Honor. Uh, being a ground for bigamy. Yes, sir. Malaki uh, case, Your Honor. Uh, before that case, my personal opinion is that was that uh, because now I have to adopt the opinion of uh, the Supreme Court. <laughs> this decision. But my opinion before that case was failure to comply with the requirements of notice for, the, uh, for contracting subsequent marriages does not go into the validity of the subsequent marriage. It is a criminal offense, but it does not affect the validity of the subsequent marriage. The marriage, subsequent marriage is valid, pero nga, criminal liable yung tao. But now, with the decision of the Supreme Court, it is somehow settled, unless the Supreme Court uh, uh, changes it. Thank you very much, sir. Now we move on to the next uh, gentleman. Uh, Attorney Abo, you are recognized. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. I am uh, Director Rolando Abo of the Bureau of Legal Affairs, uh, National Commission on Muslim Filipinos. Uh, I'd like to ask two questions, and I address this to any of the panelists. The first question is that, uh, uh, what is the career path of the Sharia counselors? I ask this question because there is no Sharia counselors in the bar, uh, in the LGU, uh, headed by Muslim, uh, in a place where densely populated by Muslims, uh, and even in the NCMF, and, and also in, I believe, in the Sharia courts. Uh, in the NCMF, if you read the uh, mandate of the Bureau of Legal Affairs, it says there uh, in part that uh, uh, the Bureau of Legal Affairs shall provide legal assistance to Muslim Filipinos in case of litigation involving the persons of interest. And this does not distinguish whether that court or, or that litigation is in a Sharia court or in a regular court. So uh, there is no plantilla position for Sharia counselor in the NCMF as well as in the bar, I believe. Uh, now, my, my second question is about Republic Act 11596, the early child, child marriage law. Uh, my question is, is that, is RA 11596 a general law? If the answer is, is yes, is it correct to say that PD 1083 being a special law has not been repealed considering that a general law cannot repeal a special law and considering father that the Supreme Court looks with disfavor implied repeal as exemplified in the case of the United Harbor Poor po Pilots Association of the Philippines where the High Court said a repeal by implication is frowned upon in this jurisdiction. It is not favored because the legislative authority is presumed to know the existing laws so that if repeal is intended, the proper step is to express it. 
in its repeating clause. Okay. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Because the two questions are I, I consistently been reminding everyone to limit, please your limit your questions to just one, no, and then one follow up. Uh, but uh, in any case, so we have those two that have been presented. But the first one, I think, is not uh, has not been covered, unfortunately, no, because it was asking about the career path. Uh, how about the second question? Maybe some of our panelists uh, would like to comment. Um, you know, I'm mentioning Attorney Muhammad. So for, for the first question, I think there is in the BOL law, uh, yung na mentioned ko kanina, that uh, there are even public attorney's office for the bar, uh, the prosecutor's office for the bar, uh, and uh, sinabi kanina, uh, sorry, wala dito ngayon si MPLI, sinabi niya is, ano pa kasi sila? Uh, they have priority legislation na kailangan na ipas. And uh, in the pipeline na, uh, in the informal talk when I asked her about this one. As to the second question, si Dean, in fact, meron kaming uh, lengthy discussion about that and he has an answer to that question. Meron siyang write-up tungkol dyan. Actually, Judge Jamil could have answered the question uh, as well. Uh, first of all, no? The anti-child marriage law, for those of you who are regular lawyers, is a special penal law. Okay. But it complies with the principle of generality under, uh, under criminal law. And in fact, if you look at the repelling clause of the anti-child marriage law, it covers all laws, even decrees, including presidential decree number 1053, as it effectively uh, repels. Are Muslims covered by the anti-child marriage law? The answer would be yes. In fact, the substantive, pertinent substantive provision of the law gives the Muslims a grace period of one year, within which to solemnize marriages that may not be compliant with the uh, provisions of the anti-child marriage law. So if your question is, has the anti-child marriage law effectively repel the pertinent provisions of the Muslim code, my answer would be, Yes. And in fact, I have a one-hour discussion on that one, which you can find in Facebook. Strongly criticizing the anti-child marriage law as an erroneous law in so far as the Muslims are concerned. But what is our remedy? Our remedy is legislative. Yes. That we convince the Congress of the Philippines to make rooms for exceptions for Muslim marriages because we already have the Code of Muslim Personal Laws of the Philippines. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Okay, so in the interest uh, of way, time, because we uh, are... Excuse me. Ah, yes, Speaking yes. of remedy, pwede din yan i-question sa Supreme Court. I-question ng constitutionality or validity ng that portions of the anti-child marriage law. Thank you very much. Hindi ko siya nasabing question ni Nino, ha? I'm just, talk, I'm just saying that there is such a remedy. <laughs> Thank you very much. So in the interest of time, since uh, we do have a uh, limited uh, uh, time for this, we will now move to the next. So can we have the lady, uh, you have the floor, ma'am. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Ujjay Ahmad from the College of Law. Western Mindanao, Zamboanga City. President of the P Philippine Sharia Lawyers Incorporated, Zambasulta Chapter. President of the Association of the Sharia. Counselor at Law of the Philippine Zamboanga Chapter. And the Vice President of the Philippine Sharia Lawyers Incorporated National. My question, uh, I hope I'm still within the condition uh, required by the moderator, wherein we are to ask only one question and one follow-up. Yes, ma'am. Please Now, go my ahead. question is in relation to my former student, at Attorney Abdelaziz, but iba lang yung pagka-present ko at mayroon din ibang uh, nakasama do doon. And besides... Uh, I am still within the condition because I have I am asking another yes, question. Yes, ma'am. Please, okay. please okay. go ahead. Oh, although with your they are rel rel related, okay. Go ahead with your question. Now, ma my question is on the jurisdiction of the 
uh, jurisdiction over the, the person of the parties to the case, jurisdiction over uh, the subject matter, and jurisdiction of the court to take cognizance of the case. Now, my question is supposed to be addressed to the MP and, Ator and Bago Attorney General, Attorney Shia Elijah okay. Alba. Now that since she's not around, Judge Mamutok, Mamuto. Mamut and of course, uh, even I have a question addressed to the MP uh, and the Bago Attorney General, I still have also at the same time a question which is considered as my follow-up question addressed to Judge Mamuto. Okay, ma'am. Please okay. proceed to your question okay. now, ma'am. Now, my question is this. A non-Muslim female married a Muslim male, but prior to the, ma the, to the solemnization of their marriage, the former, the non-Muslim female, embraces Islam and register her conversion in the Sharia court. After their marriage, she turns into apostate, and then years, uh, uh, years later, rather, she turns into ap apostate. After several months from her turning into apostate, the same committed adultery, Lian. Her husband filed a petition for divorce by Lian, and in his prayer, in his petition, permanent custody of their minor children uh, shall be granted to him, believing that a non-Muslim spouse loses her right to take custody of their minor children. Uh, Ma, Atone, uh, can I please interrupt? Uh, I just have a question. Is that a case pending before the Sharia District Court of Sambuanga? No, Judge. This is I, I made this scenario only inspired by, by a case. By that case. That already, that already because uh, please, please, uh, please do not ask us questions referring to cases actually pending no. before our no, course. Because no judge. we this are is. judges. We are judges. Uh -oh. and, I am just I am just making okay, a so scenario. With that, uh, declaration, ma'am, it's okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. And, and again, I was just remind me to answer the question and then judge because he's the acting presiding judge of SGC in Zamboanga, told me perhaps this is an actual case and then you would no, want no, no. to uh, so uh, 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 no. Out Thank of you. respect to Judge Mack. Thank you. And ma'am, can we, can we wrap up and proceed directly yeah, yeah, to, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. to the I, question, ma'am? Because we, do, we don't Permanent have much Permanent custody time. of their minor children shall be granted to him, believing that a non-Muslim spouse loses a right to take custody of their minor children. And since their marriage is in accordance with the with the Islamic rights, in the Sorry, ma'am, I have to cut you. What is the, can you go directly to the question, po? Or if, if, if it requires more lengthy... I, I think I understand the question. Okay. She just wanted to ask, what law governs? Uh, if tamang pagkakaintindi ko, una, non-Muslim. Okay. Tapos, bago nagpakasal, pinaregister, nagpa-convert siya. So, nagpakasal sila under Muslim code. Yun yung tatandaan natin. So, since nagpakasal sila under Muslim code, at the time of the marriage, what law governs? Okay. She's a Muslim. Ganun po ba yung question? So, ba, kasi, sir, may I interrupt? Apo. Uh, kasi yung what has been <laughs> delivered by MP uh, Elijah, mm -hmm. uh, it, this is about the submission Kasi yung, yung non-Muslim earlier, nag-convert and then nag-apostate, tapos nag-file nag ng kaso ang husband dahil apo, uh, ano na siya, naglian. Now, she does not like to submit that he will be uh, tried or heard in the Sharia court. Ayaw niya mag-submit. So, ang buong alam ko, ang, the way I understand that, pag, uh, pwede lang mag-take ano, jurisdiction ang court pagka mag-submit. What if hindi? Narinig ko rin kay uh, Judge ah, Mamutok, okay. pwede sa RTC. Pwede ba i-contest ng petitioner na uh, our marriage is in accordance with the Muslim rights? So, okay. bala, bala, wala doon ang RTC. So, where shall, my, uh, where shall the petitioner go? Thank Ayaw mag-submit ng ano. The, the, the respondent doesn't want to submit 
their self for the Okay po ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Judge, do you have a response? All right. Uh, I remember last Saturday, Dean Mac, ito yung pinag-uusapan natin, that provision na nakalagay sa Section 5 and Section 6, and uh, it might bring many cases at sana po ma-elevate natin, magkaroon tayo ng case and uh, kung sino yung agreed party, iakyat natin ito sa Supreme Court. Para naiintindihan ng lahat, nakalagay kasi sa Section 5, Section 6, Okay. The jurisdiction is exclusive to SDC, pero merong provided eh. Provided the non-Muslims submit to the jurisdiction. Kaya nagkakaroon ng problema at yun yung tanong sa atin. Provided submit, what if hindi siya mag-submit? Alright. So, ang final na makakapagsabi niyan, it's the Supreme Court. But my personal opinion, based on our jurisprudence, since sa simula pa lang, and we have uh, jurisprudence, and sabi niya, what will apply is your personal, Muslim personal laws. And remember, wherever we go, our personal laws follows us. Okay, at then sinabi nun, yung pag-apostate niya, at the time of the marriage yung titingnan. It's not at the time. Very clear yun dun sa Malaki case. This is in Malaki case. Pag, uh, sabi niya sa Bundaji versus Bundaji. Sabi niya, at the time of the marriage at not at the time of the filing of the suit. But again, this is a matter na pwedeng sana magkaroon ng kaso ma-elevate natin because even me, I understand na it's only the Supreme Court ang final na makapagsabi but based on the jurisprudence that we have, then pwedeng ano, uh, wa, sa SDC po kayo pupunta. Si Dean, meron siyang idadagdag. Uh, si Dean Barodi. Uh, the, the questioner is an academic. May I also respond as an academic? Not in my official capacity as member of Philja, not as a lecturer, but as an academic. Uh, I agree with your inclination. The fact that the marriage was solemnized in accordance with Muslim law puts that marriage within the jurisdiction of Sharia courts under the Bangsamor Organic Law. In our remedial law, there are several kinds of jurisdiction. Subject matter jurisdiction or jurisdiction over the person of a particular litigant. Muslim marriage is within the jurisdiction of a Sharia court under the BUL. So therefore, it is within the subject matter jurisdiction of our Sharia courts. The act of that person in having his or her marriage solemnized in accordance with Muslim law puts or considers that marriage as a Muslim marriage. And so therefore, for me as, a, as an academic, it is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the Sharia court and therefore, the non-Muslim has voluntarily submitted to the jurisdiction of the Sharia court. Yan po ang sagot ko dyan, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very maraming, much, Judge. Maraming maraming salamat po. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, I have to be the bad guy here and uh, I have to put a stop to our Q&A because we uh, we already have reached no, the supposed end period. Uh, for those who still have questions, the speakers will be available. So if you, if you want to be able to engage with them, I hope our gentlemen will be open to still engaging with you. But otherwise, if you really want to write something and uh, submit it on record, please do so. No, We do have a drop box outside so that we can still uh, note your, uh, your, your questions. It's and just a concerns. point of clarification, a very, very, very short question. I'm, I'm so, Judge, I'm sorry. Judge uh, Haji Rasul, with regards sorry. to uh, notice of, uh, is a notice of, uh, what is this? Notice, uh, uh, is I'm allowed, uh, Judge Rasul, uh, Judge Mamatak? Sir, sorry. Uh, is Judge uh, notice of, uh, first notice of uh, subsequent marriage? First subsequent marriage. So, sorry, the, the time for uh, you this can, we will you can talk to Judge Hajira soon. This is very important. Time. This is very so important. At Please. this point, we uh, we would like to recognize the deputy speaker of the Bangsamoro Transition Authority Parliament, uh, MP Abdul Karim Miswari, who would like to give uh, a short statement. So, sir, if you are, if you can take the microphone. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Thumma amma ba'd, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa salamu. Una sa lahat, gusto lang namin magpasalamat sa lahat ng organized ng first sharia 
summit kasi it's a historic at napaka-importanteng bagay to para sa atin bansa. Pero uh, may mga issues na banggit kahapon. Of course, with all due respect sa lahat, uh, pero may mga nabanggit kahapon, uh, siguro kailangan siya bigyan ng konting comment. Uh, may mga issues na banggit kahapon, hindi siya related sa summit about Sharia. Pero uh, I have to clarify yung mga some of the statements. Isa, yung treaty between Al-Hasan radiyallahu anhu at Muawiyah. Actually, yung treaty between Al-Hasan at Muawiyah radiyallahu anhu ang napagkasunduan after after ni Muawiyah radiyallahu anhu yung system of choosing a head of a state babalik siya sa syura. Hindi yun napag-usapan na after ni Muawiyah ang maging khalifa is si Al-Hussein radiyallahu anhu yung namatay siya sa Karbala. Yun isa. So, issue of succession yun. Uh, pangalawa, may mga issues na banggit tungkol sa child marriage. Sa Islam, mayroon yung tinatawag yung uh, Al-Qawaid al-Islami al-Kubra, Al-Qawaid al-Fakhi al-Kubra, major principles of fiqh. Nabanggit doon kahapon yung issue ng child marriage pagkatapos nabanggit ang darurat o yung al-masyakka, kahit at al-masyakka, tajlibut taysir. First of all, pag-usapan natin ang child marriage. Anong ibig sabihin ng child at marriage? Sa Islam, we have to define two things. Yung kontrata, yung aqd, aqdun nikah, pangalawa, at duhul, consummation ng marriage. Ang aqd, kontrata, Pwede yung underage mag-contract. Ang mag-contract on behalf is yung wali. Pero hindi pwede mag-consume ang marriage na yon at a younger age. Until maabot na siya sa edad na siya ay baliga. Five, na ang babae kapag siya ay baliga, pwede ba ang babae mag-refuse? Siyempre, Pwede siya mag-refuse. Ayaw niya yung marriage na yun. Sa Islam, hindi mo pwede i-impose sa babae mag-husband siya sa isang lalaki ayaw niya. Within the contract o kahit na-consume na ang marriage. Third thing, child marriage, ibig sabihin yung consummation ng marriage at a child age. Hindi pa siya adult. Hindi yan pwede sa Islam. So, kailan ang babae maging adult o pwede mag-consume mag na ang marriage? Sinong magsabi yun? Sabi ng Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sa bandal na Quran, Ba'da'udhu billahi minas shaytanir rajim, Fas'alu ahla dhikrin, kuntum la ta'alamun. Magtanong kayo sa maalamin sa isyo kung hindi nyo alam. So, sa isyo ng babae, pwede siya. Kailan siya pwede mag-consume ng medyo o yung tinatawag sa lugar arabiya, itaqatul wak, medicine. Yung doktor, siyang magsabi, this, uh, this uh, woman can be a wife. Kung sinabi ng medicine, hindi pwede, hindi pwede. Another thing, para hindi natin ba, ayaw ko yung parang sinasabi na sa sharia as if pinapakita nila ang Islam at yung sharia parang uh, ano ba? Inaano talaga yung mga yang? Hindi. At yung issue ng zawaj o yung akdun nikah at sa eh, sa edad ng 15 years old yung bago pa yung babae naging adult hindi siya wajib hindi big sabihin kapag ang babae naging adult na o dapat na mag magkaroon ng husband mubah siya ang mana ng mubah permissible pero mayroon sa sharia yung tinawag tinatawag uh, uh, sa isang usul ng sharia yung tinatawag uh, al-masalih al, al al-mursala ang masalih al-mursala hindi lang yung 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 basihan ng sharia Quran sunna ijma qiyas hindi the wider part sa sharia is nandoon sa al-masalih al-mursala ang masalih al-mursala yan pag-usapan ng mga uh, specialized scholar in the field anong issue na ito ikabuti o hindi 
Kasi ang madar ng Islam sa masalih at mafasid. So again, so yung sinasabi nila, alimbawa, uh, practices alimbawa sa labas, like nabanggit kahapon sa Pakistan o sa, sa Egypt o sa ibang lugar, kin kinakasal nilang babae at a very, very young age, kailangan po natin i-differentiate ang two issues. What is sharia and what is urf, tradition, custom ng mga tao sa lugar na yun. We should not mix. Totoo, sa sharia, yung, yung five basic principles ng sharia, yung panglima, yung tinatawag al-urf. Totoo yun. Pero kailan yun pwede mo gawin ang urf na yung basihan kapag hindi siya mag-contradict with the sharia. Kailan siya hindi mag-contradict. So, yung mga masamang practices sa marriage sa Pakistan, sa India, sa, sa, sa Egypt, sa Saudi, o kahit saan, kung mayroon dito sa atin, hindi yan pwede isabi natin kasalanan yan ng sharia. It's the custom. Bakit? At ito na lang, basahin ko na lang siya in English para mas, uh, kasi paumanhin, Arabic ang education ko. So, tingnan nyo. Yung pina, ipang limang uh, uh, principle, the principle of custom, uh, kaidat al-adat, o ay yung al-urf. Sabi niya, states that the custom or precedent is a legal ruling and is a source of law unless contradict, contradicts, especially the text, yung mag-contradict siya mismo ng sharia at uh, Uh, sunnah ng Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Uh, MP cars, uh, if we can. Uh, call, okay, uh, I will. Uh, thank uh, you ano? very much. Yeah. Anyway, marami pang gusto ko sana isabi pero nagcomment lang ako at may recommendation lang po three. Yes sir, please wrap Based up. po sa uh, na experience natin kahapon, ito po yung napansin ko. Uh, we notice that there are no sh uh, Sharia, Sharia scholars specialized in the field of Sharia habang ang pinag-uusapan is Sharia. Ang suggestion namin po, insya Allah, sa next summit po natin, dapat magkaroon tayo ng mga ulama sa Sharia, certified, upang kung may mga issues, i-address, i-address to the proper personalities. Baka may magtanong, saan natin mahanap ang mga tao yan? Ang suggest ko, pwede tayo magpunta sa Darul Ifta ng Barm isa, or magpunta tayo sa Darul Ifta Region 9 and Palawan sa Sambuanga. Pangalawa, uh, dahil nabanggit kahapon issues from Sira at issues from the history of Islam and Bangsamoro, kailangan po natin na again, mayroon mga ulama specialized sa field ng history at Sira ng Propeta Muhammad SAW to address par upang hindi natin na maano yung mga some of the hindi accurate. Pangatlo, kung pag-usapan natin ang di, anong pagkaibahan ng Shia o yung mga sect ng Islam, kailangan po dati likewise mayroon certified alim tungkol sa issue na. Kasi kahapon nabanggit isa, last, I will end with this, ang pagkaibahan ng Sunni at Shia. Sabi na ang Shia, uh, mayroon din silang mga authentic books. Actually, ang Shia nagsasabi, they only have one book that is authentic, which is Quran. Pangalawa, Uh, nabanggit kahapon na is yung imam, siya ang representative ng uh, uh, Mahdi. Actually, sa imamiya, that is a bid'ah. That is innovation. Yun ang tinatawag wilayatul faqih at yung nagbigay ng idea is si Imam Khomeini. Pero hindi mo yan matagpuan sa old tradition ng imamiya. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakat. Thank you very much and thank you very much to everybody for a very lively discussion this morning. And we are concluding our... Okay, thank you very much uh, for our lively discussions this morning. And that concludes our morning session. And everybody is in, uh, uh, invited for our lunch. But before that, we, may, we call on our Muadzin to call the prayer. Thank you so much.
Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Ashhadu an la أشهد أن محمد رسول الله. أشهد أن
the afternoon and some announcements, please. For those who want to pray, we encourage everyone to bring their prayer mats and proceed to the proper prayer area. For the male, we have the look the area in front of the stage, and for the female, please proceed to the amethyst function room. The prayer will begin at 12:25 p.m. Again, the prayer will begin at 12:25 p.m. Please bring your prayer mats and proceed to the proper prayer area. Aside from this, for those who are um, bound to check out from their hotel rooms at Lox Hotel, please do check out from your rooms and leave your luggage at the luggage storage of the hotel. Thank you. For those who are bound to check out today, March 6, please do check out from the hotel and leave your luggage at the luggage storage. Thank you.
الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله حقا لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله استولي الصلاة ولا تختلف وثابا يثابكم الله
أحسنتك يا حبيبي في خيالي ولم أرسم سواك بلوح بالي جعلتك قبلتي محراب روحي بقلبي في الهجير وفي الظلال وحقك إن وجدي فيك وجدي وحالي وحالي لم يزال بهواك حالي ولع البدر 
شمس الهداية قد زدت نورا في الحب آية تروي سرورا شمس الهداية قد زدت نورا في الحب آية تروي سرورا اللهم صل على سيدنا المصطفى بدر الكمال تنير دربي أصل الجمال محبوب ربي بدر الكمال تنير دربي أصل الجمال محبوب ربي اللهم صل على سيدنا المصطفى والآل أهل العلا
مهما توارت فينا الحياة مهما ضاع الزهر وندى يضيء النور الحياة السنة ويبقى الفؤاد ينادي يا الله آمنت بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله واليوم الاخر والقدر خيره وشره من الله والبعث بعد الموت لا اله الا لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك إن الحمد والنعمة لك والملك لا شريك لك لبيك إن الحمد والنعمة لك والملك لا شريك لك لبيك One sky with peace One sea with love 
تمتد منك لتحيي كل أجزائي لي منك أحلام روح جمع عقرها وكم قدرت بعطف قد مددت يدي بالذل مبتهلا إليك يا خير من مدت إليه يد وقد مددت يدي بالذل مبتهلا إليك يا خير من مدت إليه يد
بسط يدي بل لي أدوذ به إلاك يا سلامي مولاي يا مولاي مولاي إني ببابك قد بسط يدي بل لي أدوذ به Don't give up for what happened to you. Allah knows what hurts those who belong to Him. After rainy day, the sun will shine. After Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. Honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, may I request you to now go back to your tables and occupy your assigned seats. We are about to start and resume with our program. Once more, honored guests, excellencies, and ladies and gentlemen, may we request that you now go back to your tables and occupy your assigned seats. We are about to resume with our program. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to acknowledge the presence of the Honorable Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Alexander Dismundo, and Associate Justice Jose Maidas Marquez of the Supreme Court. We would also like to acknowledge the presence of His Excellency, the Ambassador of Egypt to the Philippines, Ambassador Ahmed Shehabeldin Ibrahim Abdullah. Welcome, sir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Good afternoon, magandang hapon po, and welcome back to our second day of the first National Summit on Sharia. We are now ready to resume with our program. We hope everyone had a replenishing and refreshing lunch. And now, uh, it is our honor to introduce uh, the last part of our summit, which is in our program labeled Best Practices on Sharia in Foreign Jurisdictions. So at this point, we, will be, uh, we are privileged to be able to hear from brothers and sisters from different parts of the world regarding best practices on Sharia in foreign jurisdictions. We are joined today by Egyptian Ambassador to the Philippines, Mr. Ahmed Shahabedin Ibrahim Abdullah. He will be speaking in his private capacity as a lawyer. Yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, without much ado, I would like now to give the floor and call our first presenter for this afternoon, Ahmed Shahabedin Ibrahim Abdullah. Let me read his brief bio. Ahmed is a, an Egyptian lawyer and diplomat born in Cairo in 1968. He studied law at Cairo University where he, where he obtained his LLB and holds an advanced LLM at Leiden University, the Netherlands. He participated in many conferences and events on the harmonization and unification of legal instruments and practices and also has published articles in journals and newspapers on the legal impact of certain public policy decisions and practices, including Islamic finance and the characterization of transactions. Ahmed, as we mentioned, is currently the ambassador of Egypt to the Philippines and was also senior deputy assistant foreign minister in the international legal affairs and treaties in Egypt. Although we are very privileged to have him this afternoon, uh, and he is here joining us in his uh, capacity as a lawyer and subject matter expert, so, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome again our first presenter, Mr. Ahmed Shehabildin. Assalamu alaikum. Um, it gives me a great honor to speak today. First of all, just I would like to thank his, um, his honor, Honorable Chief Justice and the Working Group on organizing the first Sharia Summit for inviting me to speak before such distinguished and eminent group of people to present the experience of Egypt in applying Sharia laws. It's undeniably recognized that laws and their, their application respond to many factors of which the need for improving the means of addressing the social and, e and economic issues, reflecting the cultural and traditions of a society and the political environment. As far as the application of Sharia laws in Egypt, since the advent of Islam to Egypt 1400 years ago, there have been various types of judicial, quasi-judicial and customary tribunals applying Sharia laws. And I'll demonstrate in the timeline shortly. 
Similarly, Sharia as applicable law has been subject to changes due to, to political and social climates. First, I'll start with the chronology of institutional development. Next, please. So, as from the year 641, 20 after Hijra, Egypt became part of the Islamic State and Islamic law became applicable to all residents replacing Roman law. The caliph was the one who appointed the judge from people of knowledge and diligence. Then, Viceroy the Wali had been authorized to do so later. Over time, and with the political developments affected Egypt on the one hand, and the emergence of different schools of thoughts, or doctrines, judges were assigned and apply the prevailing doctrine to some extent. But other schools of thoughts remained followed by the people and reality and the led that existed. So that we can see here, just it was until the year 1522, four Sharia courts representing the four schools of thoughts. However, just uh, I have to mention that Imam al-Shafi himself was buried in Egypt. When the Ottoman captured Egypt and became ruling the, uh, uh, Egypt, the Ottomans first announced that Hanafi school of thought as the official reference and appointed a chief justice to preside over the aforementioned four justices. After a short time, they abolished the four judges system and appointed only one judge of their choice who appointed their de his deputies. Therefore, Egyptians eventually re resorted to al-Azhar imams and even after the chief, that chief justice called Askar judge appointed Egyptian justice, this was undoubtedly just customary litigation parallel to the official judiciary. Napoleon Bonaparte came to Egypt with the, uh, what, what, what they called it, it was a campaign, a military campaign, I cannot give it uh, some other name, in 1798. The French commander took measures to limit the scope of work and authority of Sharia courts. And to that extent, he established the Council of Suits, composed of 12 judges, six of which Muslims and six were Christian Scots. Minu, his successor, he also uh, uh, went to that extent and he followed, uh, followed this by establishing courts of the sex, all sex, like courts for Armenians, Levantines and Jews and Christian Copts. As a result, Sharia court was made optional of those uh, uh, of these sects who uh, wanted to resort to it, a situation that limited its jurisdiction and scope. Egypt under Mus Muhammad Ali, as of the, uh, after the, the, uh, the French left, they started to witness uh, a series of amendments uh, of legislations uh, regulating the judiciary in a modern fashion. It's true that the judiciary system has not been sophisticated and witnessed irregularities on both structural and uh, practical levels, but it's equally true that without such initiatives of Muhammad Ali and his successors, there wouldn't have been a solid foundation to build upon. In this regard, it's worth mentioning that in 1849, In 1849, the first supreme body was established, always referred to with the Judgment Council. Such council was a judicial tribunal composed of nine members and one Hanafi scholar and one Shafi'i scholar, mandated for determining major cases, while minor cases were left to Sharia courts. Later, in 1852, five provincial councils alike 
were established to cover the whole country. Next. So we can say that we, 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 we remain that the judiciary regarding Sharia courts were not settled definitely even with the enactment of uh, uh, some, some laws. But after World War I and the termination of the Ottoman ruling over Egypt, modernization of judicial system has been central and bold. As of the year 1923, the Egyptian constitution passed with a clear provision on the independence of judges as follows. Judges are independent and there is no authority over them in their rulings other than the law and there is no authority in the government to interfere in cases. In 1931, the establishment of the course uh, of cassation has synchronized the introduction of detailed rules regulating litigation before Sharia courts by virtue of law number 78 of 1931. The said law has been relatively advanced and covered all procedural aspects of Sharia courts system which were structurally composed of the Supreme Court, Supreme Sharia Court located in Cairo, course of first instance in eight major cities with the possibility of establishing summary courts where under each first instance course according to prescribed legal measures. Further, such law defined geographical and substantive jurisdiction as well as rules of procedure, proof and enforcement in very detailed manner. Actually, the said law was introduced in 370 articles under six book titles. Sharia courts under that system had jurisdiction in matters related to the family law, inheritance, endowment. In 1955, as we see here, the system of Sharia courts and sectarian council were abolished by virtue of law number 442 of the year 1955. And as of the 1st of January, all the cases were submitted, transferred, and the judges transferred to the ordinary, uh, uh, ordinary court system. Throughout the decades followed, there were efforts to facilitate litigation in matters of personal status and family. In, 2000, in, in the year 2000, a law was promulgated for organizing certain conditional procedure of litigation in matters of personal status. All previous pr procedural laws were abrogated and only the Code of Civil and Commercial Procedure as well as the proof law and the provisions of civil code dealing with the administration and liquidation of successions shall apply whenever no provision is provided by the law. In 2004, family law, family, family court system has been reintroduced or introduced to the system, the legal system. So this is the about the institution development and how how the judiciary uh, was organized in, in in Egypt up till now. So next, please. Now we come to the impact of. Islamic Sharia on subject, subject, uh, substantive laws. As of the second half of the 19th century, there were relentless, relentless efforts to codify Sharia laws and introduce them to the Egyptian legal system, which had been mainly influenced by the French legal system intellectually and structurally. The most prominent efforts were made by Qadri Pasha, the Minister of Justice then, who has introduced by the end of the 19th century the first codification of Sharia laws regarding family law on the basis of the Hanafi doctrine. The Qadri Code, as they refer to, consisted of 600 provisions, but was never promulgated and never acquired binding legal force. However, 
It resulted in a concise and accessible code account of the Hanafi doctrine and became a standard manual for the judges of the Sharia course who did not have to look for legal provisions in multiple medieval treaties and commentaries anymore. The code was also taught at the university. So here we have, we have here just, I would like to, to mention that all this uh, all these efforts has have not resulted in any uh, um, material that we ca we can follow to be uh, to be in, on solid grounds. But anyway, so just we move to the following parts. As so, it's. Um, I'm very sorry, so it's, uh, 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 I, mix, I mixed up something, so just give me one minute, please. So uh, again, so that up till the year 19, 1948, with the introduction of the civil code, there hasn't been so body of law that reflect Sharia entirely. But the introduction of the, the, the 1948 uh, uh, was just a new, a new, a new um, device to help the, uh, the judiciary and to help the, um, the application of Sharia and for the society to understand exactly. Because even between 1920 and 1929, codifications of personal status that took place, and they, they regulated some matters regarding the woman. For example, the woman can initiate divorce to include that to include harm, a failure to provide uh, a maintenance to be one of the grounds, absence of the husband, another uh, ground for divorce, condemnation of the husband to jail. Another one, and serious and incurable defect or disease. These laws also organize women's maintenance and Europe. But again, so with the completion of the civil code, so we would see that it, there, there was some body of law, a, a complete as much as possible. To date, the civil code is the law applicable in matters of per personal status, and especially Articles 29 to 51, and inheritance, Articles and, and er, Article 875, and the will, the succession by will, so that in nine, 915. The two laws of 1920 uh, and 1921 have continued to regulate family matters, though they uh, were amended in 1985 by, and so far the law, that's latter uh, law of 1985, allowed divorced women to get a financial compensation muta to keep material uh, marital home until the end of ch children custody and requested that the first wife has to be informed officially of the new marriage of her husband and allowed husbands to stop spending on their wives if they violate their duty of ob obedience. While the said law of 1985 extended female children custody by, by the mother until 12 for the girls and 10 for the boys, her custody was ex again extended to the age of 15 for both boys and girls, and, and girls may choose to stay with mothers till their marriage without maintenance. Now just we are coming to some tricky point regarding the, 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 the treatment of non-Muslims under the Egyptian law. The question might be raised as non-Muslims under the Egyptian legal system, and the Egyptian legal system recognizes 12 Christian groups under, the, under three major classifications. 
Orthodox, which includes the four denominations, Coptic, Greek, Armenian, and Syrian, Catholic, which includes seven denominations, Coptic, Greek, Armenian, Syrian, Maronite, uh, Chaldean, Chaldean, Latin. Protestant, all Protestants are considered as belonging to the same community. As for the Jews, we historically had Jews in, in the Egyptian uh, society. We have two uh, communities being recognized, uh, Karatic and Rab uh, Rabbinic. So I'm very sorry because that we are not familiar because of the, the community of the, the, the Jewish community is being limited so that it's not frequently being used. But it's there. Non-Muslim have always maintained their own religious legislation in matters of marriage and divorce and enjoy independence in legislating their own laws in this field. However, good. However, we have to, do, to, 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 to take into consideration that the non-Muslim communities that are not recognized officially are governed by family law for Muslims, the general rule, which is considered as the general rule and the basic legislation in Egypt. If one of the litigants, if one of the litigants is Muslim, the personal status for Muslims also applies at the marriage to the marriage and to its effects. So you know that, uh, that uh, Muslim women may not get married to non-Muslims. So here we have to, 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 to understand the, the philosophy of, uh, of that so that we are giving, we, the, the Egyptian legal system is giving the liberty in, in, in matters relevant to family and uh, divorce to, uh, to, to, to the churches, different churches. So it's, um, we, we consider this is part of the, the freedom of religion and the human rights code also of Egypt as much. Here we turn to some other uh, uh, questions, because it, I don't want to get into details regarding the non-Muslim uh, legislation, because it, they are just, if the two, the, the, the two spouses are, they belong to the same church, the same community, the same denomination, they're applicable law. They have, you have, for, for example, we have the regulation of 1938 of the, the Orthodox Church apply, applies to them. Same with the Catholic. Uh, apostolic law is the, 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 the latest one it was uh, in 1990 for the uh, Orient uh, the Oriental uh, Catholics and we have also some applicable laws for the <coughs> for the other for the other uh, the other communities but also if the two spouses do not belong to the same community same denomination, so again, so that the, 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 the general rule, the general law applies to them, which is considered to be Muslim. We have, okay, I'd like to get rid of this. So we come to some People may ask what, what would be the definition of Sharia, because it in, in, we haven't had this question for a long time because the application, it was by the courts and uh, it was understood that the Hanafi doctrine was the, the prevailing one. I have to tell, to tell you that this question was not there until 1971. Next, please. 
It was 1961, uh, 1971, and 1971, it was the first introduction of a clause or article number two in the Constitution as it, it reads, the principles of Islamic law are main sources of legislation. And this has been a source of debate um, on the supremacy of Sharia over other sources. And the 1980, there was an amendment in 1980, and such amendment made things even more complicated. Why? Because that the amendment said that the principles of Islamic uh, law are the main source of legislation. A provision that led to a greater number of interpretations with a greater scope of polarization between liberals and groups claiming that they, have def they, are, they are defending Islam. And also between Al-Azhar being the official representative of Islamists and other factions claiming representation of Islamic interests. In 1985, the Supreme Constitutional Court established in 1979 examined a number of questions among which first next please the first what does islamic sharia mean in such context and what are its sources and who would decide what's islamic sharia under the egyptian legal system as for the second question, the Constitutional Court interpreted Islamic Sharia itself without deferring to a religious entity. For the purpose of responding to the meaning of Islamic Sharia, the court defined the principles of Islamic Sharia as those provisions in Quran and Hadith with definite source, definite meaning. Many subsequent rulings interpreted this article have consolidated such version of adherence to Islamic Sharia. For example, in 1994, the Supreme, Supreme Constitutional Court also made a distinction between two types of principles of Islamic Sharia and clearly stated that those, provision, those provisions in Quran and Hadith with definite source, definite meaning, represent uncontestable norms that must necessarily be applied. It follows that such norms may not be subject to interpretive reasoning and may not evolve with time and admit no interpretation and no modification. Otherwise, it shall be unconstitutional. On the contrary, the court identified a group of relative rules either with regard to their origin or to their significance or with regard to both at the same time and stated that they may evolve in time and space are dynamic in nature give rise to different interpretations in other words they are adaptable to the changing needs in the society it's therefore left to the legislator to interpret and establish norms related to such rules. It might be pertinent to highlight that interpretations of the Supreme Constitutional Court have contributed to provide foundation to be relied upon by legislators and courts. As a result, the preamble of the 2014 Constitution contained an explicit affirmation that the principles of Islamic Sharia are the principal source of legislation and the reference for the interpretation of such principles lies in the bodies of the relevant Supreme Court rulings. Further, it became a standard to be followed where legal provisions are challenged for being unconstitutional. To say that, so to clarify about the role, uh, the, 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 the role of the um, decisions made by the Constitution Court, in Article 
Article 195 of the, uh, the Constitution of 2014, it reads this article, the judgments and decisions issued by the Supreme Constitutional Court shall be published in the official gazette, and they shall be binding upon everyone and all of the state authorities. They shall have res judicata vis-a-vis -vis all of them. Other courts have been actively playing important roles in clarifying legal provisions in line with Islamic Sharia were appropriate. In a number of cases, the Court of Cassation relied on doctrines other than the Hanafi doctrine, and it relied on the Maliki doctrine to give a quite wide definition of the prejudice a woman can invoke to get a divorce, as it stated that prejudice can, uh, can, or can be occurred through words or acts that the custom considers, considers it a harm. And the wife should institute a complaint and affirming her inability to bear it anymore. Also, the court stated that it's sufficient that prejudice occurs once. No need for repetition of the, the act or the words, but only once would be enough. Finally, where the applicable laws to a case are silent regarding any specific matter and no reference could be found on that particular point, the judge shall follow the most authoritative opinion within the Hanafi doctrine. Nevertheless, the judge may also stay the proceedings. Uh, where he or she disagrees with the content of an existing legal provision and raise a plea of unconstitutionality to the Supreme uh, Constitutional Court just to, to have like preliminary question and the, the, the answer and then the, uh, they get back to the uh, competent court again. So this is in general what we have regarding the interpretation by the Constitutional Court and the other courts, how they, they act. Now we come to the constitutional rights-based approach. As we see that starting from 1971, the, uh, the, constitutional, the Constitution started to show the Sharia law, but by the, in, in, by the year 2014, a new constitution has passed by referendum. One of the new constitution developments uh, were, was the incorporation of a new article on the role of principles of Christian Sharia and Jewish Sharia in relation to personal status, family law, and other ma matters relevant to their religious affairs. Article 3 of the 2014 constitution reads, the principles of Christian and Jewish Sharia of Egyptian Christians and Jews are the main source of legislation that regulate their respective personal status, religious affairs, and selection of spiritual leaders. I hope that I'm not taking a long time. I don't want to lose the audience, otherwise it would be haram. Anyway, so the incorporation of the said article can be just considered a confirmation of the long-established regulation and practice that as for personal status and other religion-related uh, religion uh, uh, matters, non-Muslims are subjected to their own Sharia. Finally, such, it made it clear that applying sh Christian Sharia and, uh, and Jewish Sharia on Christian Jews, respectively, is undoubtedly in compliance with Islamic Sharia. So that uh, this is one of the commentators. He used to be the the, the uh, vice chairman or the, the the deputy chief justice of the Constitutional Court. He's making a reference to uh, uh, Surah Al Maida, so the uh, 46 and 47, as it's it's there that the. Um, here in 40, uh, 47, so let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed in it. 
and those who do not judge by what Allah has revealed are truly the rebellious. So it means that, okay, that this making it rational so that there is an understanding that this would go just with Allah, the, 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 the verses of Allah in Quran. But there would be some, of course, there would be just some issues that according to the application of Sharia and especially with the, it's being the main source of, uh, of legislation in the country. So the Court of Cassation made for the public order, next please. The Court of Cassation has adopted the definition of public order affirming its overarching nature without making reference to any specific base. In this context, it suffices to be considered within the public order any value or principle whether or not finds its foundation in any religion or acceptable practice of the society. So this is vague. And I admit that personally speaking as a lawyer, just uh, this in practice, it's, it might create uh, some problem. I, it already created some problem and the, the legislature, uh, legislator uh, uh, intervened. It was shocking that the same court in 1996 issued a decision upholding a verdict by the Court of Appeal declaring the late Professor Nasr Abu Zaid an apostate from Islam, even though he professed to be a Muslim. And it annulled his marriage against both his and his wife's will. Actually, the case was instituted uh, according to what we call in Islam, hisbah. I, I, I don't know, just I pronounce it uh, rightly, hisbah. So this is, it's each Muslim has the duty to uh, to move an action or to, to do something before the court to, to stop something against Islam. So, in fact, the, uh, the, 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 private, the private persons who initiated this case against the, the late professor, in fact, the used unfilled gap in the Egyptian laws allowed, allowed them to, 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 to use it and to rely upon it. Such use of Hezbollah derived from the public interest and especially from the requirement to protect the public order. This is exactly what they the, the, the relied upon. The verdict rendered by the Court of Appeal created a massive anxiety among a wide range of the society, which drew the attention of the legislature that in return enacted two laws restricting the use of Hezbollah to state officials only. However, for, from a legal point of view, that after the verdict uh, being uh, rendered by the, the Court of Appeal and in this, peri this period between the verdict and the challenge before the, the Court of Cassation, so the, it was final, the verdict was final. So that's, to that extent, the Court of Cassation hadn't considered neither the new laws, two laws, uh, Law number three of 1996, regulating Hezbollah, and the uh, law number 81 of 1996, stipulating all the inadmissibility of cases filed by any party other than the public pr uh, prosecution. On the basis that a requirement of interest in such cases falls within the public order. The, the, the judicial reasoning of the Court of Cassation premised on a rationale that its role is to review whether the competent court duly and correctly applied the law. And the verdict has been rendered before the enactment of the two laws. And therefore, they are not applicable to the quest to overrule. I hope that I could give some idea about how the development from the institutional, the institutional development in Egypt and their, uh, 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 the, the role of Sharia in substantive and how Sharia evolved to be part of the statutory, uh, statutory law. But I would like to give final comments or final remarks 
and which has, uh, suggests some future uh, uh, issues to consider. Uh, first, I would like first to remark I would, uh, uh, after examining the, the code of uh, the civil code of Egypt, we observe that even even if even before that in, in 1920 and 1929 laws at that time, so the drafters did not rely intensively on an Hanafi doctrine. The, they went to uh, Maliki and Shafi. So they did not restrict themselves with only one doctrine. And there are also other instances regarding the, uh, the, the lost people. So the legislator went even for other uh, doctrines to find solutions because that we had a, a case where a boat sank and that hundreds of people died and at that time, the law uh, stipulated that it should be four years before declaring the, the, the person dead. So the legislator relied on some opinion of jurists that allowing that the, to declare immediately to, uh, declaring the death, the death of a person who was lost in circumstances that uh, uh, necessarily leading to death. So this is the first remark. The second remark, th there is also uh, um, some rule of uh, Sharia in the criminal, uh, the criminal court uh, in the uh, death sentence. As there is a requirement by the court before pronouncing the death sentence just to refer the whole, the whole case, the whole documents to Mufti. The, the advisor, the, the Muslim advisor. So this mufti will, will give an, an opinion. However, the opinion is not mandatory for the, uh, for the court to follow. The, the, uh, they might take it or not. But it should be within a limit of 10 days. So this is general. I may conclude that after examining Egypt's experience in both procedural and substantive levels, that it's recommended to examine the adoption, either the adoption of any court system or the substantive legal rules applicable in light of a number of factors. One, Sharia may comprise all features of, the, of, that, quali uh, of that law, that, that rule qualified to be applied objectively. Two, Drafting substantive laws in a dynamic process to cope with the changing uh, interests in a society, which among other things requires flexible approach to elect provisions that serve the legislative purpose while remaining complied with Sharia. Third, the approach followed by the Supreme Constitutional Court has been effective in defining the principles of Islamic Sharia as stated in the Constitution. Four, importance of the judicial control and review. Five, Islamic jurisprudence, writings of scholars and foreign case law and, and legislations can enrich comparative law studies. In this regard, Islamic Sharia may offer innovative solutions to some issues beyond its mere application among Muslims. Next, there is no subjective requirement as far as the identity of the judge is concerned. Sharia laws can be safely applied by all courts where clear substantive rules exist and objective criteria are followed. To clarify, there is no such requirement in employing conflict of law rules and examining a foreign law. It's, it's for example. So if you are applying in, in the conflict of laws and the, the applicable law would be the, uh, the, the, the American common law so that there is no need to have an American citizen applying this because of the, national, uh, the national court will apply it irrespective of the nationality of the, the judge. The following point is regarding that the success in applying Sharia laws is not necessarily associated with certain models. It's true that specialized courts, 
a specialized court model may for practical considerations facilitate litigation and offer cost-effective advice, but it's equally true that it primarily needs investment in human resources, mainly education and continued training, and the judicial review as a basic guarantee. It also proved that respect of religion-based legal rules governing personal status in relation to family would serve as a stabilizing factor for the society and, and improves the country's profile vis-a-vis -vis the international community. The final point regarding public awareness, and this is crucial. Let me tell you that public awareness is very important because it's now that we are just, we are open to internet, we are open to different, different media sources and uncontrollable. So we need that the, the society in, in, in uh, the society in a country just to, to be fully aware and transparent and will be some debate and discussion just to, to correct something and to, to, to upgrade the understanding. So I, I, I believe that also education just it would serve for that, not only public awareness through, through media, but the education itself. Finally, Jurists, legislators, lawyers, and judges dealing with Islamic Sharia and Christian Sharia's laws are encouraged to carefully consider new legal issues as a result of the so-called online marriage and divorce, especially in the cross-border context. At the end, I would like to quote Imam Shafi'i Always hate what's wrong, but don't hate the wrongdoer. Hate sin with all your heart, but forgive and have mercy on the sinner. Criticize speech, but respect the speaker. Our job is to wipe out disease, not the patient. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much, Mr. Ahmed Shehal Beldin. Ibrahim Abdullah. At this point, may we request a short pause from our uh, discussions because we will have a quick photo opportunity. So if we can request uh, Mr. Ahmed to stay on stage. And at this point, I would also request uh, our Chief Justice Alexander Gismundo and Associate Justices Justice Japar de Maampao and uh, Justice Jose Maidas Marquez to join uh, us in, on stage for the photo opportunity. We would also want to request to join the photo our uh, distinguished guest, uh, Mr. Nizam Bashir, as well as Dr. Pradana Boy Zulian and Mr. Muhammad Farouk Raza to come up stage and join us for our photo opportunity. Joining the photo is also uh, the Philippine Judicial Academy Chancellor, Rosemary Carandang. Ma'am, if you can also join us here. Thank you. Thank you very much, honored guests and uh, justices of the Supreme Court.
once again, thank you very much, His Excellency, Attorney Shahabuddin, for giving us a, a glimpse of the Sharia as practiced in Egypt. Okay? From Egypt, we hope to have a glimpse of how Sharia is uh, being practiced in Malaysia. We are joined today by Mr. Naz Nizam Bashir, the managing partner of Nizam Bashir and Associates in Malaysia. But let me read a little of his bio notes. Nizam Bashir practices in both the civil courts and the Sharia courts in Malaysia. He has acted in a number of key public law and human rights cases involving civil and Sharia law. He is a trusted commentator and his views are regularly sought in broadcast and print media. He runs a practice at Mesures Nizam Bashir and Associates and tries in all that he does to speak truth to power as well as instilling a passion for compassion with the many public interest litigation cases he has been involved in over the years. That quest has entailed a number of things including speaking up in favor of the Palestinians at the United Nations Public Forum in support of the Palestinian people in 2009 and writing the opening chapter to a seminal book on Islam in a constitutional democracy like Malaysia entitled Breaking the Silence, Voices of Moderation, Islam in a Constitutional Democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm giving the floor to uh, Sir Nisam Bashir. Take it away, sir. Thank you so much. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The Honorable Justice Japa Imam Pao, Madam Moderator, uh, salutations to my respected panel of fellow speakers, distinguished guests, and all those who are present today. Permit me to express my gratitude to the organizers for inviting me to speak on this very interesting topic, best practices on Sharia in foreign jurisdictions. Unfortunately, for reasons that I am unsure of, the nature of my involvement this uh, afternoon has shifted from a panel discussion uh, to a presentation. And I think now, from a presentation to a mixed format of being both a panel discussion and a presentation. So either way, forgive me if uh, some of what I have to say strays a little beyond what may have been intended by the organizers or even your expectations. The focus of my talk today will, however, be less about best practices from a Sharia perspective and more about best practices of Sharia when operating with, with or within a civil framework. Now, in keeping with modern trends, I naturally turned to chat GPT. Uh, if uh, members of the audience are not familiar with what chat GPT is, essentially it's an AI. You throw a question at it and it, it prompts you with a number of answers in return. And I asked chat GPT the question, what are the best practices on Sharia? And as a practitioner of both civil and Sharia law, I found the answer to be quite interesting. The answer given by this AI was, while best practices may vary, depending on specific contexts and interpretation of Islamic law by different scholars and communities, some general practices could include the following. Number one, ensure fairness and justice in all legal matters, including family law, business transactions, and criminal justice. 
according to Islamic principles. That's a qualifier. Encouraging education and scholarship to promote a better understanding of Islamic law and its application in modern contexts. Emphasizing the importance of individual rights and freedoms, including freedom of religion and expression, again with a qualifier, within the framework of Islamic law. Promoting dialogue and cooperation between different communities and legal systems to find common ground and address areas of conflict. Encouraging transparency and accountability in the implementation of Sharia law, including the use of independent courts and oversight mechanisms to prevent abuse and ensure due process. Now, the answer given by ChatGPT, i.e. best practices may vary depending on specific context and interpretation of Islamic law, is not necessarily problematic because that was going to be my first point as well. But perhaps the question to ask is, what is the context when talking about implementing Sharia law in whatever form or fashion in whichever country, because one can talk about implementing Sharia law, the concept of it in any way, in a vacuum. Now, the sensible starting point, to my mind, would be to look at the historical context, to see where we came from. Um, and, and that's the first part of the question that I've put in my slide, because that seems to be the con constitutional approach as well, when courts are deciding important constitutional cases. Now, I do not proclaim to be a student of world history, but I can speak about the history of Malaysia and some of the in initial empires that ultimately led to the nation being what it is. The relevant empire at the time in Malaysia was likely the Malacca Sultanate, based in modern-day Malacca. What initially held sway in that Sultanate was based on Islam. Never nevertheless, as, as it happened, other colonial powers came to Malacca and conquered the kingdom. From 1511 to 1641, we had the Portuguese who conquered Malacca. From 1641 to 1840, 1824, it was the Dutch. From 1824 till independence in 1957, the British were the colonial masters uh, of a number of states in the region. And in, in 1957, what we now know to be Malaysia uh, the country gained its independence, and with the independence came along a written constitution. Now, because there were all these colonial masters, the legal makeup of the country shifted from a pathway of full-blown Sharia to one that was more circular in, in nature. The monarchs role, we have kings, we have sultans, not just one, we have more than one, and they rotate in terms of governing uh, and being the monarch of Malaysia. The monarch's role became a, a constitutional one in many respects. Islam was proclaimed to be the state religion, but other religions could be practiced in peace and harmony with it, and civil law became the main source of law in Malaysia, because that, that was how it was even prior to independence. Religion, as a consequence, was rendered applicable only in certain areas of the law, and you can see the parallels, perhaps, between Malaysia and what you have today in Philippines. Religion was rendered applicable only in certain areas of the law, for example, family law, in terms of marriage and divorce, and personal law, succession, kafala, which is taking care of children without parental care, and even you know, more esoteric matters like gifts or powers of attorney. Now, in fact, the relatively simpler, simpler role that Sharia law had post-independence is encapsulated by the fact that pre-independence, Sharia laws were all housed in one simple legislation, and there were only 26 offences to speak of. Uh, there was uh, the offence of uh, consuming alcohol. Uh, if you were absent from Friday prayers, that's also a crime. Not fasting, that's a crime. Ill-treating one's wife, also a crime. Halwat, which is uh, the crime of being in close proximity with a non-mahram, and uh, various other doctrinal matters. But they were simpler. So this was the historical setting in Malaysia. Now the second question is, what is the legal context? Which is what I call where we are today. Yeah? We move from history to looking at the law and looking at the founding documents of the nation, specifically the constitution, and ask the all-important question. Is the country a secular state? 
as answering that question sometimes results in a different conclusion as to the extent of the rights one may have even in a Sharia court setting. Malaysia has a written constitution that recognizes Sharia as a source of law. So we have civil law, we have Sharia law. So it recognizes Sharia as a source of law, but only for Muslims in specific areas of the law and rec recognizes civil law in all other areas. Oddly enough, the constitution does not use the word secularism. It's not there at all in the constitution. But specific articles and case law affirms that Malaysia is a secular country. Now, when I say secularism, I accept, you know, it's a bit like ice cream. You have multiple flavors. France and its notion of secularism, laicity, is at the furthest end of the spectrum. Maybe where the state is less accommodating about religion in the public sphere. Pakistan. We have a speaker from Pakistan in the floor today. Pakistan arguably is on the opposite end, uh, and I say that in this sense. There's a specific article within the, the Pakistan constitution that says that all laws must be consistent with the Quran and Sunnah. We don't have that in the Malaysian constitution. Maldives may be somewhere in between the two extremes, in that it recognizes fundamental rights, but only insofar as it is not contrary to any tenet of Islam. And then we have Malaysia, which is, I suppose, uh, somewhere in the middle of everything. It's relatively progressive compared to Maldives in that there are fundamental liberties for Muslims, but at the same time, there's nothing expressed in the written constitution to say that liberties are only there for Muslims if it is consistent with Islam. So which brings us nicely to this particular landing point. If a country is secular and there are fundamental liberties, how does fundamental liberties fit, it, fit in with Islam? Let me say that again. Yeah? If a country is secular and there are fundamental liberties, how does fundamental liberties fit in with Islam? Now, this question is not a remote one because Philippines, the Philippine constitution also has fundamental liberties. But by the same, at, at the same time, there is this effort of trying to ensure that Islam essentially holds sway in certain regions and maybe specifically for Muslims alone. Yeah? So the logical follow-up question to th that question that I posed earlier, whether you know, when, a question, when a country is secular, there are fundamental liberties, how, do you, how does fundamental liberties fit in with Islam? The logical follow-up question is, are fundamental liberties necessarily inimical to Islam for us to be troubled by even that first question? Now, the people of Maldives do not seem to think so. As I earlier said, their constitution expressly recognized if it is consistent with Islam, fundamental liberties are to be accorded to Muslims. Yeah? What about the rest of us? The rest of us in other parts of the world who are proponents of the Sharia? So when we are thinking about the question of fundamental liberties, is it a problem? Now, the Quran in Surah Al-An'am, chapter 5, verse, 50, verse 77, sorry. Say, O people of the book, do not go to extremes in your faith. So from a religious perspective, we are not meant to go from one extreme, Puritanism, to another, complete freedom. So we must be reasonable. We must be moderate in all that we do. But what is reasonable? What is moderate? Where rights are concerned? Well, let's, let's look at maybe specific, um, specific areas of fundamental liberties. Let's look at free speech and expression. Complete free speech may be a bad thing. The constitution recognizes, at least the Malaysian constitution, recognizes that there must be limits to speech and expression. The, Typical example always is standing up and calling, for, calling out that there's a fire in a crowded theater. Yeah, that's a bad thing, especially when there's no actual fire. Slandering people's reputation without repercussion, that's a bad thing. Reputation is important in Islam. Various verses in the Quran emphasizes this, including Quran, uh, uh, the chapter in Al-Hujrat, verse 12, do not spy or backbite. 
basically don't speak bad, bad, bad about someone behind their backs. Now, various enactments, in fact, exist in Malaysia, restricting the use of some 25 words. Various enactments exist in Malaysia, restricting the use of some 25 words, including the words like Allah, including like the words Kaaba, Mufti, Wali, Salat, or Qiblat. And non-Muslims can't use these words. Now, from a religious perspective, I find IP fights like this to be odd, specifically because Islam is the youngest of the Abrahamic faith, and some things have even existed prior to the coming of Islam. But the fact is, there is a political dimension to issues like this, and we can't ignore that. So IP fights like this, I suppose, will continue to happen. Naming rights. Can illegitimate children be given a bin with their father's name purely for worldly purposes while leaving religious laws to be operative for all other purposes? Now, in Islamic law, of course, there can be no nasab, no ascription of paternity between a biological father and an illegitimate child. And Ibn Zina has no lineage. But alternatively, even if we accept that Islamic position, can a child simply be named with a personal name that contains the father's name as a component of his personal name without the bin? What about the child's right to identity subsumed as part of freedom of speech and expression? What about freedom of conscience or conviction? Now, this is a bit touchy, but should Muslims be allowed to apostatize? Now, this can arise in a number of ways, uh, and perhaps I can think of two uh, particular areas, what I call the simple apostasy cases, where a uh, presently Muslim wants to leave the religion of Islam. Is there space for that? within the relevant fundamental liberties on right to freedom of conscience. Now, the Quran in, uh, in Surah Yunus, chapter 10, verse 99 to 100, and had your Lord will, those on earth would have believed, all of them entirely. Then, O Muhammad, would you compel people in order that they become believers? And it is not for a soul to believe, except by permission of Allah. Then, beyond the simple apostasy cases, what about unilateral conversion cases? Meaning, Parents were initially non-Muslim. One converts in due course, wants to convert the child. But the other non-converting parent does not, does not want to follow. So instances have arisen, at least in the Malaysian perspective, where the child is converted without the non-converting parent's consent. What happens? Yeah. This has now been resolved in Malaysia in this way. Both parents must consent to the child's conversion. Personally, I find this to be problematic because it ignores the fact that a child has the individual right to profess. Of course, one can argue what if the child is three years old and you know, the ability to form conviction must be central to that right. Yeah? But at the moment, the Malaysian uh, perspective or the Malaysian position does not even account for that aspect that a, a child who has suitable facilities does not have an individual right of conviction. The other component of freedom of conscience and conviction who is, is this question. Who determines? Who determines whether someone is a Muslim or otherwise for the purposes of, of personal laws? A religious expert or a religious court? Or do civil courts determine this? There have been a number of cases involving the right to bury, to, to, to bury deceased persons. Heirs or family members of the dissident step forward to say that the deceased person is a non-Muslim, whereas other parties say that he is a Muslim. How do you resolve that? The right to counsel. Let's say you're a Muslim and you're about to charge or investigated for a crime. Should you be permitted the right to consult a lawyer? Where is that right to counsel housed? In state enactments in Malaysia regulating Sharia, it is not explicitly provided, so it must be read from the federal constitution, the, the Malaysian written constitution. Now, some of these things that I've talked about, there does not seem to be anything objectionable for, about it from an Islamic perspective. 
So we may argue about its contents perhaps, but there I think is some univers universality about what exactly the premise of those rights are and whether those rights exist. But let me end by saying this. In as much as I've been exhorting that there's been quite a bit of common ground between Sharia law, between civil law, there may be some things which will always remain beyond the pale of civil law. And more certainly, I think this is when it relates to matters of ibadah, matters of worship involving men and Allah, there is less room to move. But when it relates to muamalat, and I define muamalat in this way, matters involving relationships or dealings between human beings, there may be more room to move. Either way, ultimately, the emphasis in Sharia law is not about freedom, not really, or doing what the nafs wants. True freedom from a Sharia perspective is doing actually what Allah wants. The Abdullah, servant of Allah, is the only real free human being. The one who is a slave to himself, Abdul Mahluk, has no freedom. And that really is all that I have to say everyone in this room for the moment. There is a presentation shortly thereafter. I do apologize for any shortcomings. They are mine alone. But if anything I've said here inspires you in whatever form or fashion, that's all from the Almighty, not me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nizam. At this point, I would like to acknowledge the presence of Senior Associate Justice Marvik and VF Leonin. Now, to proceed with our discussion on part four, please welcome our third discussant lecturer, Dr. Pradana Boy Zulian from the University of Muhammadiyah, Malang, Indonesia. Allow me to read the short bio of Dr. Zulian. Dr. Zulian is an associate professor in Islamic Legal Studies at the Faculty of Islamic Studies, University of Muhammadiyah, Malang, in Indonesia. He, is cur he currently holds a position as Vice Dean for Academic Affairs, Faculty of Islamic Studies. He is trained as an Islamic legal scholar at University of Muhammadiyah, Malang, between 1995 and 2000. After completing his degree in Islamic law, Dr. Pradana uh, pursued Masters of Arts in Contemporary Islamic Thought and Movements in Southeast Asia at the Faculty of Asian Studies, Australian National University in Canberra, Australia. His master's is completed in 2007. In 2015, he gained his PhD in Sociology of Islamic Law from the Department of Malay Studies, National University of Singapore. In addition, he studied politics at University of Massachusetts, United States of America in 2017, and Islamic Thought and Philosophy at Al Mustafa Un International University in Qom, Iran in 2020. As an academic, Dr. Pradana is, an a is actively involved in many social activities and organizations. Currently, he is a member of the Propagation or Missionary Council of Muhammadiyah Central Board in Jakarta. At the same time, he is the head of Islamic Boarding School Development of, Coun of the Council of Muhammadiyah Provincial Board in East Java. Other than this, he founded Bait al-Hikmah Foundation, an Islamic-based social foundation dedicated for educating young generation and developing inclusive understanding of Islamic teachings. In 2018 up to 2019, Dr. Pradana served the Presidential Office of the Republic of Indonesia as Presidential Staff for Interreligious Affairs. Dr. Pradana is also internationally active. He currently holds a position as Indonesian Fellow at Islam and Liberty Network, a global network working for freedom of religion in the context of Islam. He is also a member of the Global Exchange on Religion in Society based in Germany. Ladies and gentlemen, let us give a warm welcome to Dr. Pradana Boy Zulian. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The Honorable Justice, organizers, fellow presenters, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I thank the organizer for having me here. <coughs> it is a great honor for me.
to be with you all in this lovely place in a scholarly discussion as part of effort to adequately place Islamic law or Sharia in the context of national legal system of the Philippines, especially in the reference to the Bangsamuro existence. Uh, I would like to speak about Indonesian experience of the application of Sharia, not only about best practices, but also bad experience. So let me start by presenting a, thought, not a, a, a brief story. In one day in Ramadan, I deliver my sermon to a crowd or to Jama'ah. And then I say to them that, are you happy with the fact that during Ramadan, the number of crime are decreasing? And the crowd said, we are very happy. But then I said, please think deeply. Why in Ramadan, the number of crime are decreasing? That means that out of Ramadan, those criminals are mostly Muslim. So how do we deal with this? And then say, so this is about how do we deal with Islamic law in Indonesia. But considering the nature of this topic in this very limited time, I will speak from a politics of law perspective about the existence of Islamic law in Indonesia. And then I will offer an analysis on its future prospect. In chronological, chronological order, I would firstly like to trace the root and origin of Islamic law in Indonesia, or in the past we know it as Nusantara. Uh, this meant to be the foundation, as I believe, that understanding period and mode of establishment for Islamic law in Indonesia will serve as an essential ingredient to comprehensively grasp the complex dynamic of Islamic law in Indonesia from time to time. So let me start from the historical context. Uh, from this point, I think, Indonesia as a modern nation state share common history with the Philippines and also with Malaysia. The history of Islamic law in Indonesia covers a wide period from pre-colonialism era in the period of Sultanate around 14th century to colonialism period, to post-independent and to reform era in our time now. The coming of Islam in the archipelago, then known as Nusantara, has significantly changed the system of belief of Nusantara people at the time. I argue that the system of belief deals not only with the cognitive conviction on abstract element of life, but it also shapes people's behaviors in relation to holy dimension of life. This is also the case with Islam in Nusantara and of course everywhere. When Islam came and substitute local system of bliss previously present within Nusantara society, such as Hinduism, Buddhism, and other local belief, Islam played as a role. Islam played a role as a dominant force for the whole aspect for life for the Nusantara inhabitant. However, some scholars doubt the level of Islam's influence for Nusantara people. The late Murray a, a prominent historian from Australia, he argued that people of Indonesia never been fully subst or substantially Islamized. For him, the dominant wave within Islam in Nusantara, or in Indonesia today, and more specifically in Java, one of the more con most condensed uh, or more popul most populated island in Indonesia, is a blend of Islam and mysticism. Islam is at the skin level only, and the essence is mysticism. This is what Riklaf claimed. This claim indeed can find its truth and relevant, but I believe that 
it is not applicable for the whole context of Muslim society in Nusantara. Two bases on which I base my disagreement with this mystic synthesis are, first, the existence of Islamic legal system within the circle of Muslim Sultanate in Nusantara. In this context, again, I say that we, Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia, and maybe Singapore, and Brunei Darussalam share our common history. And the second is the fact that Indonesian Islam is not a monolithic context. As the first basis is most relevant to this section, I will elaborate more on this rather than to the second basis. Islam is also a comprehensive life, so it is understandable that the coming of Islam has also manifested in the adoption of Islamic law as integral part of Islamic teaching. So we see in Jaffa, for example, the Sultanate of Demak, the first Islamic state founded by Raden Pata, a half Chinese prince, the son of Majapahit monarchs named Brawijaya, can be presented as a case. In its time, Demak served as one epicentrum of Islamic Islam and Islamic law, which also brought consequence of the application of Islamic law in this newly founded polity. However, whether Islamic law was really applied in the Sultanate of Demak or not, it is a subject for academic debate. In general, there are two opposing views. The first, views, the first view holds conviction of the application of Islamic law by the Sultan, and according to this view, Islamic law was applied for the whole stratum and dimension of the Mark society. Among evidence of this theory proposed is the composition of Islamic law book in Japanese language called Solo Kantoro, and another book called Anger Suryo Alam. This two work was believed as undang-undang or laws for the Mark Sultanate. However, in contrast to this view, the second view, usually known as pessimist group, maintains that the application of Islamic law and the Mark Sultanate was minor and superficial as Hindu and Buddhist elements were still dominant. The proponents of this group include Western scholars such as Barry Hooker, De Graaf, and Pidget, and Hooker argues that Islamic law in the Mark Sultanate was blurred as it is blended with customary laws, while the Graf and Pigot maintain that the application of Islamic law in the Mark was very limited and remote. So to me, the second views echoes Riklef thesis on the mystic synthesis, but in a more specific reference to Islamic law. While the first few represent indigenous or local scholars. So from this point, we can see might be not, not real conflict, but contestation of concept between Western and maybe Southeast Asian scholars regarding the role of Islamic law within society. Other than the mark, the application of Islamic law in the Sanchara Sultanate can also be traced from Malay Peninsula, as Nizam has mentioned about Malacca. And also we can see uh, below this archipelago, we can go down to Manado, uh, to Celebes, uh, the Goa Sultanate, and also Bima Sultanate in East Nusa Tenggara. Uh, so, up to this point, it can, it, it can be concluded that Islamic law had been widely practiced by Muslims in Nusantara around 13 or 14 centuries. However, when Netherlands came to Indonesia around 17th centuries, many bad experience took place. The first one is the coming of Netherlands in Indonesia in 17th century, actually under the, the banner of VOC, a Dutch company, uh, a Dutch trade company, the existence of Islamic law did not experience significant changes. Islamic law was allowed to be practiced by Muslim. Nevertheless, in later period of colonialism, the dynamic turned to be more complicated. 
In general, there were two facets of Islamic law application in the time of Dutch colonialism. The first phase took place from uh, six, 17th century to 19th century. In this period, Islamic law was fully acknowledged by the Dutch under the theory of receptio in complexu. This theory contained principle that Netherlands is in this people, or Indonesian people in current situation. Uh, in ruling their affairs, the law of their religions is applicable. So the, uh, at the first time, where the VOC uh, was very was very, was very kind of the application of, of, of Islamic law. This theory was coined by Ludwig Willem Christian van den Berg. It is based on the fact that Islamic law had previously been practiced by Nusantara people prior the coming of Dutch and that in earlier period that, that colonialism. But then during second, uh, uh, after sec, uh, 19th century, situation of Islamic law changed very significantly as a new theory was introduced, namely receptio, a theory, recept a theory of receptio, that Islamic law can only be applied by Nusantara people after it is incorporated within customary laws. So it's like a subordinated Islamic law into customary law. In modern situation, uh, we see Islamic law also very uh, play very important role in Indonesian society. Uh, in in post-independent, Sukarno was very hostile to Islam in the late of his uh, in, in the last part of his of his power, and then continued by Suharto. In early period of his power, Suharto was also showing his hostility toward Islam, but then. Uh, uh, maybe in the uh, second half of his power, so Harto saw uh, his favor to Islamic law. So in 1974, Islamic law, Islamic marriage law was enacted. And then followed by 1989, the establishment of Islamic religious court for the whole uh, for the whole province in Indonesia. So for Muslim, we have choice whether we will file our case for dispute uh, in Islamic court or in civil courts. But the Islamic religious court was officially enacted by president in 1989. And the existence or the establishment of pengadilan agama or Islamic religious court is not only about institution, but Suharto also allowed the compilation of Islamic, Indonesian Islamic law called, in Bahasa Indonesia, we call it Kompilasi Hukum Islam. This is like a guide for any judges within Islamic religious court to, to decide any dispute within this, this within this Islamic religious code. The question is, uh, what, is the, uh, what are the sources for this Islamic, Indonesian Islamic law compilation? It is interesting to say that the Kompilasi Hukum Islam or Indonesian Islamic law compilation is a compilation of four fiqih of the Madhab. So many people confidently say the Kompilasi Hukum Islam is actually Indonesian version of Fiki because it is uh, consisted of many local elements and also blended between uh, Indonesian values. And in our situation now, after the reform era, after the collapse of Suharto, more and more Islamic law are uh, formalized, such as law on zakat, law on uh, haji, law on uh, endowment, and also law about Islamic banking. So recently, Indonesian government merged all Sharia banking in uh, state-owned bank into one single bank called Bank Sharia Indonesia. So all this 
kind of uh, dynamic tell us not only about about best practices but also bad, but bad experience experienced by Indonesia from time to time. Thank you very much for your understanding. Thank you very much, Dr. Pradarna Boyzulian, for sharing with us the Sharia Indonesia jurisdiction. Please remain seated, okay? Now we are going to have a panel discussion and that will be moderated by Attorney Anwar Malang, uh, the Chairman of the Mindanao Human Rights Action Center, MINRAC for Brevity, and Convenor of the Philippine Center for Islam and Democracy. Attorney Malang, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Our courtesies to the Chief Justice and the Associate Justice around. So we will go direct to the point since we don't have uh, much time. Actually, we are already on our time, 3 o'clock. So simple rules. Those who wanted to ask questions, please... Uh, ask directly your question after stating your name and to whom you're going to address your question. So do I see anybody raising their hands? Well, nobody wants to ask questions from our speakers. Okay, we have here, sir. Mic test. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Adnan Alonto. I am a lawyer by profession. And uh, I've had the uh, good fortune of being assigned as Philippine ambassador to Saudi to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And uh, certainly the, uh, the subject as discussed by our discussants uh, uh, very much uh, relevance, uh, uh, not only in the context of uh, uh, the application of Sharia law in the Philippines, but also the application of such uh, with res in the context of our overseas workers. And um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the, uh, uh, the three countries, uh, I mean the speakers of the three countries uh, where I think, I believe we have uh, uh, workers, uh, Filipino workers in, in the countries of uh, the speakers. And so um, my question is, uh, since um, my stint in Saudi Arabia for almost five years had exposed me to uh, uh, the legal system of the kingdom, uh, and particularly uh, Sharia, uh, um, and it's, it's, it's interesting that uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the countries of our three speakers, uh, Sharia has uh, its own uh, uh, reach. Uh, but my question is procedural um, because uh, substantive Sharia, I understand, is always based in the Quran and the Hadiths. But um, my observation in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is that uh, with procedurally, uh, the court proceedings is based on an inquisitorial legal system as opposed to a adversarial system uh, that uh, the Philippines and uh, most Western countries have. So um, the inquisitorial system is also known as the non-adversarial system. It's a system whereby uh, there is very little uh, participation of uh, advocates, meaning counselors of law, during actual court proceedings. And I was wondering whether uh, in your respective uh, jurisdictions, um, Egypt, Malaysia, and Indonesia, 
Uh, could you tell us what sort of legal system do you observe in your court system procedurally? Is it inquisitorial or non-adversarial, or is it adversarial? Okay, sir, who wants to answer first? I'm from Malaysia. Psycho. Uh, the answer is gonna be rather short. Um, the Malaysian experience may be different maybe compared to how it is in Philippines, how it is in Egypt, or even Indonesia. The Malaysian experience is, I, I suppose, housed in the principle that he who asserts proves. So to my mind, that encapsulates the adversarial system. Um, so if you are the plaintiff uh, who has filed or instituted a particular claim, the burden is on you, safe maybe in certain other circumstances, but by and large, it's adversarial in nature. Yeah. Uh, in our current situation, there are three legal system in Indonesia, which is uh, civil, civil law, which is inherited from the Dutch, and this applicable for public law, uh, customary law, which uh, we follow uh, not recepci theory, but rather recepcio in complexu, meaning the customary law can be applied after uh, only if it fits Islamic Sharia, like in West Sumatra or uh, Padang. Uh, the third one is, of course, Islamic law. Uh, up to now, Islamic law is still applied on family or individual level, but more and more uh, requests and also public pressure about Islamic public law to be enacted. But then, uh, to me, as a, as, as a person, I would say that the application or formalization of public law, Islamic public law in Indonesia is still far away because it will uh, involve many, many process and also it will uh, deal with the fact that Indonesia is a multicultural country and not religion-based country, but rather Indonesia is like uh, Soft, uh, soft country. <laughs> soft secular. Thank you very much. From Egypt, sir. Okay. El Akhir Rabbu Karim, inshallah. Excellency, thank you very much for the uh, questions. That I hope that I was clear regarding the, the application of the uh, Code of uh, Civil Procedure. And um, in Egypt, we are following the ordinary uh, court, uh, rule, uh, court system model where that, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the attorneys or the advocates would attend and they are presenting the memorials. However, just the um, one uh, peculiar uh, um, feature of the family law in Egypt, in the family courts, uh, there would be before um, the the uh, the court the the judges proceed with um, uh, with the case. They start with a bureau called the dispute settlement. So the dispute settlement this is inspired by that. Uh, okay, just you're asking from one uh, so that uh, from the the families of the uh, uh, the two spouses uh, trying just to finding a solution before moving the action. So. It, it develops because it's, um, we, are, we, are, we are trying just to, to adapt to adapt the legal system to the requirements of uh, Sharia law. This is, uh, this is simple. Uh, I hope that I'm clear. Thank, thank you very much, Excellencies, and thank you very much for the, all the, uh, the other discussions. Thank you. I think we have similarities also in the Philippines. Our code of Muslim personal laws, so before we became adversarial in the court, we have what we call the Agama Arbitration Council, wherein the families will try to settle first the case. So next, uh, yeah, we have here from the NCMF. Mr. Oh, yeah, we, we have question from, yeah. Uh, good afternoon and assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am attorney Gapur Kitoar from the National Commission on Muslim Filipinos and um, member of the Sharia legal profession. Uh, 
particularly affiliated to the Philippine Sharia Lawyers Incorporated. My question is simple and direct uh, regarding the uh, criminal jurisdiction in the three countries, Malaysia, Egypt, and Indonesia. My question is, what is the maximum penalty being applied or recognized in your respective countries, and what are those penalties? Okay. So are you trying to ask whether or not they have uh, still death penalty or what? The nature and maximum penalties being recognized by the respective countries. Okay, so from our speakers, who wanted to answer? As from Indonesia. Yeah, let me start. As we have not applied uh, Islamic public law, so uh, well, public criminal crime is, is defined by civil law inherited by the Dutch. So the Islamic law is only applicable for family and individual matters. So in this case, we don't have any maximum penalty <laughs> because a uh, matter about family law is uh, regarding inheritance, endowment, uh, marriage, and something like that. Yeah, thank you. Same answer from Egypt, only personal status and family law. So there is no criminal uh, counts uh, to be uh, adjudicated according to Sharia law. Uh, Malaysia is a bit different in that sense. There is a limited um, number of criminal offences that has been enacted and that falls under the purview of the Sharia courts in Malaysia. And we have a particular legislation that sets the upper limit of what that jurisdiction is. So the formula is 356. 3,000 ringgit fine. Uh, I think it's in terms of pesos, maybe it's about what, 20? I think one ringgit is about 80 pesos or something like that. Yeah. So 3,000 3, ringgit, fine. Uh, five strokes of the whip. And. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Three years imprisonment, 5,000 ringgit, fine. And six strokes of the whip. So it's 356. That's the formula. Um, but in terms of the exact range of offences, there may be some debate about that at this point in time. But to put it very simply, the, the criminal jurisdiction of the Sharia court is residual in nature, meaning anything that is not covered by the penal code that we have in Malaysia, which is the civil legislation for criminal offences, that may be looked into by the Sharia courts. So that's, that's the, why I say there's a bit of a debate is uh, there seems to be a bit of back and forth as, as to exactly what type of offences is actually still left after certain challenges that has been, play, been playing out in the courts in Malaysia. Yeah, but 356, that's the answer. Thank you very much. So, Thank yeah, you. Uh, what, one more uh, follow-up. Yeah. Okay, with respect to um, Indonesia. What about in the province of Asi? Okay. Do you have any knowledge regarding the application of criminal law in Islamic criminal law in yeah. the province of Asi? Yeah, Aceh is a special case. We call it daerah istimewa or special region. So it is granted for full application of Islamic law. So criminal Islamic law is uh, practiced there, but it's only limited for the province. Uh, Indonesia nationally still not applied this law. So yes, they have. So uh, what kind of Islamic law, I mean, uh, from which school of law, mostly they apply Safi uh, school of law. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum, gentlemen. I am Jamel Mumtik, a regional trial court judge of Marikis in the city. My question, um, in your jurisdictions, uh, since Malaysia has dual system, Indonesia, there are three, um, is the decision 
uh, I'm referring to your Sharia courts, insofar as Sharia courts. Is the decision final and executory? I know in the Philippines, it's appealable to the Supreme Court. That's our constitution uh, for academic uh, discussions. Uh, is it final and uh, executory order already? Or is it appealable? Is there another court, not Sharia court, to which a decision the aggrieved party can appeal the decision? Thank you. Okay, so who wants to answer? Indonesia, oh, Malaysia. Uh, the Malaysian experience is somewhat unique. And why I say that is for many years, perhaps the position was somewhat similar to how it was in the Philippines. Uh, you could, for example, impugn the verdict of the Sharia courts in the civil courts, perhaps even in total. Yeah? And, and that was a position for me for maybe a good 30 to 40 years. Um, then what happened was there was a particular amendment to the constitution um, and the purpose of the amendment was to insulate the verdicts of the Sharia court from being challenged in the civil courts. So uh, you use the phrase dual legal system which I found quite interesting because uh, arguably with that particular amendment that's what happened. The, the existence I think of that dual legal system perhaps was cemented by that amendment. Um, the, the only difference perhaps lies in maybe parties differing as to the exact impact of the, the, the amendment, yeah? Because the question still remains, what if what the Sharia court decides is not a matter within their jurisdiction? Okay? So, for example, if you have matters which is entirely decided within their jurisdiction, there's no question... Uh, from a, maybe even a public law perspective, from a fundamental liberties perspective, no problems. I think it's correct that the verdict of the Sharia court should be left alone. No court should have the ability to, to I suppose, to, for want of a better word, intrude upon the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts. But fundamental liberties is somewhat unique. And I think when you're talking about the constitution, some judges in the Sharia courts may not fully appreciate the, the, the dynamics of exactly what the rights may be. Uh, you're drawing upon from a number of principles, maybe from a civil background, and maybe even you know, impugning a particular legislation on non-Sharia grounds as well. And, and that's what's presently playing out in Malaysia, to be very candid. Uh, the Singapore experience, uh, and, and if there are any Singapore lawyers, if I'm you know, not speaking correctly about this, by all means, correct me. Um, the Singapore experience is somewhat similar to maybe what the Philippines is going through at the moment. You can effectively impugn the verdict of the Sharia courts in some respects in the civil courts. I, I'm quite comfortable maybe with the, the Malaysian formula, meaning to say if it's constitutional questions, fundamental liberties, maybe you can approach the civil courts. The only question that perhaps remains to be resolved is this. When you say fundamental liberties, fundamental liberties according to what legal system? Yeah? So that is something we haven't quite sort of crossed the bridge. I think so far the courts have been very careful. They've been trying to approach the question um, maybe in a very subject specific way. They have not provided a framework. How do you deal with this? So earlier, I think when I was talking about the Maldives experience, Fundamental liberties exist within the Maldivian constitution in a very uh, unique fashion. Only if, it, if it's not contrary to Islamic law, you have fundamental liberties. So, you know, things like LGBT rights, these are things in Maldives, there's no question, I think. Uh, but within Malaysia, I think it's going to be quite interesting. The debate is ongoing, the dialogue is happening, so we'll see. Okay, so any other question? Last question? Okay, sir. Thank you, Attorney Moderator, for recognizing me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. I am Jamaluddin Dalumimbang, Saria Councilor by profession representing the Philippines Area Lewis League Incorporated. Uh, 
I'm only asking on the application of the divorce by talak as well as on the application of consolatory gifts in your respective countries. Okay, so who wants to ask, who wants to first? Okay, can you make it clear, the question? Uh, I'm only asking on the application of the divorce by talak as well as on the application of consolatory gifts. Because in the Philippines, uh, divorce by talak is a non-adversarial, non-adversarial. That is why if it is a non-adversarial in application in your, in your country, what will be the remedy of the wife? Okay, so it's a, about a divorce by talak. Oh, divorce in by the talak. Philippines, according to him, it's not adversarial. Thank you. In our legal system, every divorce must be officially recorded by, by, by court. Okay. So even the tala still has to be filed to the court. So, uh, uh, but the, the new trend is not by tala, but what you can see, uh, from the uh, female, more and more female are applying for divorce from there. <laughs> but again, in terms of offici officiality, uh, tala divorce cannot be regarded as formal until it is uh, decided by the court. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. Uh, I, I think what's perhaps becoming uh, a little bit clearer is that maybe the practices can differ and sometimes the practices can be common between uh, the various states in Southeast Asia. Um, in Malaysia, if you pronounce talak outside of court, it's actually an offence. So, but it does not mean that you're prohibited from doing so, it's just that it is an offence, you may be charged for it, but the pronouncement is nevertheless taken into account and sort of regularized in court to impact on the the, the marriage, yeah? Um, so it is only, so in that sense, it's similar to Indonesia. It is only when it is uh, accepted by the court as a valid talaq that it has an impact and consequence for the marriage. I, I hope that was, that was clear. Okay, sir, from Egypt. Okay, being the last one to speak in this session, I like this subject very much because I got divorced twice before <laughs> <laughs> so let me tell you I'm familiar with that <laughs> anyway there is um, two questions talak outside the court and talak inside the court so talak outside the court so that I know that the talak outside the court that the uh, the verbal pronunciation of talak itself it would take effect however Due to the fact that just you, you need to to uh, to have the uh, the consent of or the the information informing the society and the legal system, it needs to be uh, written. Why? Because that it's uh, 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 there would be some ensuing rights for the uh, for the wife, and as for the wives, for the the, the divorced woman, so she has. Uh, uh, some rights affected from the date of talaq and in Egypt they have this um, uh, the al muakhar al mahr so the uh, the money the uh, uh, the money just to be paid uh, it's being listed in the contract uh, the contract so just to be paid after talaq and uh, and it's uh, also the salmuta Al muta, the uh, compensation. This muta compensation is is made uh, for. Um, it's agreed upon some like 24, 24 months of each month of al nafaka, and plus she has to get the three months, uh, the three months of the uh, uh, of this uh, nafaka or this maintenance. Uh, uh, the, the maintenance. So this is for al idda three three months of idda This is the period uh, uh, in which the uh, the woman cannot get married. 
this is this is normally this is talaq this is divorce but talaq by the courts i think that it just is not interested anymore sir so it's a, a talaq by the, by the court is totally different because that you are going through first the, uh, 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 the, the, the court to institute the, the complaint, even talaq or khula, because that we have khula as well. So we have to pass through the dispute settlement, the dispute settlement bureau, and they are trying to, uh, uh, the, for the, the recounseling this uh, uh, reconciliation and just trying to find solution for the problem. If not, the proceeding starts. So, but this will be, there, there will be also tatliq, by the court. This is tatliq by the court because of the harm or so, so that the woman would like to have because that there is a, a reasonable grounds for her according to the law or practice that to give her talaq. So I hope that uh, I, I, I give uh, some, uh, uh, some satisfactory answer to this question. If not, I'm ready to continue explaining. Okay, so. Our last question will be from a sister. She's going to voice up. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm Sharia Counselor Siti Ali Alimbao, the uh, current president of the Association of Lady Sharia Counselor at Law of the Philippines, and also from the SEC for Sharia Circuit Court. Um, uh, good afternoon, uh, sir. Um, my first question is to the first speaker. Um, a while ago, you mentioned about uh, innovative means of promoting, enforcing Sharia in your country. Now, my question is, um, how can you uh, uh, how can you use innovative means in promoting or uh, enforcing Sharia without uh, violating Sharia or resulting to bid'ah? So yes. Okay, from the ambassador. Yeah, yes. first, uh, first speaker. Can you repeat the question? Yes, um, you mentioned, sir, about the uh, innovative means in uh, promoting or uh, enforcing Sharia. Now, my question is, how can you uh, promote or inno uh, promote Sharia without violating Sharia or resulting to bid'ah? No, what I mean that in my final remarks is just Sharia may offer innovative solutions to issues. So just not vice versa. So just what um, I mean that, okay, just the understanding Sharia, the, the core of Sharia, and the rationale uh, for which God made the revelations and that uh, uh, instructed us to follow. So this something with the broader understanding and how to adapt this to the society. So we, the Sharia and Sharia, uh, uh, Sharia lawyers, they can offer and contribute to the evolution of new solutions, not vice versa. Mm -hmm. Because it's, I know that it's debatable. It's debatable here so that I don't want to go into controversy because that I, for me, just I have my own, uh, my, my own beliefs also. I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Muslim and I follow, I practice Islam, I fast, I, uh, I pray five times a day, but I have critical thinking, not to the extent regarding the fundamentals of Islam, but about the interpretation of, of, of some aspects and how we adapted not to, stri not to, to, be, to hinder us to, to, from just advancing and progressing and to reflect. And this is exactly what I mean by this incorporation uh, of Sharia law in, uh, in this to make things. And you know, I'm, I'm very sorry, so I, might take, I, I may take two more minutes. So one, one of the things that we are just, we are, we are Muslims uh, um, just could not reflect on ourselves that okay, just we are going to minor issues, minor issues of Sharia about the interpretation because that we have like, Ishtihad, the Ishtihad that has, the, the has been finished 500 years ago. So that if somebody is trying just to have a critical thinking and trying to think, oh, no, 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 that you, you cannot think about that. So this is, I believe that God, Allah in, in Quran, that started with the, the, the first thing came to Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu was iqra. 
read so iqra so this is one hadha quran liqaumin yaqilun yatadabbarun yufakkirun so that's it's all about thinking and critical thinking and making a comparative analysis and and going deeply into that so not to take something like a very very rigid interpretation just coming from a society is different from our society and coming from people they might ex uh, they might have experience so i one of the imams said they are men and we are men so we have to do and the good muslim is trying to study and study about sharia and not only sharia but also about so some other aspects as for example uh, sister so i'm very sorry just you're you're standing so that i don't i don't, I don't want to speak like that so that in surah fatir from the the 24 to 28 we are just talking uh, about uh, god gave us examples about sciences about mountains about uh, the animals and everything and said by the end of that okay so the interpretation of that so it's meaning that okay the so ulama they are they are okay the scientists the scientists it doesn't mean these people the specialist in 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 religious science it's all the uh, people they know because that it's all about the applied laws and the, some some uh, 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 geology and, and some other things yeah because that when they see when they study and they know exactly that there is Allah and this is Allah just with the, the Almighty just created all this but instead of that just we are restricting the the interpretation to these people Ahl al-Zikr Ahl al-Zikr means that okay just doesn't mean that okay it's only Imams <laughs> Ahl al-Zikr that they are a specialist in in the, the the area of science I'm very sorry and I'm, I'm just I'm reflecting my own and I hope that I didn't offend anybody thank you very much thank you very much so that will be our last question let's give our speakers a very big gun Thank okay. you to our esteemed speakers and our moderator for that informative discussion. It is really, really remarkable to learn how Sharia developed in different jurisdictions, creating similarities and differences colored by our individual cultures and experiences. Thank you indeed for that lively exchange. Now we will have a quick health and salah break. We will resume at 3.45. So for the Salah Asar, uh, like what we have, uh, have been having since day one, we will still have our congregational prayers here. Although we note, of course, that uh, many of us here who are travelers uh, have been uh, able to perform our Kasar. But for those who are able, you are invited to join the congregational prayers here, especially our gentlemen friends. Thank you very much. We call on our... Uh, brother to call the prayer. الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله 
أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول
So doon na tayo mag-lunch. Doon na tayo mag-lunch. Kung hindi si Kung hindi man, kung hindi man, si Kung baka matuloy yung hindi dito po.
Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon. Uh, some reminders to our honored guests and participants. Uh, evaluation forms have been distributed to you, um, and we are requesting that you please fill them out and submit them on your way out at our registration tables outside so that you can get your certificates as well. For those who have not yet received the blank forms for the evaluation, kindly uh, inform any of our secretariat members so that you can be given one. So we kindly request you to please fill out these evaluation and feedback form and then submit them on your way out after the program. Thank you very much. We will be resuming in one minute. So I would also like to request everyone to please already settle down and uh, go back to your assigned seats. Thank you. Thank you. 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon and welcome back. We are now resuming with our program. Honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, uh, let us now return to our tables and occupy our seats because we are now starting again and resuming with our program. So earlier, we had the privilege of listening to an esteemed panel of resource persons and discussants, learning from the three jurisdictions, Egypt, Malaysia, and Indonesia, respectively. And it was indeed a lively and very educational one. Uh, once more, thank you very much to our panelists and, of course, our panel moderator, Attorney Malang, as well. So continuing on with part four of our summit, in fact, ladies and gentlemen, we are now going towards the end of our last part for this um, summit. Uh, we will not, uh, however, uh, miss the chance that while we are about to end, uh, that we do not once more talk about the topic of Islamic banking and finance. I know yesterday we had the chance, we had the opportunity to learn about Islamic banking and Islamic finance in the context of the Philippines. But at this point, because we are talking about best practices on Sharia in foreign jurisdictions, we are now privileged and fortunate to have the, the opportunity to listen to the best practices in Islamic banking and finance from uh, jurisdictions outside the Philippines. At this point, I would like to introduce our uh, discussant uh, presenter, no other than Mr. Muhammad Farouk Raza. Let me read the brief profile of uh, Mr. Farouk. So, Mr. Muhammad Farouk Raza is the group CEO of the Islamic Finance Advisory and Assurance Services, also co-founder of IFIN, Islamic FinTech, and chairman of IOFI's Governance and Ethic Board. Farouk enjoys 18 years of extensive and diverse experience in Islamic finance. His contribution involves leading Islamic finance projects across 51 different jurisdictions that include policy-level advisories to the governments of more than 35 countries across four continents, building the infrastructure for Islamic finance and playing key roles in launching groundbreaking Islamic finance operations across several jurisdictions, including in the UK and France. He has led IFAS, the Islamic Finance Advisory and Assurance Services, in various high-profile projects funded by the Islamic Development Bank the Asian Development Bank, the World Bank, International Finance Cooperation, and the UK government's Department for International Depar Development, among others, establishing Islamic finance master plans, strategic blueprints and roadmaps, regulatory and governance frameworks for several countries, including Indonesia, Kenya, Morocco, West Africa, uh, Economic and Monetary Union in eight countries, CIS countries, but the Pakistan, the Philippines, and many more. He is actively contributing towards the industry's thought leadership through his work with the international standard-setting bodies, pushing Islamic finance to a higher degree of Sharia compliance, professionalism, and inclusiveness. His latest venture is in fintech, where he we heard he has co-founded IFIN, an Islamic fintech solution aimed at redefining the Islamic finance industry. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mr. Muhammad Farooq Raza. Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Mabu hai. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Farooq Raza. Um, I'm representing here Asian Development Bank, for whom I work uh, among many other multilateral organizations as an advisor and as a consultant uh, specialized in Islamic finance. Um, as it has been kindly mentioned that I have had the privilege of uh, you know, working in uh, multiple jurisdictions around different regions of the world, and I'm very proud to be one of those people who has contributed in a humble way uh, to uh, the preparation or the ground preparation of uh, Islamic finance in the Philippines as well. So over the last uh, few years, actually since 2019, um, we have been involved uh, heavily with the, the BSP and with the other Philippine stakeholders, uh, you know, providing capacity building workshops and a number of uh, initiatives, uh, you know, to help uh, prepare 
uh, you know, the, the, the local uh, industry, the local resources for Islamic banking and finance in the country. So, um, you know, this is my first time in the CDO. By the way, I have been, uh, you know, coming to Manila regularly before COVID. Since uh, 2020, early 2020, actually it was these days in 2020 when I last visited Manila. And then I didn't know when I la left last time in March 2020 that I will take another three years to come back. So this is my return after COVID first time. And I'm really, really pleased to be here among, uh, you know, my, my Filipino friends. So um, um, <coughs> I'm going to uh, present two things today. So the first section of uh, my presentation is about Sharia in banking and finance. The, here, in this section, I will briefly, because uh, there is limited time, so I will present a brief definition of Sharia, uh, the sources of Sharia, and I think some of these things have already been mentioned. The basic principles of Islamic finance, uh, the definition of riba or interest and its prohibition, uh, we'll talk about some other prohibitions as well that have an effect in Islamic banking and finance. We will do a mapping of uh, Islamic contracts. And then finally, I will present just a s small selected example of uh, you know, some basic processes of Islamic financial structures. Then the next section is about Islamic finance and the Philippine legal and regulatory environment. I know that uh, the deputy governor of the BSP, um, um, attorney Arifa, has presented uh, uh, yesterday, uh, and BSP has done, uh, you know, a beautiful job in, uh, you know, preparing the regulatory framework uh, to facilitate Islamic banking and uh, finance in the country. But there are many other things as well, and how it does actually connect with the Philippine judiciary, and what are the things that are required, you know, for the judiciary to be, uh, you know, ready for, uh, you know, the launch of Islamic finance and banking in the country. So we'll talk about these things. So let's start with the, you know, the definition and the significance of Sharia. So the word Sharia itself is an Arabic word. And the literal meaning of, uh, you know, this word means path, right, a way. Or it also means a water spring. So what it means is the path that is provided to walk upon or, you know, a water spring that provides water and that keeps life going. Right? So this is the concept of Sharia in the Arabic language. Now actually the term um, refers to the way of life or it's a code of conduct for the Muslims. And this has a very, very wide meaning and it defines the, the individual and collective rights and duties, obligations and rituals. Right? So you can imagine that, you know, Sharia encapsulates almost everything that Muslims have to do or not to do in their life, whether it's their personal life, whether it's their professional life, whether it's their community life, or whatever. So all those things that will be coming in, in, in you know, all these aspects will be defined, will be governed by Sharia. That's how important it is for you know for the muslims because this is the code of conduct that they will be using to spend their life now why all this why a sharia is there and this is to provide protection to the sanctity of the society and the individual so it defines the rules the duties and the obligations of what people need to do in their personal life as their as their parents as children as neighbors as citizens of a country, you know, what are their rights and duties towards the state, towards other people, towards community members, towards family members, the inheritance issues. Of course, there are, you know, uh, rituals as well that are included in Sharia. For example, you know, when to pray, how to pray, what do you do when, you know, how to pray when you are traveling like me, for example, and so on and so forth. How will you calculate your zakat, you know, your ritual obligation? How will you pay, who is payable, you know, for that zakat, and so on and so forth. And it goes on and on and on, as you can imagine. And why all this is in place, this is to make sure that the society is, is living peacefully, in harmony, and where everybody gets a fair share of, you know, the benefits of the, of the, the collective benefits of the society. And people are protected. Their properties are protected. Their sanity, their honor is protected. So all this is 
governed by Sharia. So in, you know, usually it's dubbed as Islamic law. This is the simple term. And the understanding of this law in Arabic is called fiqh, right? So it's, uh, you know, the explanation of the, the, the jurisdiction. Now, as I said that, you know, this, uh, the, 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 the presence of Sharia in Islam has certain objectives, right? So the Muslim scholars recognize that the main objectives of Sharia is to promote the well-being of all mankind. And this is very you know, important. Sharia is not only for Muslims, it is actually helping the non-Muslims as well. It may not be applicable to non-Muslims, yes, but the objectives of Sharia are for everyone. The benefits of Sharia are for everyone. And this is to you know, ensure the well-being of all mankind and also beyond, meaning that it also includes things, you know, to do with the, the environment, for example, right? How we need to behave with our resources. How do we exploit the resources that have been given to us? How do we do, you know, how we ensure sustainability and so on and so forth. How to create justice and uphold justice in the society. So there are five things that have been recognized as, you know, the, the, the key pillars of any society to be preserved. If we want all this, if we want a harmony and well-being of the whole society, then these are the five things that need to be preserved. So first and the foremost is, of course, faith, right? So the faith needs to be preserved. The second one is the soul, the sanctity of the, the life, human life, and all sorts of life. So that needs to be preserved. Intellect. So we have to preserve the intellect. We have to make sure that people, society are you know, you're acting in a way, they're thinking in a way that is actually good and that does not cause harm to, you know, themselves as individuals, to the people around them, and in the, you know, to the environment that they are living in. And then, of course, we have to preserve the lineage as well. The continuity of the human race, the continuity of family, having a nuclear, you know, society with a nuclear family is very important from Sharia point of view. How do we ensure that? and how do we preserve the lineage. And finally, of course, you know, preserving the wealth as well. So wealth also is important, and it's the, it's, the, it's the creation of wealth. How do we create wealth? How do we you know, distribute that wealth? And how do we spend that wealth, right? So all these matters will be governed by Sharia. And again, as I said, this is the, so the primary beneficiary of this and the people who are subject to the applicability of Sharia are Muslims, but the beneficiary is the wider society because when there is sanctity, when there is protection for individual, eventually there is protection for society. When there is a preservation of lineage, preservation of faith, preservation of uh, intellect and wealth, then everybody is a beneficiary of that. So we move on. Now where does this Sharia come from? Next slide, please. So the sources of Sharia are two categories. So the first one, and that has been, uh, uh, you know, uh, briefly mentioned in the session before as well, where, uh, you know, uh, uh, the excellencies the and the ambassadors and, uh, you know, other academics were discussing. The, the Quran, the word of God or the book of Allah, you know, that's the, the you know, the sacred book for, for uh, the Muslims that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, just like the Bible that was re revealed to the Holy Prophet, Jesus, peace be upon him, right? So Quran is the, you know, the foundation of Sharia. The second layer of, you know, th this part, the primary source, is also what we call in Arabic, Sunnah. And Sunnah is the word that was spoken by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and any tacit approvals that he have, has provided, any acts that he has done during his life. All that is recorded, documented, and these are the two primary sources of Sharia. The Quran, that's the word of God, and Sunnah, the word and the acts of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now what's important here, that these primary sources, they are static, they do not change. And there is a reason for that. The Quran, was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that revelation has finished. So no more revelation, no change in the world. So since its revelation, since its descent, 
the Quran has been maintained, the whole text of Quran has been maintained word by word, letter by letter, dot by dot. No change at all whatsoever. And nobody has right to change it. Also, the sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, was related to him. It was his spoken word, it was his act. As he is no longer in this world, so of course those acts or those words, they cannot be changed now. They cannot be reversed, they cannot be amended. So these parts of Sharia, the sources of Sharia, they remain static and they, you know, serve as the foundation of, you know, the, the, the entire Sharia and the, you know, the, the, the ecosystem of Sharia. Now there are secondary, you know, sources of Sharia as well and these are dynamic and this is the beauty of Sharia. There is the foundation is static that provides all the basic argument and it provides, you know, the, 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 the logic of, you know, deriving you know, uh, uh, decisions from there onwards in order to correspond, in order to respond to the changing needs of time. For example, you know, there is this interpretation or ijtihad and that is, you know, when qualified scholars of Sharia who have, you know, certain level of knowledge and, you know, experience and, and you know, they have the, the, the right, the, the, you know, to, to do ijtihad or to do an interpretation of the static sources, of the primary sources of Sharia, and they come up with new decisions, right? This can be, for example, in today's day, you know, whether tobacco or, you know, smoking, is it acceptable or prohibited from Sharia point of view, right? How it will be defined? The use of stem cell technology in human life, is it permissible or not permissible? So things like that will be addressed by qualified scholars who will be able to do that. For example, you know, in today's day and age, you know, one of the examples that I have quoted here is when somebody has to make a payment, they delay the payment, that they default, what happens? We, ap we apply late payment charges. These late payment charges, are they applicable from Sharia point of view or not? If yes, then are there any certain conditions that will be related to them? How will they will be processed? How they will be recorded? How they will be accounted? And what will be the end result of, you know, that, that charging of late interest, late uh, payment charge? Similarly, there is also this analogy or kiyas, and that is, for example, you know, the drugs that did not exist in the, in the, in the old times, in the times of the Prophet uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, the, the consumption of those drugs today. Is it permissible? Not permissible. How do we, you know, address this issue? And so on. And then finally, there is also the concept of ijma, the consensus of, you know, the contemporary scholars on a certain you know, subject on a certain topic, for example, in banking and finance, we do a forward sale, right? So is forward sale possible or not possible? Whether, you know, it's uh, related to certain conditions, you know, are there any certain provisions to be made, you know, for a forward sale? So this is how the Sharia sources will be used in order to, uh, you know, derive decisions from a Sharia point of view in order to define certain things in order to do interpretations and this is very important for you know when it comes to the judiciary to understand the sources and the the you know the significance uh, of uh, you know these sources to be aware that how you know the decisions can be made and shall be made in you know in when it's something related to sharia now some of the basic principles of islamic finance the first and the foremost is allah or God is the owner of all forms of wealth. Everything that we see in this world actually belongs to Allah. He is the creator and he is the owner of all these things. Humans are the custodians of this wealth. So we have been given these sources of wealth. We have given, given the authority to exploit you know, these resources for our benefit, individual benefit, collective benefit but we are answerable for them. Because when we are custodians, so of course we do not have a full right, we have a limited right. So we have the limited right of exploitation, but we are, we are liable as well, and we are also answerable. What did we do? So how we ensured sustainability? What have we left for our you know, coming generations? Were we just in our you know, dealings and so on and so forth? Then also, the concept of money in Islam as well. So money itself, is not actually a commodity. Money is a medium of exchange. So from Sharia point of view, we cannot treat money as a commodity that I own, that I loan to someone, that brings me benefit. It's just a medium of exchange and a measure to quantify 
you know, the, 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 the price of something or the cost of something, the value of something. But it's not that object itself, you know, that will be precious or, you know, that will have an intrinsic value. How can the money grow? The money can grow only through investment or through creation from entrepreneurship, from work, and, you know, if, of course, if you have capital, then you can deploy that capital, but only in a certain way. And that way does not include investing it in, on interest. So we cannot pay or charge interest. And in investment, when we do the investment with that money, there will be inherently a risk of, you know, um, uh, there, there will be risk and there will be reward, and that needs to be shared. So this is not only, you know, for the capital provider, who will take the benefit, who will, you know, take all the reward, and the risk will be borne by, you know, the borrower. No, there is, you know, there is lending and borrowing relationship in Sharia, but it has very different meaning, and we'll talk about that in a, in a, in a bit later. So the majority of the transactions, they are actually structured in a way that there is a financier, and then there is, you know, the, the beneficiary of that finance, and how, what's the relationship between them, how they are going to work together, how they are going to share that risk and reward, you know, these are the primary things that we need to consider when doing an Islamic finance transaction. So the key features of Islamic finance, you know, as I said, you know, there, they have, uh, you know, there has to be transparency, there has to be clarity, there has to be justice, there has to be, you know, principle and so on. So there is a set of ethical guidelines with a focus on fairness and justice. So all these things are very, very important to be fair, to be transparent, and to be just in all transactions and in all dealings between people. Also, there is a concept of, you know, as I said, there is lending and borrowing in Islam, but that lending and borrowing has a completely different meaning in Sharia. This is not the ordinary lending and borrowing that we hear or we come across in our daily life. Why? Because this is based on a concept of Kard Hassan. Kard Hassan means you know, a beneficial loan. So it is a loan. As a Muslim, I can lend money to someone. I can borrow money from someone. This is perfectly fine, legitimate. However, when I do a loan transaction, whether giving or taking from someone, I do not have the right to charge anything over and above the loan amount. So the principal amount needs to be paid back in its integrity, but nothing else, nothing over and above can be returned, right? So this is where the relationship becomes completely different and there are more details as well to which I don't have time, unfortunately. So we can do this and why it's called the, you know, the, the beautiful or the beneficiary, beneficial loan? Because this is usually not, you know, meant to be helping people, you know, with the, uh, uh, you know, uh, growing their business. We can, of course, you know, give them for growing their business, but usually it's when people are in need, you know, somebody has a need that they need to meet, and instead of charging them interest to exploit that need, we give them this loan, and this is without any charge, and we, you know, we, we cannot have any return for this loan. So that's why it's helping out someone in their need that makes it the beneficial loan, right? And there is also, you know, the concept of uh, zakat, which is, you know, paying 2.5%, 2.5% 2, 2 of your, you know, overall worth, subject to certain conditions, and also sadaqa, which is, you know, almsgiving, right? So all these things are very important from Sharia point of view when it comes to money, when it comes to finance and banking as well. So if we implement all these things in principle, the result shall be that, you know, the, the, the society will have peace, we will have created if we implement this correctly, and if we practice it, you know, adequately, then we will have created peace and harmony in the society where everybody gets a fair share of wealth and people support each other in a constructive way, right? So this is more collaborative, this is more, uh, you know, transparent, and this is more uh, I wouldn't call it everybody gets an equal share. No, it's not equal share, but a fair share of the wealth, right? So these are the, you know, the mechanisms and zakat is, for example, is one of them is to uplift those who are, you know, the, uh, at the bottom of the, of the society because of, uh, you know, the, their lack of resources. So how do we uplift them and how do we give them a chance? This is by paying two and a half percent of your wealth 
and that those people will be the beneficiaries. So we move on. The, the major prohibition in Sharia. Next slide, please. So the, the major prohibition in Sharia is on interest. That we define, as, you know, in Arabic it's called riba. And riba is, it can be interest. We may call it usury as well. But the literal meaning of the word riba is excess or in addition. Meaning, any money that is charged over and above the principal, right? Where that is subject to a pre-agreement. Now, in practice, there are two types of, of riba. So there is a specific surplus received during a direct exchange of two elements of the same nature. For example, gold for gold, you know, money for money, currencies, dates, wheat, etc., and so on. And then there is the most, you know, uh, uh, prominent one is the second one, which is surplus attached to a debt. So whenever there is a debt, now that that can be in form of a loan, that debt can be in form of a, a, you know, a payable, for example, a receivable, where the surplus payment was an explicit or implicit condition. So it's not about the principal amount or the principal price of the object, but it's actually the over and above of the, 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 you know, the price, the actual price, or the, you know, the, the, the principal amount of loan. So any additional time that is granted for the payment of a debt cannot generate additional you know, income. For example, if the, you know, the, the payment terms is uh, you know, three months, and if three months uh, pass and you know, the, the loan is still outstanding, we cannot increase anything. So even if it's a fixed price, we cannot increase because any increase in, in the price or in the debt will be construed as interest or it will, it will be haram. So, you know, riba is a, a topic that we can go on for, uh, you know, for hours and hours and hours. But obviously now the time is very restricted. So I'm going to just uh, pass on, uh, you know, with the concluding this topic of riba with the wisdom of prohibition. So why riba or interest is prohibited? To prevent concentration of wealth in the hands of the few. Now we know that people with the capital, with the money, they will get richer and richer with the interest. This is a known fact. You know, this is not, uh, you know, something that nobody knows. It's a, it's a known fact. And then also, the economic disparity between the rich and the poor, it continues to grow, or at best, it cannot be, you know, bridged. So, the prohibition of riba actually helps managing that economic disparity between the rich and the poor of the society. And then promoting trade and investment in the economy instead of earning interest. So, you know, the main, uh, there are, you know, uh, quite a few verses of the Holy Quran that refer to the prohibition of, of uh, riba. But the primary one where the, the, you know, the prohibition actually came was when Allah says in the second chapter of the Quran, riba," And Allah made, I mean, we made um, uh, trade, uh, you know, permissible, and we prohibited interest. Now, there are two messages here. First, of course, is prohibition of interest. So we are not allowed to charge or to pay interest as Muslims. But there is a second message as well. And one, why, what is that? Allah has made halal. Allah has permitted trade, right? So what does it mean that an Islamic economy shall be based, it shall be founded on the basis of trade, right? And trade will include, of course, all sorts of, uh, you know, economic activities that generate, you know, real money, real economy. So that will include entrepreneurship, that will include manufacturing, that will include services, that will include, you know, so many different things. But that is the genuine creation of wealth from you know, from your work, from the use of sources that you have, not only money. So this is the primary difference between, you know, the, 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 the approach that the Sharia has towards economy and, you know, the conventional approach that we see in, in the world. So as I said already to, you know, to, to find, finalize, conclude this point, that Sharia is trying here and in its overall approach, general approach, to create peace, harmony, and justice in the society that shall be created that shall be upheld throughout the times and this is 
the responsibility of each member of the society, individuals, and of course, you know, the collective, you know, uh, uh, organizations, etc., and the governments that are in place. And this peace and harmony that the Sharia aims to create that can be compromised due to the unrest that is caused by the, you know, the interest. And we see that, you know, Philippines is one of those countries, and there are many other examples as well. And there are, you know, so many cases that we see where interest is causing harm to people. Now, the prohibition of riba is not the only prohibition in Sharia. There are other things also that are also prohibited. And they have a very significant impact on the financial transactions. The way, you know, financial transactions are structured, they are conducted in Sharia. One of them, and this is the Arabic term called gharar, and the, the literal meaning of gharar is to deceive or to cheat. And it can be also seen or it can be also interpreted as uncertainty or excessive ambiguity, right? So this can be associated with the subject matter, for example, the type or the specification or the quality or the quantity, you know, the payment terms, etc., and all that. So these can be, you know, the, the, the lack of transparency or the lack of clarity in any transaction can, you know, result into disputes, into conflicts, and anything, and this is, this is a very important point that I'm going to share with you, that anything that leads or that has the potential to lead towards conflict or towards dispute or towards litigation is not preferred by Sharia. It will be either prohibited or it will be seriously discouraged because this is against the general philosophy of creating peace and harmony. So we have to make sure that we minimize, we minimize, you know, the possibility, the potential of, you know, anything leading towards litigation, towards dispute and towards conflict. Uh, an example of prevention of, uh, you know, gharar in Sharia is in today's world what we see as consumer protection, right? So the consumer protection laws are actually doing sort of same thing that the Sharia is trying to do, which is making things clear to the customer, you know, helping them make an informed decision. This is very much actually akin to Sharia approach. Then also, uh, jahala, the ignorance, you know, that may be a cause of gharar as well. Then also, khimar, or any form of excessive speculation, right? So again, many of the financial transactions today, unfortunately, they fall into this category. Obviously, we are not uh, talking about a casino here, but normal financial transactions or a bit more sophisticated financial transactions, they are based on, you know, a lot of speculation. And this is something that is not allowed in Sharia because again, it creates, you know, disparity, it creates, uh, you know, uh, uh, what we say, you know, the, the, the potential of conflict and, and potential of loss of one party at the expense of the other as well. So any form of misrepresentation, any undertaking, you know, uh, of haram activity, for example, dealing in alcohol, pork, pornography, etc., and so on and so forth, uh, any form of exploitation, any unfairness, you know, within a transaction or within, uh, you know, any uh, agreement in contract, is all forbidden. So they are not allowed from a Sharia point of view. Now another very important restriction is actually on the sale of debt, meaning that we cannot sell debt as a commodity. What we see in the, in the conventional financial uh, you know, markets is that there is a lot of sell, a lot of, of you know, selling of debt. So the debt is packaged, it's sold under name of securities, it can be sold under name of you know, different you know, uh, terms and so on and so forth. This is prohibited in Sharia. And this makes a huge difference and it makes Islamic finance and banking very different from the conventional finance that we know. And this is because, again, you know, it's, it's to protect and it's to minimize the, you know, the, 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 the chances or the potential of, uh, you know, creating conflict and, uh, you know, disparity and uh, unfairness within, within the, you know, the, the, the society. So the, the debt can be transferred it can be also sold if you want, but it should be on par. Anything over and above or less than you know, the receivable is not allowed. So this will set apart Islamic finance and banking completely from conventional as well. And then also you know, any double sale as well. So these are you know, the prohibitions uh, that we have to observe while structuring and conducting Islamic financial transactions. 
Now I'm going to do a quick mapping of uh, Islamic uh, you know, contracts that are commonly used in uh, you know, Islamic finance. So uh, unlike uh, you know, conventional finance where the majority of the contracts are based on you know, lending and borrowing and, and charging and paying of interest, um, you know, uh, Sharia offers a much wider range of uh, you know, different contracts that can be used to structure Islamic financial products and these structures can be very different from one to the other. So the variation between them and their objectives and the way they work is completely different. So for example, the most common ones, next slide please, are the exchange contracts. And here you say that's an exchange, that means sale, right? So there are six different forms of sale that have been you know, recognized in Sharia. These agreements are there. They are being used uh, you know, in obviously normal, you know, everyday, you know, trading and economic activity, but they are also used as the, as the underlying agreements for, uh, you know, uh, for, you know, the financial transactions as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going into, into the details, unfortunately, due to the, you know, uh, the, the, the lack of time. Next slide, please. So the next one, please, are the usufruct con contracts. So this is more like lease. Please keep going. Thank you. So there is ijara. Ijara is lease, and it can and it has many variations as well. So there can be limited ijara, unlimited ijara. You know there can be defined and undefined and so on and so forth. There is operational ijara. There is financial ijara and so on. So there are different variations as well. Next one, please. And you know they, you have kard as well. Then the next one is partnership contract. Now this is something that is very unique to Islamic finance and it doesn't exist generally in conventional finance. Um, this is where, sorry, go back, go back please. This is, uh, you know, where a partnership concept is applied to financial transaction, where capital can be mixed with capital or capital can be mixed with, you know, with, uh, with work capital can be mixed with land and so on and so forth in order to achieve different objectives. So these you know, contracts, they are also very widely used and they make you know, Islamic banking and finance very different from conventional again. Next please. The next set of contracts is the service contracts. These service contracts, uh, you know, they will have Vakala, which is like an agency agreement, and Juala, also two forms of service contract. Next, please. And then we have security contracts, including Kafala and Rahan. So Rahan is like a pledge, and Kafala is guarantee. So we can do all these type of things as well. Now, very quickly, I'm going to take, I, I have already received the, the notification from the moderator but uh, I will just request to, to bear with me because this is important. So next slide, please. Now, this is an illustration. I'm just going to give you illustrations of four different structures. And this is very, very high level and very basic, very rudimentary, but this is just to give you an idea and try to look at it from a legal point of view. The, what does it mean? So a murabha is a cost plus profit margin sale, right? Now, how do we use it as a financial contract? So the customer requests to buy a car and promises to purchase it from the bank for an agreed price. So technically, the customer is wanting to you know, have a car finance. So they are effectively looking for a car loan. An Islamic bank or an Islamic window of a conventional bank would not be able to give money so that the customer can go and buy the car. So what instead they will do, next click please, that the bank, instead of extending a loan, the bank will purchase the car. So the bank will actually purchase the car from the showroom, from the dealer, and once they have that car in their possession, next click please, the bank will offer to sell the car on murabha basis, meaning the cost that they have purchased for, plus the bank's profit margin, and they will make an offer to sell to the customer. If the customer accepts, the customer can have immediate delivery of the car, but they will agree on a payment schedule. So the price will be fixed, 
and there will be a payment schedule, so the customer is paying over time in installments, and that will conclude the Murabha sale, meaning that the customer will pay the fixed price in installments on the payments date agreed upon by the parties, right? So this is how a car will be financed, not through a loan, but through a sale, which will effectively include the bank has to buy an asset, and the bank has to sell that asset onwards to the customer, meaning it will trigger a number of things. For example, first of all, starting the bank's own statute. So the bank is acting more like a trader, less than a bank, right? So the bank needs a regulation or a, or a license to purchase an asset, which may not be possible in certain you know, regulations, and then they have to sell it. When they sell it, it comes with a number of you know, things that we need to consider when doing a sale, right? If the customer defaults, then what happens? How, you know, if, the, if, the, if the, the customer doesn't pay on time, what happens to the fixed price and so on? So there are a number of things that we need to consider. Again, unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into details, but these things are important from a legal point of view because that if there is a default case, if there is a, a, a problem with the car you know, that was uh, you know, sold by the bank, then the case may come to the court. How the court is going to, to interpret this and how the court is going to, uh, you know, to, to, to give a uh, you know, decision on this is something for the judiciary to consider. The next one is a jara, and that's lease. And this is where the customer promises the bank to lease a specified machine. So uh, uh, imagine that there is a, as an SME, a small or medium enterprise, or even a corporate. They want to buy equipment. It can be anything, like Philippine Airline. They want to buy airplanes, right? Or it can be a manufacturing unit that wants to buy some equipment. So the bank will purchase the machine from the supplier. So again, the bank is not extending the loan here. The bank purchases the, you know, the equipment, and then the bank offers to lease the machine for an agreed rent you know, and, and, and lease term. So they will keep the ownership of the, of, of the equipment, the machinery, you know, with the bank. It will stay as an asset on the bank's books, and it will be you know, that the usufruct of the, of the machine will be transferred to the, you know, to, 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 to the customer. And then the customer will pay the periodic rent for the duration of the term lease. So throughout this, this term, the machinery remains the property of the bank. And you know, until the bank either will take, by the end of the term, the bank will take back the machinery, or it will gift it to the, you know, to the customer. Or they may have a residual price you know, that they may just pay and settle. So again, you know, this is something that you will not see a lot in conventional financing, because this is, again, not a loan. This is a completely different type of structure. The third one, next slide please, is a musharaka, and that's a capital partnership. Now this is where we have you know, two different contributors, and it can be more, and each one of them has contributed a certain amount or a certain percentage of capital, right? And that creates the musharaka or the, you know, the, the, the partnership. The, the musharaka capital, the, the collected capital, is invested in a project which could be anything. Of course, it has to be Sharia compliant. Next click, please. And then there is profit that is generated by the project. The profit is distributed. Next slide, please. next click, please. So the profit that is distributed is divided between the, you know, the partners, the capital partners, in accordance with their you know, share in the equity or anything that is pre-agreed. Now, what if there is a loss? Because there is no guarantee of capital and there is no guarantee of profit here as well. So it's a project. It may you know, generate profit. It may you know, lead to losses as well. Next click, please. So if there are losses, those losses also to be, next click, please, you know, shared between the partners. Now, this means that such financial transaction, which could be you know, between two individuals, it could be between two banks, it can be between a bank and uh, you know, uh, 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 a business, it can be you know, so many different things and ways and forms. That means that there is a possibility of loss, right? And how do we address this loss and how do we address all these things? You know, this is again uh, you know, a very important agreement for the court to understand and to be in a position actually to interpret correctly and to you know, give decision in accordance. Next slide, please. The next one again very important and this is called mudarba which is uh, you know an association or a partnership of capital and work right 
Now here it's different because there is an investor, the capital provider, and there is an entrepreneur or a fund manager, right? And you know the 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 hundred percent of the capital is provided by the capital provider. Just you know all of that, and there can be multiple investors as well. And the manager or the entrepreneur is not providing any capital. They are just providing their expertise, you know, the work that they will be doing, right? And that will create the investment project that may produce results, which again can be positive or negative. So if positive, meaning that there is a profit, then that profit has to be distributed between both of them. You know, they need to be allocated in accordance with a pre-agreed ratio, right? And if there is, uh, you know, uh, a, a negative result, meaning that the project, you know, renders losses instead of, uh, uh, you know, profit, then 100% of the financial loss has to be borne by the investor. Of course, you know, the manager or the entrepreneur, you know, they will be losing their time, they will be losing their work, their effort, and of course, you know, the, their prospective, uh, you know, share of the profit as well. But, you know, the 100% of the financial loss is actually borne by the, you know, by the investor. Now, this is again something which is very, very common and it's, uh, you know, in, in Islamic finance and it sets apart Islamic finance from conventional finance by miles, right? And this is something that is used by, uh, you know, the Islamic banks and the conventional banks offering Islamic, uh, you know, windows. Again, this is something that requires a lot of understanding and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, what we should we say, good governance because there is a, you know, a, a probability of moral hazard here. What if the entrepreneur, he is negligent? What if they do not fulfill their, you know, or, or you know, if there is a gross misconduct from their side? So if there are losses, who will you know, bear that, those losses and how they will be distributed? How the profit is being calculated? How the profit is being posted actually in the respective accounts and so on and so forth? So this requires a different approach. This requires a different type of governance. So all these things have a very serious meaning when it comes to the legality of these contracts and these, these products. Now, not to uh, you know, uh, make it scary you know, for, for everyone, these products have existed for centuries. Um, the only difference now in today's day and age and in the old times is that now the industry is highly regulated. And of course, it's more institutionalized and there are a number of uh, uh, you know, uh, regulations and uh, you know, uh, practices, uh, you know, industry practices in place. So that's why it's, uh, I think, a little bit more challenging. But over the last 30, 40, 50 years, these products have been launched. They have been, you know, widely practiced throughout the world in different jurisdictions. I come from the UK. I traveled from London yesterday. Uh, you know, London has six Islamic banks. London has, uh, you know, England has more than, I think, 25 Islamic banks, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, sorry, uh, conventional banks offering Islamic services and so on. So these are common and these are, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, very, very widespread now. Now, next slide, please, quickly. So the potential issues, just get the text, please. Thank you. So the potential issues uh, can be divided into two parts here. Th this is from, you know, what I see from a dispute point of view. So the substantive issues, they, you know, uh, include interpretation of Sharia principles, the validity of contracts and Sharia compliance. I just gave you a few examples. The default breach of contract or non-payment, the asset ownership and sharing of profit and loss, and any cases of fraud, negligence, mistake, and gharar. So this is just a very high level set of considerations that the judiciary may have when it comes to, you know, any dispute resolution regarding Islamic financial products and services. Then there may be some procedural issues as well. For example, the jurisdiction of courts, compulsory and, you know, voluntary arbitration, and the conflict of laws due to legal pluralism. Now, I'm going to skip this uh, fast. Skip this fast, please. Uh, there is also a snapshot of the legislative and regulatory amendments to date. Uh, there are a number of things, you know, n certain laws have been passed. Next, please, keep going. Um, Banco Central, uh, Filipinas has uh, done, uh, you know, a, a great job in bringing, you know, the circulars, in bringing the regulatory reforms and so on and so forth to, 
uh, facilitate you know, Islamic banking and finance in the country. Similarly, the Bureau of Internal Revenue uh, and you know, some other uh, uh, you know, entities have also brought a number of things in place. So the, the, the good thing here in the Philippines is that a lot of groundwork has been done already. And thanks to Asian Development Bank's uh, technical and financial support, and due to the, you know, the, 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 the exemplary engagement of the stakeholders, primarily you know, the, 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 the BSP, and others as well, I think we are in a position now that the Philippines you know, financial markets are ready for Islamic banking and Islamic finance. And we are hoping to see uh, you know, a, an increasing number of uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the players joining the market. Now, the last uh, you know, part of my presentation is about the yeah, the issue of readiness of Philippine judiciary for Islamic financial, you know, finance launch in the country. So, first of all, having the awareness and capacity at all levels. This is very important. Dispute resolution mechanism shall be there. Now, there can be different ways and forms. You know, there may be specialized courts. There may be use of amicus curiae in the education process. Or there may be empowerment of the central Sharia supervisory board. So there is no right or wrong here. This is something for the authorities to, you know, to decide. And there is time for that as well. So we are not saying that this is something super urgent and it needs to be done right now. But this is something for reflection and something you know, for uh, the authorities to come up with to make sure that you know, a mechanism is in place when you know, these issues arise, they can be dealt with adequately. Then the development guideline of guidelines on the interpretation and application of Sharia principles. And to that end, we hope that uh, the BSP will soon adopt IOFI standards. IOFI is uh, you know, a standard setting body in Islamic finance. So those standards, they will be very helpful in building the capacity within uh, you know, the, 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 the judicial system and making sure that there is a standardization of the products. And then recognizing the primary administrative jurisdiction of Sharia advisory councils or the institutional Sharia boards and that is using you know, the existing doctrine of primary jurisdiction in uh, the Philippine law. And then finally, amendment of existing special ADR rules or development of special ADR rules for Islamic commercial disputes. Now, what's important, and this is, I think, the key message that I have for you today is, next slide, please, is the assistance available. So it's obvious that there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the judicial side in order for this readiness to be there. And the good news is, and this is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of ADB, Asian Development Bank, that there is technical and financial assistance available for that, okay? So, we can help you with capacity building of you know, the judiciary. There is also a facilitation of forum and collaboration, and that is helping the judiciary build relationships with their counterparts in other countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, Turkey, you know, etc. the UK, where Islamic finance has existed much longer, where it has, you know, uh, actually developed already, and also technical assistance, you know, in order to set up any frameworks or any things that may be required. So all this help is available, and it's now up to the, you know, the, the Philippine judiciary to, uh, you know, to guide Asian Development Bank that what help and how this assistance can be provided in, you know, in, in what way and form and we are happy to hear you and to provide you with this uh, facility, inshallah. With that, I would like to thank you very much, and especially the moderator for uh, uh, giving me some extra minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Muhammad Farooq Raza, for that engaging discussion on Islamic banking and financial systems. We are now ready to entertain questions from the audience, if there are some, about the best practices in Sharia. Oh, yes. Your Excellency. Uh, the, the, please have it. Uh, attorney Nasser, you are recognized. Uh, huh? Thank you, thank you. I, 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 um, I am Attorney Nasser Marom Salik, um, former Commissioner of Human Rights. Founding member of the Philippine Center for Islam and Democracy, and presently a regular member, commissioner of the National Amnesty Commission. Now, before my appointment to NAC, to the National Amnesty Commission, 
I was a conservator of the Philippine Public School Teachers Association, a mutual benefit association, membered by more than 200 Philippine Public School Teachers Association, the bulk of, the bulk of which are public school teachers from BARM. Its capital consists of contributions from the public school teachers of association given by way of membership dues. And this association grants loan to the members and an interest is charged. But this interest is way, way less than that imposed by commercial banks. But, it's, but that is still an interest, whatever that means. It also renders uh, civic services to the teachers, granting their, their, te their children um, scholarship grants and other basic services, including calamity loans, which bear no interest. One day, my loan manager, who is a Maranao Muslim, came to me and complained, rather tender his resignation. And he told me, sir, I will, uh, I'm resigning because according to conservatives, Olama from Lanao, that our job has, uh, that we are engaged in RIDA, RIBA. And I was surprised. I said, I am not an, I am not a member of the ulama, but I know something about riba. I also co consulted ulama, and I say, I, and I prevented him from resigning. We are not sitting here, because according to people I consulted who are also ulama, he told us that this kind of riba is permissible in some jurisdiction in the Muslim world, because the riba here given on interest loan to, re, to regular members, goes back to the treasury, to the capital of the PPSTA company. So and it is, the question, it, and it is flowed back to regular members by way of loans with other privileges like the grants of loans, etc. The riba here is permissible because nobody is pocketing the interest. And this interest goes back to regular members. So this is not, this is not a riba. So I would like to ask for, for your opinion on, on this, because reading your, listening to your lecture, you said about Mubaraba. Oh, and I was thinking, this is a kind of Murada, Mur Murabah. Muradaba, or a variant of Muradaba, mm -hmm. which is permissible under Islamic law. So my question to you, sir, thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, <clears throat> I'm afraid that, uh, you know, I'm not in a position to change the definition of riba or amend the prohibition of riba as it has been clearly stated in the Quran and it has been explained in detail in the Sunnah and the Hadith of the Prophet This is part of the, and that's why I described the sources of Sharia and, you know, explain where they are coming from and which one of them is static and which one of them is dynamic. Now, this is a very static definition and it cannot be changed. And regardless of the interpretation, regardless of, you know, the guidance provided, you know, by whoever, the scholars or whatnot, and regardless of the practices in a certain place, the prohibition of riba still remains there. And unfortunately, what you have described to me, and I have heard it carefully, that falls exactly under the definition of riba, and this is not permissible. So this is very clear. This is in black and white, and unfortunately, we cannot do anything about it. What we can do is to restructure, you know, the services that you are providing, that you are talking about, 
they can be restructured using Islamic principles. That's very much possible. So if someone expects that you know, the current practice is labeled as permissible, then that's not going to happen. But what can happen is that we can replace the current practice with a different one, and that practice or that structure or that scheme can be in compliance with, the, you know, with Sharia, and that will be permissible. So you may be able to get exactly or even more or better objectives by you know, replacing it with, with an Islamic structure. That's very much possible, and we can do that. Thank you. But I just like to highlight that the interest charge is way, way below than the... the, the it doesn't matter. The, and also, the interest does not go to anybody, but only to the members. No, it, it doesn't and matter. And by way of loans, and also by way of other civic services. Thank you, sir. And I hold uh, my position clearly. It's not permissible. And under this process, you, we were able to rehabilitate the company, and now it is earning 500 million a year. And it has up 7 billion uh, uh, assets. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, I still hold my position very clearly. This is not permissible. The company is maybe earning 500 million. Uh -huh. That 500 million or even more may be earned in a Sharia compliant way. That is very much possible. And we are here to help you in doing that if you need. But we cannot change the status of the company. That remains, uh, you know, prohibited, unfortunately. I mean, thank you very much, thank sir. You, sir. Thank uh, you, sir. Thank anyway, you, sir. Anyway, I resign. Anyway, okay. uh, I, I lifted the conservatorship, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you, sir. Thank you, Attorney Nasser. So let's move on to the next question. Uh, before going to the next question, just a reminder, sir, please go straight to your question and please be as concise as possible. Thank you. Uh, uh, Prof. James, you're required. Okay, my name is Jamel Kayamudin. Uh, I'm a professor at the uh, Universal Center for Islamic Arab Canadian Studies at uh, Midland Washington hear. University. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for a very good uh, lecture, uh, Dr. Raza. Uh, this, this question is very related to that question. Uh, in the literature, uh, one of the big intellectual conflicts that took place in the fields of Islamic <laughs> economics, or Islamic banking and finance is the conflicting views between the neo-revivalist and the modernist Muslim economies on the type of loans allowed in Islam or for Muslims, whether consumption loan or production loan. Now, in your experience and study of Islamic economics and Islamic banking and finance, do you believe or subscribe to any of these two groups of Muslim economists pertaining to the views of loans and why? Because I believe that this um, uh, issue or concern is very much useful or beneficial to Muslims, especially minority Muslims, when, uh, including the Philippines, where um, almost every money lending institutions are actually interest based. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if uh, I 100% you know, understood your question due to you know, um, audibility issues. Uh, but I'll try to explain or answer the question as I understood it. So extending loans, uh, you know, under a government scheme or for, you know, for, for you know, the benefit of certain segments or groups of the society is possible, but there should be no charge on that loan. Now, where that loan comes from, that's a different thing. There may be a possibility of, you know, de de you know de uh, developing a scheme from the government, that may be the federal government or the regional government, and then that, you know, those loans may be extended to, you know, certain parties and to certain groups and so on and so forth. This is very much possible, but it will very much depend on, you know, how the scheme is, is structured and what's the, uh, the ultimate objective. There is alternative of financing some activities. For example, if, you know, loans are required for uh, the rehabilitation of, uh, you know, the victims of tsunami, for example, or, you know, victims of earthquake, you know, just for example, that is very much possible that, you know, uh, interest-free loans are extended to them, no charge, nothing, and then people repay, you know, those, and, you know, the funds are provided by the government or by certain authorities. But there are also possibilities of scenarios like, for example, uh, you know, helping small entrepreneurs to start up their businesses, right? And this is where a different approach can be taken, where the, you know, the authorities, the government, 
either directly or through a certain you know organization or certain entity that may exist or that may be created they provide funds and those funds are provided on partnership basis like musharaka or mudaraba or other things as well you know for example we can do there are so many multiple you know possibilities that we can do and that money is provided not as a loan but as a finance and that helps them you know set up their business grow their business become financially independent start creating employment so you know start paying taxes to the government so they become productive citizens and then part of you know the the, the fruit of of their you know their work and their you know the the product of you know that financing can be also returned to the government entity you know in form of a share of the profit so all this is very much possible and it can easy, be easily structured my question is about the views of the neo revivalist and modernist because that question actually was under that conflicting uh, opinions of these two groups of muslim economists well there can be different interpretations and that's why it's important and i think this is a you know a, a point for uh, the supreme court to note here is that the the interpretation of sharia principles is extremely important and this becomes critical when there is a difference of opinion between the, the you know the groups of economists the muslim economists or the groups of uh, you know muslim scholars as well right. so there has to be a standardized approach and how this problem and this is by the way not only in philippines this problem exists almost everywhere right because us as muslims mashallah you know we are very good at having different opinions and having different interpretations of our own especially when it comes to the religion unfortunately so this problem has been solved by you know developing industry standards right and this body industry standards is called iofi this is a, a consensus of the muslim scholars from around the world that have you know representative that have represented different regions of the world different sects of muslims different schools of thoughts and schools of jurisdiction or fiqh of uh, of sharia and they have developed these standards that have been adopted as the industry standards so once those standards are adopted and this is important message for the bsp they have already signed an mou with iofi with the organization i think the next step is attorney arifa a message for you is to think of uh, adopting those iofi standards because that resolves the problem so then the bsp will define that the interpretation of sharia will be in accordance with iofi principles iofi standards and any court of law will use the same standard for the you know for for any decision so that will address this issue of diversity of opinion so it it, it wouldn't really matter in the end of the day because that is a consensus that has been adopted by everyone thank you thank, thank you. you very much can uh, we now have yeah. uh, sir we can we recognize uh, go ahead sir Hello, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm, I'll not take uh, long. Uh, just but you mentioned uh, some um, some activities uh, within your presentation, but they appear to be on balance sheet activities. So would you please just elaborate a little bit about how, because it concerns the business and the, uh, the financial sector, how this ba on balance sheet can be off balance sheet uh, later on because it, it might encourage some uh, 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 some parties to engage in. This is first. And the second one, uh, I would like to just to mention that we have uh, three scenarios when the defaults. So the first one, the misrepresentation. The second one, unforeseen circumstances because of the laws uh, enacted by the government or any, any other unforeseen circumstances. And the third one, this is unintentional failure by the uh, by the know-how holder so would you just two points regarding this thank you very much thank you so much your excellency um, okay the first one uh, is an important and interesting point you know off balance sheet and on balance sheet I would love to go into the details but unfortunately uh, you know the time doesn't allow us you know to go into those details what I would suggest is that ADB has already, uh, you know, in collaboration with BSP, run multiple, you know, training workshops uh, in Manila. And we are thinking of repeating some of them in Manila and also in the region here as well. 
So maybe it's, it will be better to you know, attend one of those workshops, you know, yourself or any other people who are interested in the technicality and the depth of the issue. And then we will address those things in more details. But there is actually a lot of Islamic finance uh, you know, transactions that can be done off balance sheet and that can be done also on balance sheet. So there is actually a lot of choice here. And again, uh, IOFI, you know, besides providing Sharia uh, standards, they also provide accounting and governance standards as well. And I happen to be chairing the, you know, their board of governance and ethics as well. So part of the governance, uh, you know, standards, they are actually being issued by, by that. So the accounting standards also define things that can be done off balance sheet and on balance sheet as well. So a lot of this technicality and assistance is, is provided, is required. Now coming to the next one, yes, you are right. There can be cases, there can be scenarios of, uh, you know, misconduct, negligence, misrepresentation and so on. Now, if there is a loss that has occurred because of that, okay. then that loss will not be borne. And this is, I'm talking about the mudarba or where the association or even musharka. So any form of part partnership where one of the partners or some of the partners have committed any misconduct or, you know, negligence, etc., and that has led to, uh, to loss, then they are responsible for that loss. So then they will make that loss good. And this is provided in the Sharia. However, the third scenario that you mentioned, which is a genuine loss, yeah. which despite all the knowledge, all the know-how, everything, it still, you know, returns a loss for whatever reason that may be within or beyond your, you know, your, uh, your uh, reach. So in that case, the, the, the loss will be considered as genuine and that loss will be borne effectively by the partners who, if in Musharka, it will be divided between the partners in accordance with their equity shareholding. And in case of Mudarba, it will be borne entirely by the capital provider or providers. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you. Very So there, much. There, is, there is protection available. So it's not, so yes, I, you know, maybe, you know, the point that I want to highlight here is that the, the, the risk, the, you know, the, the factor of risk is very much recognized and, you know, prioritized in, in Sharia. However, the risk is treated differently and it's managed differently. So that's again where the risk managers within the industry, they need to understand as well the, the difference in risk between conventional financial transaction and Islamic financial transaction. And they are very, very different from each other. So this is why, you know, there's a lot we can talk about, but unfortunately at some other point, not today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Raza. As Assalamu uh, alaikum. Ibrahim, you're, you are recognized. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Ismail Ibrahim uh, from the Philippine Council for Islamic Democracy. And at the same time, presently, the Director General of the Ministry of Human Settlements and Development. My question is very, uh, very short. Uh, regarding uh, the exchange contracts, more specifically on Murabaha. As you have explained uh, a while ago, that Murabaha is cost plus profit margin. Yes. And you have made a very good example of a person goes to the bank and buys a car. What is the uh, tolerable profit margin that can be allowed by Sharia in this context? Maximum. Thank you, sir. Very interesting question. Now, Sharia has not defined any tolerance level of the, the profit margin. Sharia has left it open completely. And why this is important, let me quote you a small uh, you know, example of the times of the prophet, peace be upon him. Once the, you know, the market conditions were, you know, were very, you know, squeezed, there was a lack of, uh, you know, supplies. So the prices started going up in the market. Some people, they went to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and requested him, O oh, Prophet of Allah, please define the prices, you know, of, uh, of uh, the necessities, at least the basic goods, because, you know, we, we cannot pay and it's becoming very expensive. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, Allah and his Prophet are not here to define market prices. These are for the market forces to define. And this is very, very important for us to understand the significance of this. Because if he did that, because all his word and all his actions have been documented and they have been made as the, the static and primary source of Sharia, that, you know, that description of price will become, uh, you know, will be fixed in, 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 in stone, right? And because the time is changing and with time, the, the dynamics are changing, 
that will create a much bigger issue that probably nobody will be able to, to you know, to, to, to manage. So that's why the prophet abstained and, you know, he, he, he left the market forces. So the, the, the existence of market forces is recognized in Sharia and we have to let them work. How, on the other hand, there is actually a lot of encouragement in the Quran and in the Sunnah, right? In both primary sources of Sharia that we shall be, first of all, compassionate with, with people. When we are giving them loans, you know, if there is a, a genuine difficulty in the repayment of loan, give them more time if you can. And if, even if you, you know, let them go without paying, meaning, you know, you, you write off that loan, if you can, then it will be very much rewarded, very much rewarded. Also, you know, if you have a choice between paying sadaqa, meaning arms, giving arms, you know, arms when you pay, it's gone, it doesn't come back to you. And if you have a choice of giving a loan to someone in need, what is better out of the two? It's not the sadaqa. Sadaqa is the arms giving, you give it, it doesn't come back. You give loan, it comes back to you, right? However, from Sharia point of view, the preference is for giving the loan. Because giving the loan is helping someone in need. Relieving them from, you know, from that difficulty is more preferred, it's more rewarded, it's more highly rewarded, right? So similarly, when, you know, it comes to profit, you know, making and trading, there are very, uh, you know, important, you know, the teachings for, for the traders, right? That do not be excessive, do not be exploitative, do not, uh, you know, uh, take advantage of people, don't do holding and so on and so forth, right? So, meaning that there is no definition, there is no, you know, figures put on, this is the percentage and this is tolerance and this is, you know, not tolerated. It's, it's the, 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 the perimeters, the, you know, the boundaries have been defined, but the, less, the, the left, you know, is, is, is left undefined and this is, you know, between people. Now, the bank or, you know, any financier, they can come to an agreement with the customer. This is between both parties and there is no direction or guidance from Sharia that this is the, you know, the profit margin bracket. It can be anything that is mutually acceptable and not exploitative. Thank you. Thank you very much. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. That was very, very well said, sir. Uh, Senior Associate Justice Leonen is recognized. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for your very enlightening and exciting uh, presentation. Uh, it, I'm sure that it was only the tip of the iceberg, but you see the excitement that uh, you, have, uh, uh, you have created. Uh, many, many of them might want to be investors or uh, uh, entrepreneurs, <laughs> I'm not sure, but uh, certainly from my point of view, from an, uh, from an individual point of view, this looks very exciting. When it comes to my retirement, when I set up my vegan restaurant, <laughs> I will certainly look for uh, an Islamic financing institution. But I'd like to say num uh, number one, and that, that as uh, the first one. The second is this has a lot of uh, potential for social justice. And in uh, one of our cases in Lara Gifts, which we just finished debating months ago, there was a debate about interest on interest yes. so compounding, compounding interest, interest on yes. compounding interest and yes. of course uh, my initial position of course wouldn't hold water because it was a commercial contract not under islamic financing and i can see the potential of other investors and other entrepreneurs wanting to use lara gifts was a uh, a retail and i am sure that there are many uh, retail companies in uh, retail businesses in in, in Lanao and in Maguindanao and in Sulu or Basilan that would want to make use of Islamic financing rather than the ordinary banks, had there been an Islamic bank. So uh, we can see the social justice uh, component of it. And lastly, I think this will open up not only uh, social justice in the country, but even prosperity because it will open up our markets to Malaysia, UAE, Indonesia, etc. Once they see, uh, once investors from those countries see that there is a potential for Islamic finance to be uh, implemented in the Philippines. We have the regulatory framework. Uh, Filipinos are very good at regulatory frameworks. Uh, what is lacking now is the institutional and the political uh, will. 
So I just want to say, consulting with the Chief and my colleague, Justice Japar, we heard the last part. And the last part was the offer for technical assistance and uh, focus uh, group discussions, uh, knowledge exchange. Certainly, the Supreme Court, the judiciary, will call on that, uh, not only from the ADD, but the other uh, partners that are here, on many things. Understanding Sharia, basically. Second is uh, human rights and Sharia. Uh, third, which uh, also had an exciting uh, debate here uh, with respect to um, age. Um, and thirdly, on Islamic financing, uh, capital markets, etc. So we heard that, and I'd like to assure everybody that we heard that. And because there's a lot of excitement, also to tell everybody that this is not the last forum, by the way. It is only an initial forum. <laughs> so uh, we might have uh, several forums, and now I'm thinking, and uh, probably we'll discuss with the Chief and Justice uh, Japar. Uh, number one, Islam and women. Number two, uh, Sharia and human rights. And number three, uh, Islamic finance, capital markets, uh, and this time not only a gathering or a forum, but rather an intensive symposium where uh, we can engage with more speakers, have more time. And, and we apologize that in this national summit we have to cram everything in two days, but I think Justice Jobs specifically made the right choices, knew what would pique your interest and uh, what would cause exciting debates. Um, so I guess this is just uh, uh, the first one. And we have all the players here, all the major players. So the Legal Education Board and the deans have stayed, and they have a very important uh, role to play in terms of uh, looking at their curriculum and seeing, as we have stated in, in, in our SPJI, the need for inclusivity requires that our academic institution not only restructure their curricula, but start to partner with other schools outside, with other universities outside. We have here also with us the Integrated Bar of the Philippines. You have the ju uh, judges of our Sharia courts, and you have also our developmental partners. So uh, what we will try to do is try to bring all, all of this together. Okay, I must have a question. And my question is, <laughs> do you think that this is good for our country? Thank you so much, Your Honor, for uh, you know, very encouraging words. And uh, let me you know, start backwards. So answering uh, the, the question first, um, I think uh, the, the answer is just one word. But it's a very strong word, yes, inshallah. It has, <laughs> Islamic finance has a lot of potential for the Philippines, for the Balm region, and for all Filipinos whether, you know, regardless of which confession they belong to. Why? And this is something, you know, I genuinely believe it because, uh, alhamdulillah, I have been blessed with, uh, you know, working across more than 50 jurisdictions around the world. And alhamdulillah, we have seen the benefits that it has brought to the societies, to the economic development of the countries, and the diversification of, uh, you know, the resources, and, you know, a, a better you know, uh, you know, economy and, uh, you know, uh, well-being of, of the nations. So it's uh, maybe, the pace may be slow, but it's there. It's visible. There is enough data available to underpin my statement. Okay? Now, again, uh, as you rightly said, this is the tip of the iceberg. Now, let me tell you that this tip of the iceberg is not scratched today. It was actually scratched in 2019 when... ADB, you know, provided this uh, assistance, this, uh, you know, technical assistance uh, contract to the BSP, and we started working on Islamic finance. But at that time, it was mainly focused on Manila, you know, trying to, uh, you know, create this capacity to create this awareness and so on and so forth. Then we had big plans, but subhanAllah, you know, what Allah wants, those things happen. COVID came, and that just, uh, you know, froze everything. And I told you already as, a, as an opening statement that I have returned to the country after three years. But the good thing is that, alhamdulillah, we are back. And this commitment that ADB has already given to the Philippines and to the BSP and to the stakeholders is still there. 
and this state commitment is very strong and this is to make things happen and to see them happening inshallah and this is you know continuing and it's going to continue until we see the results but of course adb on itself or bsp on itself cannot do everything we need all the players in the market and hence it gave me a great pleasure when i received this uh, invitation from uh, you know the the organizers uh, that you know it was great to know that the supreme court of the philippines is organizing you know the first national sharia summit and it's a pleasure it's an honor for me to be here and to share all this good work that has been done and you know the unsung hero uh, you know um, uh, attorney arifa is, is sitting there quietly but uh, uh, let me tell you that she has done a tremendous job in bringing <laughs> she has done a tremendous job in bringing islamic finance and bringing philippines to the point that where we are now and her team in the bsp has done a mint job in you know making all these things so a lot of that groundwork has happened already and now we are working on the next steps which is expanding you know these awareness and capacity building programs to the regions to bring you know to widen the, the net and to bring more stakeholders you know in this net to help people think differently to help people you know the, the policy makers you know develop their policies accordingly to make sure that there are provisions in law and in the regulations to accommodate and to facilitate you know these uh, schemes new schemes for example for the teachers for you know the smes for the startups and you know for the housing and so on and so forth so all this is here and inshallah we will work together with all the stakeholders our role will be to facilitate and to help provide this guidance and also bringing the external you know resources as well um, you know a couple of days ago i was in istanbul and uh, i had a meeting with one of the commercial islamic actually the largest islamic commercial bank in the country and to my surprise you know they asked me you know where i'm heading and i told them i'm uh, going to the to, to the philippines and they immediately called their head of treasury the group head of treasury and uh, they said okay let's talk about the philippines and they have already made you know their their intentions known that the time come and they are happy to actually you know enter in the philippines market so this is already a good news i don't want to you know dwell a lot on this but alhamdulillah i think we are actually in a very good position right now and we, this position is becoming better by the day and we need more input you know from all the stakeholders and inshallah you will see the results they will be great thank you thank you very much uh, mr farooq again and of course to the senior associate justice uh, I, I hope we can still have uh, time for last two questions, if that's okay with yes. you, sir. We st we'll still have one more there. Uh, Attorney Apian, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Murabaha, since technically it involves two purchases, first purchase of the, for example, a car chosen by the bank's client, by the bank, first purchase, and then the second, uh, after it is purchased by the bank, by the bank's client. So there are two purchases. How is it distinguished from the double sale that you featured in your, uh, sir, in your lecture as a prohibited transaction, which, uh, which, is, which you cited as an example of the key features of Islamic finance? And also the simple ijara as uh, featured in your lecture, how is it distinguished from al ijara to at Al Muntahina to be tamlik, is the latter applicable to car finan financing, for example, and can still be uh, Sharia compliant? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So, just a little correction. Uh, when I said uh, the prohibitions, in the prohibitions, you know, I had the last point mentioned as double sale. That does not mean two sales. You know, in Murabha, there are two sales in one transaction. The financial institution will acquire the asset and then they will sell it on. So there are two, uh, you know, sales. This is not what I meant by double sale. Double sale means selling the same asset to more than one party. And this unfortunately happens that, uh, you know, the same, uh, you know, asset or the same security is actually, uh, you know, sold to different people. This is a very common practice, unfortunately, in conventional, uh, you know, markets where, uh, you know, it's very difficult to know the risk, the ownership, and so on and so forth. So in form of, in case of any conflict or any, dispute you know it's very difficult to determine the actual ownership and who is the risk bearer so that's what is you know prohibited in 
in Sharia, it's not the, the case of you know, two sales consecutive to each other. So this is the first point. The second point is, as I mentioned in Ijara, that you know, Ijara has many different variations. And what you mentioned, Ijara Muntahiya Bittamlik is one of the variations. There are many other variations as well. So all they can, the, I have just mentioned Ijara here as one you know, uh, um, uh, master uh, ag agreement or the overarching agreement, but then there will be different variations. For example, in the, the asset, is it actually gifted to the, uh, you know, to, the uh, to, to, to the lessee at the end of the term without any consideration? That will be one variation. It may be sold to the lessee you know, for a certain price, that's a different variation. It may be, you know, taken back from the, from the lessee, it returns to the lessor, that's another variation, and so on and so forth. There is also, you know, uh, you know I'm, I'm not going into those details, but there are other, other, you know, possibilities as well. So all these scenarios, they are Sharia compliant and they can be, you know, structured as Sharia compliant. The main concern here is that the, the terms and the conditions of each of the variations is known and they are, perfectly incorporated in the structure in the agreement and you know it's all clear and accepted by all parties and you know uh, respected as well so so this is part of uh, you know the requirements of sharia thank you thank you very much mr raza and now for the last question you are recognized uh, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, i am abdul majid marahom sir uh, i'm a lawyer by profession uh, and i'm also taking my masters in islamic studies in the university of the philippines Diliman. So my question is, um, what laws or rules um, can policymakers or regulators uh, consider to make the Philippines more competitive in Islamic finance uh, as compared to our Southeast Asian neighbors? Which means to say, um, what can we do to encourage foreign uh, and domestic investment in Islamic finance here in the Philippines? So, um, as far as I know, um, for example, uh, the industry of sukuk in Malaysia is a billion dollar industry. So one can only imagine how much help would that, how much help that would bring for not only Muslim Filipinos, but everyone in the Philippines in general. So you mentioned that um, ADB's evaluation right now is that the current um, uh, legal and regulatory framework is really good. Um, uh, so the we have the Islamic Banking Act in 2018, and under the leadership of Attorney Arifa, we continue to issue circulars to, for Sharia compliance. Um, BIR has issued circulars on tax neutrality, uh, and we have laws on setting jur jurisdiction for courts. But what can we do? How can, how can we bring this amount of investment here in the Philippines? How can we make it easier for, uh, for investors? Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, very intelligent question. Uh, okay, uh, I think, you know, there are two different things. There is, you know, legal and regulatory requirement or, or the, the environment, and then there are policies, okay? So on the legal and regulatory side, a lot of work has already been completed by the BSP, by the BIR, by, you know, the insurance regulator, and so on. So a lot of that work has been done, actually. You know, the issues of, uh, uh, you know, the BSP has uh, already issued you know, many circulars uh, defining, you know, the requirements for Islamic banking units, for example, whether they are local banks, whether, you know, they are foreign banks, you know, that are coming here and setting up and so on and so forth. So all this foundation has been provided. Similarly, the BIR has addressed many taxation issues that will arise from these financial transactions because of their different nature, as I, you know, demonstrated to you a little bit. So all this groundwork has been done. So in that sense, when the, the external players, uh, you know, meaning mainly the financial institutions, when they look at the Philippines and the legal and regulatory environment in the Philippines, they are, I think, reasonably satisfied now that there is basic infrastructure that is already available to them, okay? So they are not going into a, a jurisdiction that is completely alien to Islamic finance or that does not recognize Islamic banking and finance or that does not, uh, you know, facilitate that, you know, uh, the, the transactions. So all this is there already. The basic infrastructure is there. Of course, this is work in progress and a lot of further, you know, fine tuning is required. And again, the, B, the BSP and the other stakeholders are continuously working on that. Uh, and, you know, ADB is providing technical assistance as and where required and possible. 
So this is one part of the, of the, the, you know, the, 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 the issue. The second part is the policy. Now that is not related to the regulation or the taxation or anything else. The policy means that you know, there is, for example, some incentive for a foreign player to come and to, you know, to, to, to set up a, you know, an operation here. For a foreign player to come and you know, to, to uh, you know, issue a sukuk here, for example. Now this is where the policy is required and policy is not, of course, you know, some of the policies may be related to the BSP, but there are other policies that are related to other government you know, agencies as well. It can be directly you know, the federal government, it can be the regional government, for example. Those incentives can be again at federal level, they can be again at regional level also. Okay? So it all depends. You know, this is something for the authorities and for the policy makers to sit down and to think and agree between them the, what they want to do, whether they want to do federal policies, whether they want to do regional policies, the incentives can be provided in different ways and forms. You mentioned, uh, you know, the, the Sukuk issuance, uh, the Sukuk market in Malaysia being a billion dollar, uh, you know, market. That's true, but that didn't happen, you know, overnight. It has, uh, you know, it has culminated from very positive, very strong and, you know, affirmative policies that were, uh, you know, adopted by the, the Malaysian government, you know, like 15, 20 years ago. And that has led, you know, the market, you know, as we know, uh, Malaysia is not a hundred percent, you know, Islamic country. There is, a, you know, a, a big, sizable, you know, non-Muslim uh, population as well. And oh, of course, they do businesses also. What is interesting in, uh, in Malaysia and in many other places as well, that, uh, you know, corporates owned by non-Muslims are still preferring, you know, raising their funds in capital markets through sukuk issuance instead of, you know, a bond, for example, right? And that is the result of those policies that they have you know, adopted and practiced and implemented over the last, uh, you know, few years, that has actually helped the market to grow in such way and it's become more, uh, you know, attractive for people. Not only incentives, but there are a number of other things as well. It can be the infrastructure, it can be also some tax breaks, it can be also, you know, some reliefs given, you know, by, by you know, the, the authorities. So all these things that need to be considered, this is not, you know, one man's job. This requires actually a lot of input from different stakeholders and there has to be some sort of unified vision about this. Now again, we know that Philippines is, uh, you know, uh, you know is, is, is a secular country. The majority of the population is, uh, you know, very devout Christian. There is, a, you know, a Muslim minority. You know, all of them are equal. All of them have the same right, the same duty towards the country. So, you know, if I am in the shoes of, 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 of a Filipino, I would want my country to grow. I would want my country to have a sustainable economic development where we create wealth in, uh, you know, a, a fair way, where we distribute wealth in a fair way. And if uh, you know, there is any, uh, you know, provision in law that helps me in achieving that, whether I'm, you know, head of a family or head of a, a business, uh, you know, or head of, a, you know, a communal organization, I would want to do that regardless of, you know, my confession. So I hope that this is the message for, for everyone and this is why a collective effort from all stakeholders is required to make sure that we develop policies that help attract those external, uh, you know, players, that help us cement our position as a serious player in Islamic finance market and offer something, you know, these, these market conditions that are favorable so that in a few years, uh, you know, we can also expect, anticipate, you know, the results, you know, to be similar to what we have seen in other countries as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much, Mr. Rasa, for that very exhaustive response to all the queries and to our participants for your fruitful exchanges. Truly, it is certainly special when you are able to collaborate and bring together all these uh, very hopeful ideas. And Ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up our order of discussions for the two-day summit of the first National Sharia Summit. Indeed, these past two days have been so enriching, inspirational, and uh, motivating. And therefore, I cannot help but feel very hopeful that after today, all of us no, goes out of the summit reinv reinvigorated and excited. Uh, to be to jump no? because we are now at this springboard and uh, uh, jump in and do the work towards uh, institutionalizing and strengthening Sharia in the national legal framework. At this point, 
I would like now to welcome and give the floor to Associate Justice Japar B. De Maampao, the Vice Chairperson of the Technical Working Group on Sharia, to give his address on what lies ahead, conquering challenges in the Philippine Sharia legal system and the evolving Sharia doctrine. Ladies and gentlemen, Justice Japar De Maampao. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب إليه ونعوذ بالله من سرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له شهد لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين من تبعهم بإحسان الله يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته May peace, mercy, and blessings of the Almighty God be upon you all This summit indubitably brings to light a flourishing Philippine legal Sharia system, as well as an auspicious public awareness about evolving Sharia doctrines. Through the strategic plan for judicial innovations, or SPGI, the Supreme Court of the Philippines, under the sterling leadership of Chief Justice Alexander G. Dismundo in <laughs> endeavors to accomplish the monumental tasks of enhancing the prevailing Sharia system and uh, enriching Islamic jurisprudence. Is wise is that the SBGI aims to uh, strengthen uh, the foundations of Sharia justice. In retrospect, the Philippine Sharia legal system first saw the light of day. On February 4, 1977, with enactment of the Code of Muslim Personal Laws by virtue of Presidential Decree 1083. Indeed, the official recognition of Sharia legal system in this country stretches 46 years in the past. This finds a constitutional imprimatur in Section 17, Article 14 of the 1987 Constitution, which provides the state shall recognize, respect, the state shall recognize, respect, and protect the rights of the indigenous cultural communities to preserve and develop their cultures traditions and institutions. The state shall consider these rights in the formulation of national plans and policies. Upon directive of the Chief Justice, the Department of Sharia and Islamic Jurisprudence of the Philippine Judicial Academy embarked on the revision of a 40-year-old special rules of procedure in Sharia courts, otherwise known as Israel Mahakim Al Hakim Al Israel Al Hakim Al Sharia, which is made up only of 18 sections. Alhamdulillah, the uh, completion of this revision of the Israel Al Hakim Al Sharia was completed in November 2022. 
this revise uh, these proposed revisions and uh, uh, there are there are fun that we uh, held uh, focus group discussions in the cities of Marawi, Cotabato, and Sambuanga. The uh, proposed revisions uh, include in a supplementary application uh, components of procedural law in the Philippines and incorporate provisions from uh, foreign jurisdictions with established Sharia system like Malaysia. The rules, the proposed revisions also seek to make Israel al Mahakim al Sharia more responsive in developing and ex ex expedient ways such as providing litigants the uh, option uh, between domicile and geographical uh, proximity to Sharia court for purposes of venue and maximizing the use of Yamin, that's Islamic oath, in the uh, resolution of cases, thereby deceiving, brushing aside the legal implications of that dictum laid down in Tampar versus Usman, promulgated on August 16, 1991, volume 200, Iskra 652. That must be revisited. The approval of these rules, of these uh, revision of rules, is expressly lodged in the Supreme Court under Article 8, Section 5, Paragraph 5. This must therefore pass the constitutional criteria. One, it must provide a simplified and expensive, an expensive procedure for the speedy disposition of cases. Two, it, they must be of uh, uh, uniform grade for all courts. And three, they must not diminish, increase, or modify substantive rights of equal importance in this summit is the petition for the integration of the uh, Philippine Sharia Bar of the Philippines, which uh, finds a statutory hook in Section 17 of Article of Republic Act 11054, otherwise known as the Organic Law for All Bangsamoro, Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao will the imminent approval of this measure members of the sharia bar will become on par in terms of distinction with the members of the philippine bar needless to state the digitalization of the regular bar examinations holds true for the subsequent special Sharia bar examinations, inshallah. After all, the Supreme Court retains the authority to administer said examinations pursuant to Section 12 of the Bangsamoro Organic Law. Regarding uh, Sharia doctrines, the Supreme Court has enriched jurisprudence with the pronouncement in the Nobel case of Malaki versus people, year number 221075, promulgated on November 15, 2021, that merits by convenience to escape criminal liability for bigamy should not be countenance. Likewise, when the right opportunity presents itself, the Supreme Court will revise erroneous interpretations of Sharia, such as those found in Bundaji versus Bundaji, Volume 371, Iskra 
642, promulgated on December 7, 2021, involving custody of children. And this case of Tampar versus Usman, uh, volume 200 is 652, which involved involving regarding uh, the use of Yemen. Guided by the primary and secondary purposes of Sharia, the Supreme Court will eventually be called upon to reconcile conflicting provisions of the Code of Muslim Personal Laws and the Bangsamoro Organic Law. Evolving Sharia doctrines inevitably bring to mind the Islamic principle of istihsan, otherwise known as juristic preference or discretion. It refers to the jurist judgment to determine the best solution to a problem. by not simply by not simply citing sacred text as uh, zumar uh, chapter 39 ayat or verse of 18 of the holy quran ordains those who listen to the word and follow the best of it are those whom allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Almighty God has guided and those who in and they are those who are in dog with understanding. The same surah as Zumar, chapter 39 of the Holy Quran, this time ayat or verse 55, for good measure, follow the best of what has been revealed to you from your Lord. In a nutshell, is this is a method or, or way of rendering opinion where strictness, stringency, and fairness, rigidity must be avoided. It is akin to that notion of equity and ethics, for it advocates goodness and fairness on this score. Imam Hanbali, Imam Hanafi, and Imam Maliki accorded approbation to the application of Istisan as an integral part of Sharia. By the same token, Istisan uh, abhors injustice, uh, averts uh, injury or harm, avoids uh, distress or hardship, and promotes common good and welfare. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no harm, no causing of injury Surah Al-Hajj chapter 22 ayah or verse 78 of the Holy Quran says the Almighty God does not impose difficulties on you in your religion. Your deen or your religion must bring public welfare into this world. Applying is the sand and abandoning analogy or chaos is the core of Islamic jurisprudence or faith. Let us now hearken to the to uh, the notable some of the notable evolving Sharia doctrines which uh, uh, touch upon the various various aspects of lives of the Muslims as as uh, it definely expected by our illustrious roster of speakers or lecturers. It cannot be stressed enough that in Islam, man and woman are equal in the eyes of the Almighty God. Invariably, Surah 
uh, Hujurat uh, chapter 49 ayat or verse 13 of the Holy Quran reminds us O mankind indeed we created you from a pair from a pair of uh, male and female uh, and made you into tribes and nation so that you may get to know one another surely the most noble of you in the sight of the almighty god is the most righteous among you allah the almighty god is all knowing and well acquainted with all things significantly in the kingdom of saudi arabia uh, women have just been recently granted the right to drive and to join the armed forces this goes to show that it's a matter of finding the middle ground between the woman's societal rule and the opportunities afforded her for self-development of all things that islam has permitted divorce is the most abhorred one by the almighty god the right to seek divorce is generally reserved for the husband however the wife may seek divorce under exceptional cases one divorce by tafwi allows the husband to delegate the a right to effect divorce to the wife at the celebration of the marriage or thereafter two that is known as divorce by delegation two uh, divorce by call grants the wife to uh, uh, file a petition for divorce provided that the wife renounces or returns her dower that is divorce by redemption and three uh, di divorce by mubarak uh, gives spouses the liberty to release each other on the condition that aver aversion transpires or of course in the marital life of these three uh, kinds of divorce where the wife may exercise such right the last one divorce by Mumbarat is not codified in PD 1083 our brothers and sisters from the legislature should take this into consideration in crafting revisions to the law truth be uh, told uh, our legislators uh, filed a meaningful uh, or well-meaning bills related to sharia so inshallah i hope that they will pass more uh, meaningful laws related to sharia moving on to halal it is plain as day that it is not just more than a dietary restriction. In other words, uh, halal is a must, not only what we eat, but also what we wear and what we love. It uh, refers to lawful or permitted acts, uh, objects or conduct on the part of those who adhere to the Islamic faith. According to Surah Maida, chapter uh, uh, 40, ch uh, ch chapter 5, verse ayat 87. Who you believe, forbid not those, not 
good, not those good things that the Almighty God has made halal uh, of for you. All the same, all the same, um, it is ingrained in Islamic jurisprudence that necessity provides exceptions. It removes restrictions. Thus, Sharia recognizes the exigency supply and human frailties when it allows haram under highly unusual conditions such as imminent death from starvation. However, it must be the amount or quantity must be sufficient enough for him or her to survive or meet, meet such uh, necessity. This finds Quranic base, uh, basis in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, ayat or verse 173 of the Holy Quran. It says, if one is compelled by necessity, without deliberate, without deliberate disobedience, disobedience or translation, Transgression, he commits no sin. For Allah, the mighty God, is most gracious and most merciful. Finally, on riba, recognize, characterize as interest on loans and sales or exchanges is expressly prohibited in the numerous verses of the Holy Quran because it clearly contravenes the principles of social justice and equity. Still and all, a widely held Islamic precept dictates riba may be given not by way of zakat, but for charitable causes and non-religious purposes. This does not, however, uh, merit divine reward. In the Philippines, Al-Amana, Islamic Investment Bank, remains to be the only financial, Islamic financial institution since 1973 by virtue of PD-264, with the enactment of Republic Act 11439, an act providing for the regulation and organization of Islamic banks, inshallah, the Amman Bank will gain a new lease on life and will eventually be transformed, inshallah, into a vibrant Islamic bank. This watershed legislation focuses on banking arrangements which are compliant with Sharia principles. From these discussions, there is no gainsaying that Sharia has always been an indispensable component of the Philippine legal framework. Regrettably, it has often been neglected in the past because of a lack of familiarity or understanding about the system. It is, hence, it is our fervent hope that when this milestone event comes to an end, we will have the necessary blueprint for transforming the current Sharia legal system into one that is truly attuned to the needs, 
not only of the Bangsamoro, but also the Muslim Filipino community uh, all within the mission bounds of the National Legal Foundations. In closing, let us be reminded that the Almighty God is the final and best disposer of affairs. Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, ayat or verse 173 of the Holy Quran. This being so, the enhancement of the Philippine Sharia legal system and the enrichment of the Islamic jurisprudence in undoubtedly and divinely rest with Allah, with the power and will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allow me to close this discourse with this Quranic commandment or edict. وَمَا تَوْفِكْ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ تَوَقَّلْتُ عَلَيْهِ Unib, our success can only come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty God, and to Him we trust. And unto Him we turn for guidance. Sukran jachilan, jazakallahu khairan, wassalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Thank you very much, Justice Timaampal, for your assuring and motivating words. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. We are now full of hopes for the future. And now for our closing, uh, we hate to call, we hate to close our summit, but uh, we have to. And then we may call on the Chancellor Rosemary Karandang for her closing remarks. Ma'am? Good evening to everyone. It's already past six o'clock. Assalamu alaikum. I hope I pronounce it right. As we finally come to a close, we cap this nation's first summit on Sharia with benefits that are unquantifiable and with significant impact that will outlive our time. In 1977, Presidential Decree Number 1083, otherwise known as the Code of Muslim Personal Laws of the Philippines, established the Sharila Courts for the effective administration and enforcement of Muslim personal laws among our Muslim brothers. This codification of Muslim personal laws recognized the legal system of the, of the Muslims in the Philippines as part of the law of the land and sought to make Islamic institutions more effective. In 1998 and in 1999, the United Nations Development Program and the World Bank initiated and funded a series of diagnostic studies to assess the overall functioning of the Philippine judiciary and the various aspects of the court system. One of the key findings in the studies contained in the 2004 report is the need for the institutional strengthening of the Sharia justice system. The report identified issues on geographical access to Sharia courts, concurrent jurisdictions of our regular lower trial courts, 
and Sharia courts, limited jurisdiction of Sharia courts, lack of public information on Sharia courts, and coexistence of informal and formal dispute resolution mechanisms in the Muslim communities. Taken together, these factors affected the performance and contributed severely to the low caseloads of Sharia courts, rendering them underutilized. It appears that the codification of the Islamic law did not have the wide-reaching effect and impact that was anticipated and was expected. This first national summit on Sharia is not only an exercise of the supervisory power of the Supreme Court over Sharia courts, but an affirmation of the commitment as espoused in the Strategic Plan for Judicial Innovations 2022-2027 to to pursue an integrated effort to institute reforms and initiatives that will contribute to the facilitation of justice and the rule of law in the Bagsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. Yesterday, the Chief Justice himself, the Honorable Alexander Hesmundo, reiterated to us this commitment of the Supreme Court when he detailed in his message the objectives of the first national summit on Sharia, among which is to define the implications for strengthening the Sharia justice system and to identify appropriate comprehensive and long-term reform directions. Bringing together more than 250 actors and stakeholders to take part in the lectures on diverse topics is only a starting point. For setting the direction and subsequently identifying, designing, and implementing initiatives towards strengthening the Sharia justice system and forging its roles in the national legal framework. These reforms embodied in practical and procedural changes will lead to an increased knowledge, enhanced access to, encourage use of Sharia courts. The commitment of the Philippine Judicial Academy or Filja as the Supreme Court's exclusive training arm for judicial education is perfectly aligned with the SPJI. As FILJA moves in the direction of making judicial education more attuned to the times and the needs of society, it shall actively participate in the strengthening of the Sharia justice system by providing legal education to Sharia court judges, practitioners, and other stakeholders tapping the services of Sharia scholars and experts, local and foreign, if necessary. Senior Associate Justice Marvick Leonan opened his historical, this historic summit with the emphasis on the Supreme Court's promotion of the rule of law through the enhancement of access to justice by the underserved and vulnerable sectors of society. A hopeful Senate President, Miguel Subiri, on the other hand, announced the intention to file his version of the bill for the creation of Sharia courts nationwide in recognition of the need to increase access to justice by Muslim Filipinos residing in places outside the Bangsamoro region. Indeed, 
we are all journeying together on a good path and sharing a vision for a legal justice system that is responsive to the needs and reflective of the social and cultural values of our people, the, Mang the Bangsamoro people. That many have willingly traveled long distances to be here serves as a reminder to us all just how important our work and how important this summit. As automaker legend Henry Ford said, if everyone is moving forward together, then success takes care of itself. Only through a communal, communal approach can we help the Sharia law assume its vibrant, effective, and culturally competent role within the judicial system of the Philippines. Sukran and maraming salamat sa inyong lahat. Maraming maraming salamat din po. Thank you very much, Chancellor Karandang. And of course, thank you to the Supreme Court for this very historic event. Your commitment to making this event realized and possible it will, not be go will not be going unnoticed and we are excited to work with you and the rest of the stakeholders for the next steps. At this point, we would also like to, thank, to take the opportunity to thank everybody who made this possible, chiefly the Supreme Court Committee on Access to Justice and the Underserved, chaired by Senior Associate Justice Mar Marvick Mario Victor F. Leonen, the Technical Working Group on Sharia, and the Vice Chairperson Justice Japar B. Di Maampao. Of course, the rest of the Supreme Court officials and employees especially the Philippine Judicial Academy, the Program Management Office, the Public Information Office, and the Office of Administrative Services, the judges who are here and other court personnel, thank you very much. And to our development partners, the Embassy of Spain to the Philippines, Cooperación Español, the European Union to the Philippines, support to Bangsamoro, the EU Governance and Justice II program, the Asia Foundation, the Philippine Judicial Academy, National Commission for Muslim Filipinos, and the Philippine Center for Islam and Democracy, and of course, the Philippine National Police for our security. To everyone who graced this event, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Dinner will be served. Stay safe and healthy. It's, it has been a very fruitful two-day summit. This has been Aisha Flores Malayang, your host for today, and... And uh, Muhammad Al-Amin Julkipli. Thank you very much. See you all next summit, inshallah. Thank you, everyone. One few more reminders. And of course, this, without, this goes without saying that all of this also will not be possible without the support of our Chief Justice, the Chief Justice, the Honorable Alexander G. Gesmundo. Thank you, some, some last few reminders for everyone no, before we take our dinner or uh, proceed outside. Uh, for those who have accomplished their MCLE forms, kindly please file them outside at the registration table. A reminder also for all of us and all of us who, are, who have colleagues outside who have been uh, curious about this summit, this summit is actually live streamed in the official channels of the Supreme Court. And uh, that being said, the whole program is available for rewatch in the Supreme Court's YouTube channel. So for those who may have missed some parts or for those who have not been able to join us today here, you can still uh, uh, watch and uh, look back at our proceedings at the Supreme Court YouTube channel. Uh, also, to remind everyone that uh, as we go out, maybe there's uh, go back to our homes, 
There might be some things that we want to take with us. There is a trade fair just outside this ballroom. Uh, you can uh, go and check out the various merchandise. Ch ch merchandise. There are products that have been um, prepared and um, those that have been made by our um, IDPs from Marawi that are available outside as well as other goods from Iligan and nearby areas uh, that you can check out. So please do stop by our trade fair area just outside to the right of this hall. Thank you so much. Please enjoy your dinner.